What the fuck did I unmute on my other slide if I was still mute? Good morning! Good morning! Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> Pro professional streamer! At least uh, you guys alerted me very quickly, so I didn't talk to myself for like 10 minutes. Good morning! Good morning! We, we, I love you too, chat. <laughs> Ready for today's tangent non- Man! Man, the more shit that gets dug up on bridge, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. We're probably not going to have my channel point sound effects back on until sometime after spicy vacation. Because, like, what the hell is a spicy my, my time is so fucking crunched right now. It's not even funny. It's not It's not even. Like, this weekend is going to go by. Look at this. Tomorrow, tomorrow I have a Wanted Dead sponsor stream again. Uh, if you weren't here for my last Wanted Dead sponsor stream, I actually rage quit during the sponsor. Uh, because I was fighting a boss, and instead of continuously letting me fight the boss, there was like a cutscene thing that happened that revived you, and I was like spamming the X button to go past it. Uh, however, it seemed like I had finally run out of lives, and so it was like, do you want to reduce the difficulty for the remainder of your playthrough? And there wasn't any confirmation box or anything, it just let me hit yes once because I was spamming the button. And uh, there was no way to turn my save file back into the difficulty that I had been playing on. So I rage quit right then and there in the in the middle of my sponsorship. Uh, so I have another sponsor for them tomorrow. Uh, supposedly they fixed uh, this issue that I encountered. Uh, they also had a patch update recently, so I'll be going over uh, all the other updates for the game as well. And I'll be trying to go further than I did before. You get a big patch from that game? Hell yeah! The game- the game is really fun! Like, I really like the game. I just like, you know, I don't like it when they change my entire save file. That was- I didn't like that. That was an entertaining game. It's a lot of fun, and it actually has a woman that looks like a woman. Wow, who'd have thunked it? <laughs> At least you got cat ears! If you want an easier sponsorship, press X for yes. I mean, like, when- when they were first giving me the first sponsorship, like, it, it even said, like, in the brief, they were like, you, if, if you feel like it's too difficult, we recommend uh, for streamers playing the game on the lowest difficulty setting so that they make sure they actually complete the sponsorship goals. And I was like, mama didn't raise no bitch. I'm not playing on big crying baby bitch difficulty. So I played on normal, on normal difficulty. <laughs> How much uh, to have me crush your head with my thighs? I think. <laughs> Help! You're in the wrong stream. More milky. Red, red Heracross. Thank you for the five dollar doodles. Your Kirsha shirt shipped, and you got charged for your muggy heavy armament figure. So it looks like everything is coming up, Fox Girl. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! I don't know when my merch that I ordered for myself is going to ship out, nor my father's. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping he's gonna get his plush before I get up there, but, you know. <laughs> Have I seen the UK is having a gimp man problem? No, what does that mean? Thank you for the hundred biddies. How is it possible for the UK to have a gimp man problem? Wouldn't the Muslims see him and just lynch him on sight? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Sometimes we just want to get through our backlog. Am I interested in history by any chance? That's a That's a very broad question. But yeah, Douglas Kaplan. Doug Douglas, sir, are you okay? Are you all- I feel like I have to ask you how you're doing. Uh, if you're fine, you know, if, if you might be under mental duress. Is someone holding a gun to your head and making you donate so much? Thank you for the one ninety nine ninety nine, Douglas Kaplan, you fucking mad lad. <laughs> Thank you! Thank you! Emperor Creatine, OJ Simpson can now rest easy knowing that his wife's killer's finally dead! I can only imagine what similar jokes Norm MacDonald would have made. Thank you for the five. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that he had died because I was outside literally all day yesterday. I left my house at like quarter to 10 a.m. because I had an appointment at 10.30 and then I was outside until like 9 p.m. So it was, uh, it was a very... It was a very busy fucking day for me. I'm so sore, chat. I'm so sore. My face feels so fucking soft. Oh my god, it's like a baby's bottom. My, fa my face is so soft. I got dermaplaning done. 
for the first time. Uh, for those of you who aren't women or gay, dermaplaning is when they take like a precision blade and scrape it over your entire face to remove uh, dead skin cells. It uh, it feels really fucking weird. I will say, it feels it feels really fucking weird. But it left my skin so fucking soft. You shaved your face. It's not shaving. Because when you say shaving your face, you picture like a straight edge razor and you just shave like your your beard and your neck area. But this is like, this is like a more, more sharper question mark blade. And it goes across your entire face. So like your forehead, your nose, your cheeks, literally your entire face. And the purpose of this blade is not to remove the hair, although it does do that. Uh, the purpose is to remove the dead skin. So it's like, it's like, you know how Mexican cartels sometimes flay the people that they kidnap? It's like that. Except they're not taking off all of my skin, only the first couple of layers. <laughs> Sil silky smooth! Yeah, like a caterpillar, can't you mold it? I'm beautiful butterfly! You've seen some clips about that? Oh my god. <laughs> You're glad I enjoyed the bukake face. There was no bukake! It was done by a woman who was a very lovely lady. A very lovely lady. Monty Python's Holy Grail. Thank you for the eight months of prune. Thank you! You're right, your skin does look smooth. Thank you, it's glowing. Positively. <laughs> women pay for half-assed flaying. Yes. Flay flaying uh, helps keep women beautiful. Keep that in mind. <laughs> I hope I'm doing well today. If I watch another cartel video and one of them pulls off the I've made this man more beautiful after flaying him line, I'll know the cartels watch me. <laughs> Flay queen! You knew it. Here she's a lizard woman, goddamn. Then after, after my facial, I had a manicure and a pedicure. The pedicure goes first because like... That's just how that works. Uh, the pedicure... Oh my god. The place that I went to, I got lost in. First off. <laughs> I went to a new place to get a manicure pedicure. And uh, there was a sign that was just like, Oh, spa around back. And I was like, spa, that's where I'm going. So I went around back. And I ended up in some like weird monk garden. And I was like, oh, the grass looks kind of strange. But these statues look kind of sick. It's like you wander around in the backyard across all these like purposefully laid out tiles. And I'm just like, where am I going? What is happening? Where is my where is my nail tech? And there was like there was like a little a little shack in the garden. So I like, you know, you peek into the shack because there's like there's curtains fluttering out of the door. I was like, you peek into the shack and there's like a hot tub with a bunch of people in it. And I was like, oh, that's not what I'm looking for! So I zipped out of there before they saw me. And I'm still wandering around the garden and I can't, I can't, like, there's no door. So I was like, where the fuck? What are they, what are they, spa around? I'm going to the spa. What do they mean? So I go back to the front of the garden and I open the garden door and then immediately to my left is the door to go into the building. And I was like, oh. Oh, okay, I, oh, I just missed that. <laughs> so I go in and I was like, hello, I'm here for a, a manu petty. And the lady was like, oh, you got to go out front for that. The backside is just like the spa treatments, uh, like massage therapy. And I was like, oh, I'm used to the spa just being the whole fucking building. <laughs> so I go back around front and I go inside and it's massive inside. And they have like a beautiful crystal chandelier. I was like, where the fuck am I? Why is this place so fucking nice? <laughs> why, is, why is this place so nice? You think I interrupted a bohemian grove ceremony? So I, I, clamber, I clamber into a pedicure chair. And oh my god, this pedicure chair. It was the most comfortable thing I've ever sat in in my entire life. I like, I like sank into it and got eaten. All right. And it, oh god, it had massage features on it. Oh my god. And the bucket, the bucket that I put my feet in. Usually, usually it's just like a nondescript bucket, right? Like it doesn't look like anything fancy. This bucket was like a big, 
really pretty, like half of a disco ball, basically. I was, I, it looked really nice. She tried to kill me though. She put the water in and it was like boiling hot and I didn't realize it. And I put my foot in and immediately took it back out because it burned like fuck. And my foot was like literally lobster red after half a second in the boiling water. So she uh, she made it she made it colder so I could actually put my foot inside of it. And man, man, it was a really nice time. It was a really nice time. My toesies are all blue and sparkly. Because oh oh yeah, there's a new collection on Mooncat I need to look at today. Hopefully that doesn't sell out. But uh. Mooncat came out with a limited edition polish a few weeks ago called Portrait of an Introvert. And it's like this super, super detailed, very sparkly, nice blue color. And uh, I put, I had that on my toesy, so now they're, they're super cute. And then uh, my, my pedicures usually take about an hour and a half, and this was around the same amount of time, so that was good. Manicures usually take around the same amount of time. However, this one took a little bit longer because I got a bunch of gems put on my fingernails. I got, a I got a bunch of gems, like a, I'm like, I'm like, fucking weird goth vampire out of my mind. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> I had called ahead of time, because I'd never been here before, and I was like, hey, Hey guys, uh, smash that like button, leave a comment, push me in the algorithm. I was like, I was like, hey, I just want to make sure that you guys do nail designs on natural nails. Uh, because I see online that you guys do acrylic designs, but I'm not going to be getting acrylics. And they were just like, yeah, we'll book we'll book you for the extra the time for, for the nail designs. Did you save the skin flakes and nail trimmings to sell as exclusive merchandise? I'm mm thinking an no. acrylic stand with the flakes mixed into the acrylic during molding. So everyone literally has a piece of you in it. No! Of course I didn't do that, you weirdo! <laughs> you weirdo! I, uh... I felt really bad, because there was only one nail tech lady there the whole day, right? So, like, I called ahead. They said they booked the time for me to do the nail art. And then, uh, there was only one lady there the whole day. She's like, yeah, I came in at 9 a.m. and I haven't even taken a lunch break yet. And I look at my clock and it's, like, 3. <laughs> and so, like, at, at like, 2.45ish, somebody else came in. And they were like, oh, I'm here for a manicure pedicure. And I'm, I'm looking around, I'm like, there's only one lady here. And so, like, my lady's like, I probably won't be done until, like, 4, maybe 4.30. And so the lady was like, okay, um, I'll, I'll just, like, I'll, I'll come back. And, and then, like, 30 minutes later, another lady came in, and she's like, I'm here for a manicure, pedicure. And I'm like, oh, God. Oh, they, like, solid fucking booked this poor woman. And she can't even tend to anybody else because they didn't book my appointment correctly for the amount of time needed to do the nail art. The lady, the lady doing my nails was fucking wonderful though. She was a she was a wonderful lady, <laughs> dude, it's, especially due to her unfortunate circumstances. And then, while my appointment was going on, my massage therapist was like, "Hey, I know you have an appointment soon, but uh, I got an emergency. Something happened with my kid at school, and uh, so we got to pick him up." And uh, my my husband won't be here until like a half an hour after your appointment's supposed to start. So uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you can you come in later today? And I was like, yeah, that's no problem, no big deal. You do not miss working in salons. That sounds very unfortunate. Apparently, it's really common for like the front desk to forget that the nail techs I don't know need to eat food, so they'll just solid book them a full fucking day. <laughs> oh god. Jesus, yeah, it's uh, it's rough. Very common. I'm so sorry, people. <laughs> Women in charge of planning. Jeez, Not even insane. once, dude. <laughs> That's lack of communication and scheduling. Chats, if you want to buy some gamer subs, you can get the new meat canyon flavor. Make sure to use. Code oh yeah, I didn't even look. I didn't even look. I gotta look at gamer subs website today. That's fucked up. Where's the slave song when it's needed? True, true and real. <laughs> <laughs> but after my nail appointment was over, and my hands are sore, man. I haven't gotten a professional manicure in ages. Usually I do my own nails. So, like, my cuticles are suffering. They're not used to being abused in this manner. And I mean, that's not my nail tech's fault. Like, she she did exactly what she was supposed to do. But I am, I am a dainty little flower. And I cannot handle a lot of pain. <laughs> 
You just don't like when they push back my cu the cuticles? She didn't even do that, because I don't have, like, cuticles to be pushed back. But she still did, like, the trimming, which, like, makes sense, right? You want to trim, like, the dead skin. Tristan! Tristan, thank you for the 1,500 dick bitties! Ah, oh, thank you! Thank you! Thank you, thank you! She lied as naturally as she breathed. What do you mean? What do you mean? <coughs> what am I curing this man of? What do you mean? Beauty is pain, I guess. You'll never understand women and their reasoning to put themselves through this. You'd assume it's similar to men going to the gym, but that has more healthier benefits. I mean, it's to keep your hands looking healthy, right? Like, it, like I know some of it is painful, but it, it's like, it's not like bad pain either. Again, it's like, it's just, it's just normal question mark. <laughs> A question mark? Is it worth the eels? Do not the eels chat. Just looking healthy, not being healthy. Well, it's the same thing. Yes, it, it, it keeps your nails healthy. <laughs> As a guy, your uh, sister-in-law made your wife and your brothers go for a pedicure. You admit, despite not getting any clear coat or whatever, it was very, very nice. Want to go back with the wife? I recommend men get pedicures. Right? Because, like, I don't know many men that take care of their feet specifically at home. Like, how many men own a pumice stone? Right? Probably not a lot of you. Right? But, like... A lot of salons do actual, like, male pedicures, and they're cheaper than a woman, right? Because, like, you guys aren't going to get polish. Uh, and when when you get the male pedicure, uh, they basically just, like, exfoliate your feet and your calves, and they, they lotion up your stuff. They sh scrub off all of your dead skin. If you, if you have, like, ingrown toenails, if you have ingrown toenails or, like, they're growing crooked, uh, instead of having to go to, like, uh, a podiatrist to get that fixed for thousands of dollars. Uh, you could just you could just have Jenny at the nail salon uh, cut it from like three pedicures, four pedicures, and then your your toenail will be fine again. Like li literally, why pay a podiatrist when you can get that shit fixed by getting pedicures? Really? Yes. And a lot, a lot, of, a lot of men. Uh, typically, I find out you guys have fucking ingrown toenails. All right, you guys can fix. It. You have pliers for that? No, it doesn't. It doesn't fix it. <laughs> your boots twelve hours a day. It would be a waste of time. I mean, it's good to take care of your feet, dude. It's good to take care of your feet. Why not just remove it yourself and just have it grow back straight? Uh, because that's how you could get infections. <laughs> Just use a knife to cut off the calluses when they get too big. What the fuck is wrong with you? Imagine indulging the fetish doctor. <laughs> That's what a nail clipper is for. Well, I mean, they clip off more of the nail than what a nail clipper can grab. <laughs> the people saying pliers, uh, you guys could probably pull off more of the nail, but it's, it's not going to be very sanitary. <laughs> you got an ingrown toenail and you just use your trusty K-Bar combat knife to remove it? Jesus fucking Christ. Just put plaster on the bleeding. What is wrong with you? <laughs> you can't nail clipper your heels. Pumice stone is a requirement for you. I uh, binary mind gets it, dude. And he's one of the married guys in chat. Pay attention, everyone. <laughs> Sadly, can't go and get a pedicure or a professional massage because you have really bad psoriasis all over your body, especially your back and feet. Oh no, I'm sorry about. I'm sorry about the psoriasis you deal with, dude. Chainsaw is the right tool for the job. Fuck you, chat. <laughs> Fuck you, chat! But uh, after I got to my massage therapist place, this is uh, this is the lady that I saw once before. Oh my gosh, she's so good. Oh my gosh, she's so good. She makes me feel so good, chat. And uh, we were very yappy for this appointment. And this woman, this woman has like a she's got a she's got a special needs kid. She's got a kid with autism. And one of the first things she starts talking about is how, like, he's one of the only white kids at a majority black school and how frequently he gets, like, bullied or told to do things. And because he's autistic, he can't understand the people telling him to do things uh, are doing it to sort of harass him or make him do something they think is funny but is not good. And he thinks they're doing it because they're friends. And she's like... She, she shares a lot of the same opinions that I have that neither of us could probably say on Twitch. <laughs> bullies being bullies, yeah. Yeah. 
desire to glow intensifies. Yeah, she she's she's been through some shit as far as uh, dating guys goes, and she was she was talking about how she dated a guy previously, uh, who she was with for like a year and a half or something, and then he ended up confessing that you know he went through a phase where he was with men. And she was like, well, yeah, but you said it was just a phase, right? And he was like, yeah, I was with a guy for like two years. And she was like, if you were with a man for two years, that's not a phase. That's a whole ass relationship. You're gay. And she left. And she and I were able to bond over the fact that why are so many gay men in Atlanta pretending to be fucking straight? Why does that happen down here? This is why New England is better than the South. At least the gays up there are honest, chat. <laughs> Sounds like I found my twin. One day I'll have an autistic kid too. Yeah, but I don't want a husband like hers. All right, okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know how they've made this work thus far. But again, picture, picture me, right? Like this woman is basically me. <laughs> and she's now married to a man. She she's taller than I am though. I will say she's like she looks maybe like 5'10, 5'11. Like she is a tall woman. And she's like, yeah, my husband is like 5'4. You could pick him up and throw him. He's like a paperweight. Like a dude weighs nothing. Like maybe, maybe like spicy 111 cat, pounds. Right? Like he's cat, very, right? very petite, very tiny. And this fucking idiot, this fucking love of my life idiot wanted to go to the Black Lives Matter protests. And I was like, why? Wouldn't he just get like thrown through a window? And she's like, that's what I fucking said. I was like, you think your white ass is gonna last a hot second down there? They're gonna pick you up and throw you through a Best Buy so they can loot it. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Maybe he wants to get lifties. <laughs> oh my God. Use his butthole. Maybe he's gay too. <laughs> he based wife pause got. Yeah, I was like, I couldn't put up with someone like that, man. I don't know how you do it. I don't know. I do not know how you do it. And uh, <laughs> what's a pumice stone? A pumice stone is a volcanic stone that you rub on your skin to remove dead skin. <laughs> They'll literally stuff the boot in his mouth. Yeah, she was like, slowly but surely, I I am fixing him. And I was like, good luck, lady. <laughs> if spa people are this based, you'll start going to the spa. I mean, my my regular massage therapist before she left uh, was was also very based. She would she would rant about uh, like the transgender craze <laughs> while I'm getting massaged. My my nail tech my nail tech before she retired. She was, uh, I want to say she was like in her late 40s and she was married to a black dude and she spent a lot of time around like super, super fucking progressive white people. And like they, they are just as racist as all of us accuse them of being. And so like when she would show up with her black husband, they would like give her weird looks and shit. And at one point, I can't even remember what she said. But at one point, like, this group of people that they had walked up to, like, said something directly insulting. And she was just like, oh, do you have a problem with my husband being hard R N word? And they all just, like, stared at her like she was crazy. And she was like, yeah, I'm married to a hard R N word. What do you, what do you want to do about it? <laughs> She gives no fucks. Like she was she was a wonderful woman. <laughs> Party that formed the KKK is filled with racist people. Imagine my shock. She told that story to me like the first year I started going to her. So like I'm sorry I don't remember it better, but it <laughs> fucking makes me giggle. Was she forced to retire? No, she was uh she was having eyesight problems, which is a big problem if you're going to be doing people's nails so she uh she had to she had to retire the whole oh my god you said a word being much worse than insert actual bigotry and racism here yeah pretty much pretty fucking much 
Oh my god. Moose Nugget, by the way, thank you for the $10. Your ketchup tithe, madame, if it's a bridge you would like, might I suggest recruiting for the Dutch? The Dutch Vloo and the uh, Bridge is for boats and it's built over a road and there's one example of their work. I feel like YouTube chat is gonna gig a fucking scroll here in a second because I was way the fuck up. <laughs> I, I was holding my wanna. place. I was holding my place! Insulini, they give the two Canadians. Real men just use power tools. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Zombie licorice, they give the $50 doodles. You talk about wanting a good boyfriend, so you thought it would be worth a shot to say you're single 27-year-old engineer who wants an old house in New Hampshire. Build things, introverted, not cringe. This post's accepting. <laughs> Let me be your himbo! It would be nice to have someone in New Hampshire area, I'ma be real. I'ma be- I'ma be honest, are you gonna be- are you gonna be able to- to play Pokemon Go with me? And d defend us from those who should seek to rob us while we're playing? <laughs> <clears throat> Atlanta's the gay capital of the South? Yeah, fucking apparently it is, dude. I'm for creatine, thank you for the 10. Got a little brother who's non-verbal autistic. He developed a lot of patience for bullshit and it takes all that patience to not fly into a berserker rage when someone screws around with him for kicks. Yeah, you know, my massage therapist lady said that prior to meeting her current guy, uh, the dude that she was with was, like, physically abusive. And she didn't really kick into gear until he put his hands on her child. And when he did that, she stabbed oh him God, four times. He had to go to the hospital <laughs> and she spent three nights in jail. <laughs> I was like, fuck, I love this woman! <laughs> You have a request for a beautiful, hot, and sexy woman! Oh my god. Call the personality! They give you the 199. It's Atlanta, the gayest city in the year. There's no way that Atlanta's Jeez, gayer than Sally, San Francisco. Your lets you oh, there's no two way. Cums? Jesus Christ, this lady's your spiritual animal! I fucking love her! And her manlet! And her autistic son! <laughs> Is she single? No, she's got a husband, no. But he's five foot four. You could probably take him. <laughs> <laughs> Kek McCackerson, thank you for the 20. We need to do our part to stop bridge. You had to stop buying clothes at the soup store. Big sad. Why are there clothes at the soup store? Is her husband single? Chat. <laughs> Atlanta is a San Francisco that's still in the closet. I can believe that one. Just put the hubby on a shelf. He can't reach to get down. Where do I find such great women? What's really weird to me, right? And I guess this is where like your personal biases come in. It's like, how, how are all of these people that I meet incredibly based and rational? And yet it seems like everywhere goes blue during voting time. I was like, I, I, like, I don't understand how that works. <laughs> Wow, that blunt, you. Douglas Kaplan! Your wallet! Thank you for the $4.99. 40... $49.99. 40 hey I'm undervaluing you. I'm sorry. My brain algorithm. doesn't work. <laughs> Douglas Kaplan, thank you for the $49.99. You have ingrown toenails. You have to tell your roommate sorry. You said it was just for girls and men should have leather skin. Ha! I don't like leather skin. Ugh. I uh, I kept my massage membership to my original spa where my original massage therapist was before she left for one more month, just to see if they had any massage therapist that could compete with the with the based woman that I've that I've seen once before, twice now. Make the boy fuck along. And so on Monday I went for a massage, and the massage therapist had like the leatheriest hands I've ever felt. Like, her hands on my skin felt disgusting. Like, I couldn't- I couldn't even enjoy the massage because even through all of the oil and lotion, all I could feel was, like, sandpapery leather. It was- it was so fucking gross. It was so gross. Men, you should not have leather skin. You want your woman to want to be touched by you. 90-year-old <laughs> grandma hands? The 90-year-old grandma probably has softer hands than this woman did. Ribbed for no one's pleasure. Please, 
Blades don't have the leather skin. Women don't like leather and calluses. I can't think of men hands with calluses without thinking of the dude who would lift without lifting gloves. And then when his hands would get too calloused, he would just bite the calluses off of the palms of his hands. And I was like, you, you disgust me. <laughs> oh my God. There's a, there's another, there's another massage story for you. <laughs> and Selene, thank you for the five Canadians. Did all the gays move from San Francisco to Atlanta because of a crime? I mean, I guess, yeah, in Atlanta, you can be gay and do crime and not get arrested for it. <laughs> he just like me, for real, for real. What the hell? What the hell? Friend of yours was complaining on social media about how her taxes were too high. And that they were killing her. You didn't have the heart to tell her she voted for this? Why? You should have. I just been, just been like, who did you vote for? And then po post their fucking tax opinions for what they pushed into policy. You're a man with soft skin, but a lot of hair. That's the, that's the way it's gotta be, dude. Hairy men are the best. <laughs> Hairy men are the best. What about gay crimes, though? I mean, those are the kind of crimes. Always. Atlanta has the worst fucking drivers in the world. I would agree with you, but uh, I'm from Boston. So... <laughs> They're called mass holes for a reason. And driving is a big part of that reason. <clears throat> Harry soft men costumes, Soylent, what the fuck? Done something similar, you have skin that basically makes a scale that you have to pick off. What the hell? What the hell? That's my opinion on having hair in my food. Spino. Big boy, fuck along. Down. Down, Spino. <laughs> Monia. Cult of personality. Thank you for the 199. You've been here 10 years. If it's not number one, it's number two. I mean, it is very gay. Sergeant Frostbite. Thank you for the 10. As someone who's lived in Georgia your whole life and confirm Atlanta is an enigma in our state. It's, it's such a weird place, dude. It's gotta be hair in the right places. A booty forest can't be appealing. <laughs> true. And true and accurate. You knew someone who had legs that were scale-like due to a skin condition? That's really unfortunate. That's really unfortunate. Ah, uh, no. Where was I? Trash Jash. Thank you for the five. You're looking at Spice Bomb right now, but you have nowhere close <clears throat> that sells in person. <coughs> I'm dying. How can you find a sample before committing to a purchase? I mean, the only way would be to go in person. So I don't, I don't, I don't think you can get like free samples of colognes online anywhere. If you can, I don't know about it. Wolf and Wings, thank you for the five. As a truck driver, screw Atlanta to heck. I imagine doing truck driving stuff would probably be worse in the city, yeah? Flaky skin that you sometimes have to pull off sounds like psoriasis, like a mild case. Yourself and the back of your legs used to just flake off consistently. There are people who have psoriasis so bad, entire sections of their skin looks like they're covered in scabs. <clears throat> if psoriasis made you shed, like, your whole body like a snake, I feel like it would be cool. But unfortunately, that's not what it does. Music and fiction, thank you for the five. Self-care is important, getting your back massaged and then gua sha where they rub with a metal tool and break up scar tissue is always helpful. I've never even heard of that. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. My whole body is like sore as fuck. Like it's a good sore. Like it's a good sore. I have so much mobility, man. I have so much mobility in my neck right now. And she destroyed my glutes. <laughs> she was like, I don't know what it is about us women, but it seems like when women get stressed or angry, they just constantly clench their glutes and so i've noticed with almost all of my female clients they have a lot of stress that they carry in their glute region and you you are particularly bad stop it <laughs> so what even is a glute your glutes are in your butt they're in your tuchus you can you can like clench them you can feel it like i'm doing i'm doing like glute clenches right now man I'm doing doing glute, glute clenches right now <laughs> Your bad knee was hurting a night or two ago due to the extreme cardio you do. <laughs> but mad. It's now accurate. The streamers carry all of their stress in their ass. Your Oshi 
could have a hemorrhoid right now. <laughs> the VA is pretty bad, but Mass is worse. Oh man, I hate Virginia. I hate driving through Virginia. This shit's terrible. It's terrible. Adepta Potentia, thank you for the 10. Hey, Kirsha, you got really upset the other night when you tried to tell people who live in Australia and the UK about why you're upset about DEI and Bridge Consultation Group. Their response, you're all right. That doesn't surprise me. I've seen a lot of people in comment sections being like, this is why America is lost. And it's like, I got news for you. I know that you like to think that America is the only country in the world because if you don't think that way, you remember that you live in Europe and that you're worse off. But it's not the only country in the world and globalists want to bring this globally, not just in the United States. This shit's worldwide, baby. They need to employ Pitbull to make their theme song. California drivers are massive pussies. They drive 10 under the speed limit. What the hell? I think they mean that Kirsch is all right, which I agree on. That's, uh, I don't, I don't understand the response of like, you're alt-right or you're a conspiracy theorist, unless these people genuinely are, are just not able to understand what has been done with words to make them mean something that they don't actually mean. Virginia's terrible for driving because half the drivers are stopping dead in the middle of the road for a right turn into a business or waiting 15 seconds to start moving on green is acceptable. And also it's a felony to drive 15 miles over the speed limit. <laughs> Athari and thank you for the five. You see, Foxu, the dead have scrambled up from their graves and begun voting bleh. That's the real zombie apocalypse right there. Can we remove zombie? Can we do that? Is that possible? They changed the definition of words to match how they feel. Gordo Gamer, thank you for the 20. Is it bad to be attracted to a cartoon fox that you don't even know that well? You were in Miami and everyone just parked in parking lots, not in parking spaces, but just wherever. What the fuck? I haven't seen that before. I mean, like, I've seen the dudes with really expensive sports cars, <clears throat> like, park diagonally. So they take up, like, either a block of four spots or two spots. So they don't have anyone that parks near them to harm their vehicle. But it's also, like, if you're gonna drive a vehicle that expensive to, like, the mall or a grocery store, I, I don't think any way you park is really gonna make that much of a difference. <laughs> Fuck those guys. The term itself, conspiracy theorist, was made in the Vietnam War to discredit people saying America was doing messed up stuff. Well, I mean, they were. They are. I hate our government. Zombie is a derogatory word. They prefer... <clears throat> I'm dying. They prefer undead American! They can eat my ass. Happy birthday to you, 41 today. Cold acid, happy birthday! Happy, happy birthday, cold acid! I hope you have a good happy birthday day with delicious cake. Get out of state drivers out of Florida because you see motherfuckers either idle on the crosswalk when walking or hit you on the sidewalk off ramp. What the fuck? How many times have you been hit? How many times have you been hit? It was the JFK assassination. What did he mean by this? What do you mean by the Doug Douglas Kaplan? Douglas Kaplan. <laughs> Thank you for another $49.99. Are you okay? Are you sure there's no one holding you hostage? What is happening? You found the spice cologne I talked about. You don't see how it smells good. It cleans up your sinuses though. So you guess it's a plus. What the hell? I mean, some dudes don't like the spicy smell, but God damn, the women love it. It smells so good. It smells so good. I hope it grows on you. <laughs> Sergeant Buck, thank you for the $10 doodles. Eczema is your problem. You can find lotions or facial washes that control the dry skin, but it either only lasts for 12 hours or makes your skin feel itchy. If you have like eczema or psoriasis, you're going to need like a prescription lotion. And I think even with that, like it'll help, but it's not going to make it go away fully. <clears throat> it's butt time. Damn, send another $49.99 if you're being held hostage and need help. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Master Go, thank you for the two. Kegel maxing stream when? Even if I were to do Kegel maxing during stream, I wouldn't tell you about it, chat, you weirdos. 
Emperor Creatine, then you have the $10. The amount of time it takes to drive from Canada to Virginia is the same amount of time it takes to drive from Dallas to El Paso. The sun is risen, the sun is set, but you ain't out of Texas yet. Yeah, I'm not looking to driving for an entire day next week. That's why I said this weekend's gonna go really fast. I didn't even finish explaining why it's gonna go really fast. Like, I am just... I am just a super stuffed foxu. Tomorrow want a dead sponsor. Sunday extra long stream and a raid shadow legend sponsor. Daddy raid shadow legends came back to me. He picked up the milk and he came back. Oh, riggy shiggy wiggy. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for the riggy shiggy liggy diggy. Oh my God. <laughs> It's your boy, Raid Shadow Legends. So, uh, the Wanted Dead sponsor, you guys just gotta show up and hang out like usual. I mean, you don't gotta, but I would appreciate it. <laughs> and then, uh, Sunday, Raid Shadow Legends, uh, you know, you gotta, I gotta get some new players into the game with my affiliate link. <laughs> Ooh, Raid on Death Stranding Day. I gotta play two hours of Raid Shadow Legends and then I can... And then I can go back to shaking the baby. <laughs> um, for creatine. I'm talking about your driving, though. I am uh, not looking forward to driving on Tuesday. I don't. I, I just, oh, it's, so, it's so much driving. So much driving. And I somehow have to find time between all of this going on and my streaming schedule. And on Monday, on Monday, I was going to have an entire day of catch-up thank yous before I leave. But then Fillion was like, hey, bitch, you want to do a collab again? And I was like, hey, bitch, yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm going to be doing a couple of hours of thank yous and then I'm going to be going to Philly and stream. <clears throat> do you have, do you, do I listen to podcasts or playlists? Playlists. Oh shit. Yeah. Literally, literally minutes before I go on vacation, uh, I'm going to be doing something with Philly and there's supposed to be four of us. It's me, Mari Mari underscore EN, Philly and, and she hasn't told me who the fourth person is yet. So, <clears throat> Wasn't scared away. Us, us white cat-like women gotta stick together. <laughs> oh God, did I do laundry yet? No! I haven't done laundry! I haven't started packing! I haven't done anything! I have to, I have to talk to my, to my realtor people to set up appointments to show houses. I don't have any time chat! You're so happy I introduced you to Mari. She's great. I love that fucking fish, dude. I love that fucking fish. I should do that. I know I should have made more time to actually prepare for my vacation, but I was too concerned with stream and you guys. And I put all of my time and effort into that instead. <laughs> I love the 6,000 year old lolly cum demon vampires. <laughs> How much W's can one fox shoe score? Dub W! <laughs> Joe Rogan, Jesus Christ. Have I considered meth and not sleeping? Well, I don't have meth, so... I don't have meth. Sigur and Aeterna, thank you for the $10. Can confirm California drivers are lacking functioning brains. You're at a point where you firmly believe anyone who drives slow for no good reason should have their license permanently revoked. That's why I feel like, you know, eventually old people need to get off the fucking road. Anthony Norla, thank you for the ten dollar doodles. And to build calluses to avoid paper cuts from mail, but the paper cuts specifically target the webbing in between your fingers. What do you mean? Laundry's the easiest thing to do, and this is coming from a guy your ex never did her laundry. God, I love laundry day. I love I love how laundry smells. I love how fresh out of the dryer laundry feels. I love it. I love it. Live in Atlanta. Why do you Why do I lie to you? What do you mean by this? I also don't live in Atlanta. <laughs> I've just been there, you know? Hey. Fresh laundry, yeah. Daniel Sierra, thank you for the 199. Ask these people, okay. Describe right that's not alt. True. True and real. Don't know why you got recommended this channel on YouTube that you saw was live. Caught up at two time before switching to Twitch to get Prime sub because based, if I can find where the button wandered off to. Uh, apparently they like hid the prime button. I have no idea how to find it. Hopefully someone in chat can help you. <laughs> Thank you, Digital Moonlight. I haven't even gotten into like the actual meat of today's stream yet. I'm just fucking chilling right now. 
but a welcome new friend. Welcome, welcome. Bra, 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 blab. Thank you for the two dollars. <laughs> Prescription involves doctor. No doctor. No, uh, unlucky. I also have no doctor. Also hate doctors. You gotta hit subscribe and then checkbox use Prime. Ah. Fly someone to help me get packed and then drive me home. I wish. <laughs> oh, I wish. It's your boy, Rady Shady. <laughs> F Flame Messiah. Thank you for the dollary doodle, my dude. Master Goa. Thank you for the two bucks. Confirmed. The boss is Kegel maxing right now. That's just not true. Meat of Deceit. Thank you for the ten dollary doodles. The oil you get on your hand at work is mixed with a corrosive chemical, so your hands get light burns on them. Don't think lotion will help you. There's there's restorative lotions with like cocoa butter, and uh. Oh god, there's another butter that's not cocoa, but I can't remember what it is right now. But like, it can it can help reduce the burn marks. Makes it makes your hands a little bit fresher. Zombie licorice. Thank you for the twenty dollary doodles. Walked in on the get rid of zombie comment and legit thought I was talking about you for a second. Enough cringe for today. On the Discord, if you're interested, you're gonna go help install an AC unit. What does that mean? What did he mean by this? Yeah, I'm speci specifically fuck that zombie in particular. <laughs> That's a joke. I'm joking. <laughs> Have the prime sub that you never use. Freaking Pope! Thank you! Thank you for proving! I hope you enjoy your newly acquired feet pics. <laughs> Using lotions with a high urea percentage can help too. I don't know what urea is, but it makes me think of urethra. Don't... Don't put anything in there, chat. They removed the Prime checkbox under the subscribe menu. You have to click subscribe, but then elevate your subscription button, and then it's an option at the top. That's so weird. Why did they do that? Shadow Fiorit, thank you for the $20. As someone who's going to be VTubing soon, are there any tips or tricks that I can tell you? I don't wanna... Um... I guess I would say... Figure out how to just, like, ramble on about stuff when you don't have, like, people in chat to bounce off of. Being being able to just, like, have a scrambled egg brain to pull shit out of at Look any time is very helpful. Jeez, and, uh, your boyfriend lets you, have two you might not cups. know what it is at this particular moment, but definitely try to find your niche. Finding finding your niche will make you explode. Make you explode. Urea is a waste product that is contained in piss. Oh! Oh, you guys are piss maxing. Don't rub that on your skin, you weirdos. Don't rub that on your skin. Also, so much prune in the chat! This is now a bukake stream with all of the prune. What the fuck? What the actual fuck? And uh, speaking of what the actual fuck, Mikey Mike! the Kiwi Farms Whisperer! My, Mikey Mikey! With the hundred and fifty dollar doodles! Enjoy your vacation. Thanks for being awesome. Thank you, Mikey! Thank you! You big, thick, dick Chad man! Thank you! Thank you! That's why I have two sponsors back to back. I've never done two sponsored streams in a row like this, but like... I need to, I need to recuperate the money I'll be spending on vacation. <laughs> I need... I need to recuperate! Thank you! Thank you, Mikey! Uh, holy lol, 69. Thank you for the five gift members in the YouTube chat. Thank you! Thank you, thank you! Thank you. There's so many, so many things going on in the Twitch chat right now. We got, we got a fucking massive Hollow Knight. Thank you for the prune. Thank you for the prune, Hollow Knight. Digital Moonlight. Thank you for pruning. Zipa 8. Thank you for prune. GB Kai. Thank you for prune. Thank you. Nice. And Angie Core. Thank you for the three month three sub. Thank you. Cinder Sins. Your name always makes me want pastries. <laughs> Cinder Sins, thank you for the five gift subs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Eat Crown Hay, thank you for ten gift subs. Thick ten gift subbies. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Spider God 99, thank you for the gift sub to Facial Cream Pie. How is that man real? How is that man real? What the fuck? You're gonna put the house fund bar up? Is it bad to be attracted to I'm really nervous about housing well? shit. <laughs> Zombify, thank you for the proom. Thank you. Lisa's Games, thank you for the 12 month sub. Happy simp anniversary! You can't make me! Happy, happy 
Happy Simpiversary! Foxy tips for you, Miss Eish. Be sure to unveil more insane stories to the filly in this weekend. We need to see if she can handle the key, Mom. I don't I don't know if we'll have time for tangent thing. Cute hope she uses it on Sunday. Can't wait to catch the collab. It's butt time? Anya! Zen Zenik of Zoth, thank you for the nine month three sub. Congrats on being born, my guy. Congrats on your birth! T Timlana01, thank you for the prune. Thank you. A distraction, thank you for the three months of prune. So much pruning! I'm gonna drown. I'm gonna drown! Rough times! Thank you for the three months of prune. Ever since you found the spicy it's foxy, you've been less black pilled, <laughs> trying to suppress the doomer daily. Thanks, Fox Lady. You're welcome. You're welcome. Do not do not listen to people who would make fun of you for trying to do something. Or for saying there's nothing you could possibly do as a single person. Don't don't let them demoralize you. They're just crabby old men. It's a down payment or the entire house. Uh, for the entire house, I don't know what the amount would be because I'm, I'm going to see a few houses on vacation to see if how much I like them. But also because of the way mortgage lending works, my income for 2024 isn't accounted for until next year. Uh, so I have I have a mortgage that would be acquirable that is lower than what I would need to purchase almost any house in Massachusetts. Like I could not e I could not get a mortgage for that crack den that I showed you guys. <laughs> so the way that that works, if you only like, let's say let's say you only get a mortgage for five hundred thousand dollars, but you find the perfect home and it's six hundred thousand dollars. With that 500000 you would have to put the 20% down that you would be required to pay normally. And then you would also have to make up the other $100,000 in cash if you wanted the $600,000 house. One person can't change the world. Tell that to Franz Ferdinand. Oh, wait, he's dead. <laughs> I eat Gene Stealer ass. Thank you for the member. And also... If you eat their ass and they're a gene stealer, do you get the genes that they have stolen? Star Phoenix, thank you for the two dollars. Wow, Sally, your boyfriend lets you have two sponsors. It doesn't happen often, so hopefully you guys aren't gonna be upset that I have back-to-back -back sponsors. <laughs> hopefully you won't be upset, I'm sorry. There's nothing you can do as a single person. John Wilkes Booth was a single person that altered the history of the United States with a single decision, as bad as it was. True. You can make a difference, chat. For legal reasons, this example is a joke. <laughs> Get the green, yeah. Yeah, like I, I feel comfortable making a purchase that's slightly higher than what my mortgage lending rate has been quoted as, but like... I can't, like, that doesn't matter to the people lending me the money. <laughs> Watch the craziness anyway. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Thank you, Spider God, for the seven dollar doodles. You can make a difference. I'm sorry, how do I do the Prime thing again? I don't know, like, you hit subscribe and then there's, like, a button somewhere. I've, I haven't subbed with the Proom in a long time. I haven't subbed to the Proom in a long time. TTS too quiet. Unlucky. I can't increase that volume. That's a Nim thing. Jordan, Jordan Gant. Thank you for the fifty dollar e doodles. Hello, Fox Woman. If you don't remember, I drank my girlfriend's pads. I used to make pasta sauce out of girlfriend's heavy period blood pads. Also used raised a family of vampire bats off of the same blood. I just don't believe you. All right, like the other guys was believable, but like this one, this one's not believable. You also broke my YouTube chat. My, I can't scroll in YouTube chat. Okay, there we go. I fixed it. <laughs> I was like, I can't scroll my YouTube. Yeah, but I just don't believe that. That's not, that sounds that sounds like some Reddit shit that's just not real. All right, okay. I'm gonna if you if you want to prove to us that you actually do that, uh, I'm gonna need to see a video of you making pasta sauce out of your girlfriend's pads. All right, okay. Uh, like, you don't have to put your face in it. It's gonna just be, like, the the stove in your hands. But I'm gonna need a video of that if you want me to believe you. 
Master Go, I thank you for the two dollars. It comes from a peen and it's good for girl skin. No. No, it's not. Sergeant Frostbite, thank you for the member. Thank you for the member! Thank you, thank you. Mm. E. Curran, hey, thank you for the gift sub to Maniacal Foreigner. Thank you, dude. Do I think we'll see Bridge on college campuses? Absolutely. Don't send her that video because she'll share it with us. I mean, of course I will. And it'll be safe for Twitch because there won't be any nudity. Watching on the YouTube player using Twitch chat is the best Kirsha watching experience. Truly, it is. Oh yeah, we have a new we have a new emote in Twitch chat as well. We have a new animated emote that YouTube can't have because YouTube hates animated emotes. It's a little it's a cute little vibes emote. The uh, the artist that made it is in uh, in my credits. It's in my credits. I can't open my browser and I can't wait. Hold on. I have I have the folder open. I can remember their name there. It's not, it's by it's by Tsuki Dere. Tsuki Dere made my vibes emote. It's very cute. Very cute and vibing. Now now you can vibe and squib and happy clappy all at the same time. Multiple forms of dancing. Binary mind. Thank you for the 10 month member. Two more months until the one year on the YouTubes. That's crazy. It does not feel like it's been a full year since I got membership access on YouTube. That's kind of nuts. That's kind of nuts. Anthony Norwood, thank you for the five dollars. You carry super glue in your lunchbox to avoid bleeding on people's mail from the paper <laughs> and the cardboard cuts. But what if you just wore gloves? I've seen male people's have gloves. <laughs> oh, that one spooked me! A more positive example of one man being enough is Stanislav Petrov who didn't fire nukes when he received orders to because of a faulty alert. Because he didn't simply follow orders we're not living in a glowing wasteland. At least not a literal one. Oh thank you Stanislav. I appreciate your slajiwi. What about female people with I'm gonna stuff a turkey inside your dick. Very sorry, but it's time to Isn't listen to Booma to Gary, to angry, racist, rap enthusiast. One? What? Like it or not, the peen lotion is peak performance. If you come on my face, I'm tearing it off. <laughs> That's such a waste. <clears throat> Will you damage the already brain damaged Fillion with sounding tales and mom stories? No, we actually have a plan for the stream. We actually have a plan, so we'll see what happens. I see Ralph. Thank you for the prune. Thank you for pruning. Thank you for pruning. You think you'd prefer the literal glowing one? What did he mean by this? What did he mean by this? Speaking of what did he mean by this? Today's today's stream. Today's stream. Look, I om I'm I'm almost in the corner. I will also probably make camera angles when after vacation. My sinuses are droopy. Today, I'm gonna go over a bunch of shit uh, about bridge. <laughs> I'm gonna go over a bunch of shit about motherfucking bridge, dude. I put out some tweets. I put out some tweets the other day because there was just so much fucking information. I was like, you know what? Even though I'm not going to be streaming until Friday, let's let's just put all this information out here. Maybe someone else will do a video before me. Not a big deal. Not a jazz music stops. The bridge stream never ends. And the amount of like tendrils involved here are kind of fucking crazy. Woohoo! Depression! It's not depression! You can't fight that which you do not know! And if you do not know what is happening, how are you supposed to combat it? Did I start playing Death Stranding because of this bridge? No, I started playing Death Stranding during the Donathon. <laughs> okay, alright. Kira should have an InfoWars set up. I should, honestly. I would love I would love an InfoWars esque fucking stream slide for when I talk about this shit specifically, but uh, I don't I don't know where I would get one of those or who I would talk to. I have to message a couple of people back that I was talking to about model stuff, but like, I don't know if these people in my DMs watch my stream. Please accept my sincerest apologies for taking forever to answer DMs. I 
I am one fox woman and it is so difficult to do everything. It's so hard. What happened to the fox news desk? It wouldn't really fit on this overlay. That's why you read Karl Marx and Hitler. What the hell? What the hell? Dreamwreck AC. Thank you for the five gift members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you mention your mom's massage therapist and taught you? God damn. Infowords needs to hire Kirsha. I just wanna I just wanna hang out with Alex once, you know? That could be fun. Wolf and Wings, thank you for five dollars. This says the bridge that never ends. It just goes on and on. My friends! Yeah, big guy. <laughs> once you hit midlife, you'll notice more things and not enough time to point it out. Probably. You know, I'm pro like once I once I hit midlife, I'll just be like, I can't stop noticing, but also I have no time. But I have no time right now, so I can't imagine having even less time. Honestly, music and fiction. They give the toe. They're turning the trolls under the bridge. Gay. They are. Improv man. They give the two. Francis Kirsha Morgan. <laughs> I don't want to take his first name. If I marry him, I'd take his last though. They're considering uh, reaching to Uwu Market to see if they have a merch that was discussed one time and forgotten. See if they can like it and then reach to me. I have no idea what you just said, but if you're missing an order, uh, yeah, if, if like you ordered something and it never showed up, please contact them. My Oshi is named Fancis. What does that even mean? You ever feel bad about DM speed? Remember, Pippa has a manager in a corp and still takes a year sometimes to reply to people. Yes, but it doesn't stop me from feeling bad. <laughs> it doesn't... It doesn't... You missed the R, Francis. I don't believe that's your Oshi. But to bridge! But to bridge. They started sending out emails that you can sign up for. They actually have a two-tiered email sign-up system. And I signed up for the first one. And so I was getting bridge emails, but I wasn't getting their smart brief. Because I was signed up for their informational but not for their brief. So KB, KB is the one who archived the April 3rd week of Bridge Smart Brief because their articles rotate and change every week. So thank you KB for archiving this shit that I was not signed up to on accident. I have signed up for Bridge's seminar. So on the 25th, because they do it the last Thursday or they're going to start doing it the last Thursday of each month. And uh, hopefully I can gain some insight on their seminar at the end of this month. Uh, it's gonna be in Zoom, but they also have audio only joining, so hopefully I can do that. The email. What the email? Is Bridge really that bad? Yes, buckle up, buckaroo. Alex Jones is Blair White's sugar daddy. Maybe he could become Kirsch's sugar daddy too. I don't have a penis. Can I live stream the seminar? No, but I can record it. Improv man, they give the two dollary doodles. The joke was that I am Zach. Oh, it was me all along. And so from this uh, April 3rd smart brief, uh, it has a whole bunch of different articles that are linked in it. And it gives like a little blurb of the article. So these aren't the actual article names. This is what Bridge is showing you that the article is. So like the first, the first industry news, we got brands need to embrace inclusivity to reach Gen Z. Brands and media agencies can incorporate inclusivity in their marketing strategies by prioritizing media channels and platforms that resonate with underrepresented audiences and expanding influencer marketing campaigns to feature those voices and other specific demographics, says Mark Walker, CEO of programmatic platform Direct Digital Holdings. And we're gonna get, we're gonna get into the Direct Digital Holdings hole here in a moment, but uh, the fact that they keep talking about the influencer marketing campaigns, we already went through that one campaign that I happened to find related to Campbell's Streamers and YouTubers and other assorted influencer types like on Instagram and on TikTok are going to be used for this marketing push. Because, because content creators have a different kind of audience engagement and trust than traditional Hollywood celebrities, this is very much something that cultural crusaders want to capitalize on. 
because a content creator has a sort of relationship with their audience, they come off as more authentic and people are more likely to buy what the content creator is selling. And even if that content creator isn't necessarily pushing a specific product, they're going to be taking money from these people that are pushing an ideology instead. Rip Capcom, they double down on localizing for modern audiences that don't exist. Oh no, dude. Gentlemen, I think the issue is that we haven't diversified enough. So we got smart brief survey here. We got cultural competency and DEI initiatives. We got a GLAD's EMEI supports LGBTQ creatives, equity in media and entertainment. Uh, don't backpedal. Go harder with DE and I commitments. Hope Farley, founder and executive producer at Adolescent Content, urges the industry to stand firm on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and go beyond performative measures to truly embed inclusivity in their companies and work. Quote, company must prioritize inclusivity at every level and empower diverse voices to thrive, Farley writes, adding... This means encouraging managers to recognize the value of diverse perspectives, lived experience, atypical career paths, and varied educational backgrounds. New internship models emerge to expand access. Organizations are working to broaden access to internships, addressing concerns about equity and inclusivity, particularly for historically underrepresented groups. As students face increasing pressure to secure internships, New models have emerged from fully funded short-term programs to micro-internships, offering flexibility and opportunities for diverse learners. Diverse learners. When we did ask, they stop with the superficial bullshit. You weren't expecting them to buckle their fuckle and hunker down on this shit? They decided, let's go warp fucking speed, baby. Uh, raising voices, DEI champions, McDonald's aids research in culturally intentional ads. McDonald's is contributing to the development of the NIQ Bases Cultural Resonance Module to evaluate the cultural relevance of its advertising campaigns by identifying offensive stereotypes, accessing or assessing inclusivity, and preserving authenticity in its content. By focusing the conversation on cultural factors, the insights from this module are set to change the conversation around representation and relatability in advertising. And this makes me think about the McDonald's advertising campaigns that were happening on Twitter and how the Japanese advertising campaigns were very wholesome and sweet, while the Americanized advertising campaigns were uh, very much not so. And after a while, McDonald's actually started blocking the Japanese ads outside of Japan. And from from a normal perspective, you could see that and be like, oh, they just didn't want to pay to have their ads shown globally. But when you think about how they're targeting specific cultural relevancy, depending on where they're showing their ads, they don't want you, if they're serving you slop, to see that they're serving something that honors traditionalism in another country. Some Japanese marketer got a call from the USA HQ. It's funny that they think advertising will make up for their inflated burger prices. Oh my god. PepsiCo CMO, diversity and engagement are the key to culture. PepsiCo's culture is built on diversity from cultural and gender diversity to diversity of thought, said Mark Kirkham, chief marketing officer of PepsiCo's international beverage business. We spend a lot of time with consumers, a lot of time with the different markets around the world, and a lot of time with our teams, our agency partners, and our bottlers to build the brand programs that we launch internationally. And this article, this article, they talk about it in a way that it's not actually portrayed here. So it seems like, it seems like the PepsiCo guy is a little, a little confused on what's happening with all of these initiatives. Maybe, like, it comes off as confused to me, because he doesn't even fall in line with the terminology that all of the other companies use. Uh, so the, the interviewer asked, what's the most surprising thing you've learned about PepsiCo since working there? And he said... One of the most surprising things about Pepsi is the diversity of knowledge, diversity of cultures, diversity of business models. 
When you come to PepsiCo, particularly on the beverage side, you've got franchise businesses where you work with different bottlers in different parts of the world. On top of that, there's cultural diversity, gender diversity, diversity of thought. We have over 330,000 employees and we get the opportunity to engage with frontline workers up to senior management. This is the only time diversity in this article is mentioned. And it just sounds like he's like, oh yeah, we got bottling plants in like Mexico and Colombia and uh, Istanbul. I don't know. I can't think of things off the top of my head. But he's like, we have these bottlers all over the world. And so we're in diverse cultures by m making business partners with these bottlers in different places. I'm sure they're all going to bottle it. Yeah, so, it so it's like, I don't know why I think about Constantinople so often, chat. It's just always on my mind. <laughs> He's using, yeah, he's like, he's using the word, like, actually correctly, and he tries to throw in some of the buzzwords, like, gender diversity. But it's just like, it looks like he's trying to say, like, yeah, we're actually involved in different cultures around the world because this is where we have bottling plants. And it's like, Mr. Sir, Mr. Sir, I don't think you've read what's going on. I can't, it's hard to believe that there would be someone this high up that just doesn't know what's going on, though, right? Like, there's no way. There's no way he's that naive, right? Like, I just, I don't understand, man. Frontline workers are the people going to seven stores a day to stock things. They aren't talking to them at all. We need to think more about Rome and the Holy Roman Empire. And then uh, back to the bridge thing. Uh, leadership, talent, and trends. The Chanel CEO. Why she wants to hear all voices in the room. After 30 years at Unilever and two years into her role as CEO at Chanel, Lena Nair says she's committed to equity by increasing the presence of women in the C-suite, but says she's still careful to pay attention to all the voices in the room. I've always believed in the collective voice, collective intelligence, and diverse perspectives, Nair said. Under DEI and media buying, we have multicultural marketing needs to go mainstream. Work in Progress invites others to join Opening Shot. Work in Progress created an Opening Shot initiative in partnership with client Domino's and 100 Roses from Concrete, which is giving underrepresented talent the chance to work on ad shoots. Miami Dolphins gain more Hispanic marketing rights. A bridge pioneering DEI next practices. Bridge 24 gains strategies from an impressive lineup of speakers. Uh, countdown to Bridge 24. And then there's a quote down here. I am the way I am because nobody could convince me to be otherwise. And then there's a little blurb at the bottom about Bridge. Launched in 2022, Bridge is a member-driven 501c6. We help companies bridge the gaps that have created inequities for underrepresented and untapped communities in the workplace, workforce, and marketplace. With the variety of programs that Bridge offers, including proprietary research, storytelling workshops, best practices, events, and more, we identify and dismantle the structures in place to drive systemic change in belonging, representation, inclusion, diversity, and equity. Bridge is an acronym for these constructs. Our long-term goal is to create a comprehensive bridge agenda for companies and certify against its implementation and impact. Bridge is an inclusive organization that welcomes support and participation from all companies in the global marketing industry, as well as like-minded academics and DEI champions. We are stronger together. The entire world is a flat parking lot. <laughs> like Coco Chanel, wasn't she a Nazi fan? <laughs> I do not know what Coco Chanel was into. But I opened a handful of these articles to read. One of them, one of them being this campaign article, Moving Past Performative Diversity by Hope Farley. As DE&I initiatives fall by the wayside and even become the subject of ire, businesses must not get flimsy. Diversity, equity, and inclusion have been at the forefront of corporate agendas recently and for good reason. Not only does DE&I promote a more just and equitable society, but it also has a profound impact on business success. And this is, this is why I say that all people who are like, 
it's all about the money man if they're not making any money like it's gonna have to stop eventually like you don't even need to do anything man once they realize they're like not making a profit man they'll just like stop bro no no they won't because this is ideologically driven it is no longer just about the money when they say that there is a profound impact on business success while these companies are bleeding out buckets of money, all of their products are failing to sell, they're losing at the box office, no one's buying their video games, they have to give each other awards and circle jerks to make themselves feel more important than they actually are. The success is not monetary, but they still see it as a success. Do you know why? Because they're succeeding in permeating the ideology throughout all of these industries. They are succeeding. They have been succeeding. Not financially, but that's because it's not about the money right now. They're going to be able to make that money back once this ideology is inescapable. Power is better than money. Exactly. Once you have the power, the money is just going to come naturally. The slow march through the NPCs. Most, uh, most women get off on the validation craze. Validation for women is like doing crack cocaine. It's not just women anymore, right? Like, with, with the rise of social media, the majority of the horrid, for the content kind of people are men. They don't care about the things that they ruin to push their ideology. They will always just find a new person uh, to harvest for resources. They create nothing. They only destroy. True. Women and feminized men, the weak men who have brought the bad times. <clears throat> and also, we've seen the bridge people specifically circling the wagons, talking about how it doesn't matter if diversity employees, not, not like diverse, but the diversity officer style type people, it doesn't matter if a bunch of these people end up losing their jobs because them losing their jobs makes the other side feel like they've won and it's 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 not a win it's not a victory it's not a we won the battle but there's still a war they're removing these diversity employees because they're embedding it in the other employees in the company over socialized men as dr kaczynski said DEI is so insane up here in Soviet Kanakistan. Your biggest fear is that seeing hospitals, especially teaching hospitals, are pushing DEI stuff alongside medical schools. I mean, if people didn't think that it had infected the medical industry after watching what happened, where scientists and doctors were like, well, COVID's a problem, but Black Lives Matter is more important than COVID, so it's actually not a problem for all of these people to go out and riot. It's necessary to fight racism. But if you go out and visit grandma, you're literally Hitler. <laughs> like, if you if you couldn't see the double standard at that point, I'm not sure what to tell you. Music and fiction, thank you for the $2. Bridge DEI is the new Islam. I don't know if I would say that much, right? I feel like, I feel like Shari is a little bit more lenient than this. <laughs> at this point, you'd rather be Hitler than a Black Lives Matter supporter. <laughs> New DE&I leadership roles and fast adoption of inclusive policies in response to the 2020 Black Lives Matter movement were initial positive steps. And don't forget, don't forget that a lot of the people we've read who are now speaking as, as bridge speakers have said that the Black Lives Matter movement and the quote-unquote murder of George Floyd kicked off all of these companies starting to be held accountable for what they're only doing as performative. But then people got lax and companies went back to just being performative. Now, we must hold them accountable in a different manner. We, mu we must make it part of a company's DNA. However, these efforts have recently fallen off for many companies, raising concerns about the depth of their commitment. Recent mass layoffs and high-profile resignations, including Karen Horn at Warner Brothers and LaTondra Newton at Disney, suggest a troubling shift away from DE&I. In its place, a disavowal of DE&I has emerged, due in large part to a lack of corporate follow-through. Yes, that is... 
That is why DEI is being disavowed. It's, it's because corporations aren't following through. It's not because it's an insidious ideology that is trying to place equity as a priority of corporations as well as transforming the consumer landscape. It's not, it's not because this is built on Marxist ideology where they corrupt everything they touch and they try to create division between people. It's not a race to the lowest common denominator so that we have a ruling class on a class of sheep. It's because the companies aren't following through. That's why people are upset. <laughs> a co-worker tried to push DEI at the farm you work at. Boss made them clean the cow with a shovel. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's because it'll never be financially viable. True. Why are commitments to DEI fading? The lack of progress on many well-intentioned but often misguided initiatives has left many questioning the authenticity of corporate DEI efforts. In a recent ABC News report, diversity strategist Christy Lindor highlighted a fundamental flaw in the approach. In 2020, many organizations reacted to the market, reacted to social events taking place without really having a clear understanding of what DEI is and how it should be enabled in business. In other words, the focus on DEI often served as a cosmetic fix rather than a real commitment to inclusivity. The breakdown of what was recently such a promising field could also be due to the Supreme Court's 2023 ruling to strike down affirmative action, leaving an opening for the business world to follow suit. I like how I like how they're bemoaning the uh, the Supreme Court ruling is bad. Or perhaps the problem lies in a lack of comprehensive solutions that addressing the root issues minorities face. Performative programs fail to make a lasting impact. It could also simply be that Americans are fickle. So companies have dropped diversity initiatives as DEI fades from the headlines. As Jeffrey Sonnenfeld, Senior Associate Dean for Leadership at Yale says, the business world goes through cycles of enthusiasm for various topics. Perhaps DEI has been swapped out for the new topic du jour, AI. And corporate backpedaling is likely due to a combination of these factors and more. Regardless, DEI remains as critical as ever. We must revive, rethink, and remake the conversation. Genuine inclusivity recognizes the moral imperative and business benefits of DEI. Studies consistently show that diverse companies are more innovative and profitable. And as we all know, they're not more profitable. They are bleeding money. They are not financially viable. So it's, it's a little disorienting to continuously hear them talk about how DEI makes companies more successful and more profitable when verifiably in reality, it is not. Adam Rabbit, they give it the $2. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Audiences are more diverse than ever. Also, before I continue reading, also, we got the we got the moral imperative here. Again, something directly from Cheryl Dijah's mouth, something that Bridge has constantly talked about in all of their all of their writings. As soon as a corporation tells you what your morals are, you know the moral thing to do is destroy it in any way possible. True. True. Audiences are more diverse than ever, and consumers are more, therefore, likely to support brands that prioritize inclusivity. Brands need diverse perspectives to speak to different types of consumers. Even AI can't manufacture the spirit of a community. Promoting equality and upward mobility for diverse employees can lead to those employees multiplying a company's reach. Therefore, companies must move beyond performative gestures and focus on meaningful action to revive and reimagine DEI efforts. A few corporations are prioritizing authentic inclusion. NBC Universal offers multiple mentorship programs, including the Edge program for minority-run companies and the below-the-line traineeship for people starting their careers. These types of programs are currently the exception rather than the rule, but this doesn't have to be the case. If each candidate knew that they would be paired with a mentor on their first day, companies would be able to hire more diverse candidates from non-traditional backgrounds. What this says to me is that if somebody who's not qualified for the job were to be given someone who's been doing that job to train them and give them all the knowledge they need for free, 
then we can have people who shouldn't be in positions learning haphazardly to get the position. Why, why don't white people get those? Because white people live a life of privilege and just get everything handed to them constantly. <laughs> Artificially boost their skill set by having actually competent people teach them how to fake it? Pretty much. Pretty much. And we already know from other articles we've read. Like, again, if you're joining for the first time, we're, we're working off a lot of information that we've already talked about previously. But they've, they've said that, like, even in gaming... They'll hire people who, because they're their friends or because they want to get into gaming but have no experience in the gaming industry. And so they'll hire their friends who are in these positions that have no experience. They'll waste budget money on these people. And then they'll be able to fluff their resume and say that they are qualified now. DEI is just the most recent way of using hiring as a weapon to attack a country, just as the Naturalization Act was back in 1965. The really fast-tracking corporate incompetence. It's all part of the competency crisis, baby. Here's your corporation-appointed man today. <laughs> it's just a way to get a less skilled worker and fire the competent ones to pay the less skilled worker less money. I mean, maybe. A lot of the diversity officers were making pretty fucking high salaries, which is another reason to get rid of the officers. And again, just make it the business of everyone in the company. You'd trade your white privilege for being able to afford a home. Please! Please turn me brown! I just want a home! <laughs> These candidates would be prepped for success, and senior leaders would become more in touch with demographics outside of their own. But corporate culture needs a fundamental shift for these approaches to be successful. Companies must prioritize inclusivity at every level and empower diverse voices to thrive. In addition to mentorship, this means encouraging managers to recognize the value of diverse perspectives, lived experience, atypical career paths, and varied educational backgrounds. This is where DEI consultants and firms are invaluable. Yeah, I'm sure they are with you asking them to pay thousands of dollars for your fucking weird ass consultancy, dude. <laughs> What distinguishes performative diversity from genuine commitment is a plan to bring in diverse voices and support them along the way. This, coupled with diversity at every level, can make a company stronger and more profitable. <laughs> hey. So this sounds exactly like the bully mafia tactics that uh, Kim Belair at Sweet Baby Inc. was talking about. You make these companies fear by not having your consultancy involved with their company. It's sort of like a, uh, you know, someone might come around and break some legs if you don't have someone on your team that can say, hey, don't, don't touch this company. They're with us. They know the plan. They know what's going on. They're doing the good thing. Can they even back up that theory? Probably not. Oh, swell day. Thank you for the $50. Your job brought you into the office for a series of DEI seminars last week. One of your team members lost it in a small group meeting and seriously said, if anything I say is now racist, then fuck it. I'm a white supremacist, but I better get a month. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Consultants and firms, AKA were essentially racketeering, but legally? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty fucking much. I don't, if you work in like a large company, I don't know exactly how you would be able to push back against this kind of overreach. Like the people in my chat who have said that they've brought this information to their bosses are like, you know, working in a in a local kind of place that isn't quite corrupted by these things yet. And Kaiser Vermillion, they the 20. DEI is just a failed marketing strategy. It's also a failed moralizing performance. But like the quote goes, anyone who must say he or she is X is not what they claim. What we need now is to spread this understanding. DEI isn't a failed marketing strategy, and it's also not a failed moralizing performance. DEI is just cultural Marxism under a different guise to try and pretend that they're doing something good. This is why this is why I said like I really wanted to do some sort of historical stream where I talk about the steps of Marxism and how it transforms nations. Because a lot of what we're reading now will make a lot of sense. If you understand how what communists transform sluts. a nation without violence. Keck McKeckerson, thank you for the prune. Thank you for pruning. 
You gave an info, uh, you gave the info to a friend of yours who's in tech for social services in your town, but you haven't heard back from him yet. Hopefully the glowies didn't get him. Hopefully the glowies didn't get him. Uh, one of the other articles uh, that was in the bridge, the bridge thingy here, the bridge smart brief. On Forbes, meet the team behind GLAD's Black LGBTQ Plus Media Advocacy. In 2022, GLAD, now an Emmy Award recipient known for its LGBTQ advocacy in media, embarked on a transformative journey with the inception of its Equity in Media and Entertainment Initiative, or EMEI. Spearheaded by Deshaun Usher, Senior Director of Communities of Color and Media, alongside Julian Walker, Associate Director, Kayla Thompson, and Tymia Bollard, the initiative launched with a vision to create a more inclusive and equitable landscape in entertainment and media for Black LGBTQ creatives. Each team member brings a distinct set of skills and deep commitment to the cause, making them not only advocates, but true architects of change. What a sentence, man! What a fucking sentence! Deshaun Usher, as the senior director, brings over 17 years of dedicated service to the intersection of research, program development, and health communications, spearheading initiatives that exceed $25 million in grants. His leadership extends beyond organizational boundaries, touching lives through Mobilizing Our Brothers initiative which champions the holistic wellness of black, gay, and queer individuals. Every Jeez, single Sally, holistic initiative I've ever cars? seen, every single one is just money laundering. And I have a feeling that this one is no different. Much like, much like that fucking subotic guy and his crazy frou-frou wife. Uh, I, you know? <laughs> Featured by Vanity Fair, Hollywood Reporter, and Billboard, Usher's creative and executive producing skills have been recognized with Webby, Shorty, and Telly Awards, making him a pivotal force in storytelling that reshapes how black LGBTQ narratives are perceived and valued. All right, I got some questions. First question, he's been featured in all of these places and apparently in Billboard. Who the fuck is this man? Why is he using Usher, the name of somebody who's actually famous? Let's let's be real here. Even if this is his actual last name and not a pen name, uh, referring to him as Usher is going to create confusion between people who know the actual musical artist. And he's been recognized with Webby, Shorty, and Telly Awards. What? The fuck are even those? <laughs> the sad part is that all of this is gonna cause mass distrust. It is. It already has. It already has. It's unfortunate. Usher's part of Diddy's posse. Oh my god. <laughs> Ballistic Zero. Thank you for the twenty. A burn loot murder decided to propose a national trail in Fairbanks. They're trying to steal property from people. Finding out who is and doing a one-day tar and feather summer. Here is one day the sun never goes down for three months. I can only understand the first half of your message. And uh, if they're proposing stealing property from people, that's kind of fucked. That needs to be that needs to be sort of fought against if that is what they're trying to do. Kate4394, they give the ten dollars. You're probably screwed at your job. BlackRock owns five to six percent of your company. They're pushing more DEI as the years go on and promising to sell only battery operated products within the next few years. I would I would like to I would like to go back to when planned obsolescence wasn't a thing and we built things to last, man. I was like I I want that. I want that back. Sean Hiroki, thank you for the 499. Totally feel that privilege as a school janitor. Insolent, thank you for the 10 Canadians. You work in a warehouse, finding DEI appropriate hires is easy. Only immigrants want the physical labor jobs, kind of like when your dad moved to Canada in the 60s and worked on the railroad. Which seems a little weird to me, right? Like, I've never bought into the, like, we need uh, illegal immigration because there's jobs that Americans won't do. I, I just, like, I, I cannot believe, especially growing up in a family that had so many physical laborers, all Americans everywhere are just like, oh yeah, you know what? We're just too good for some of these jobs. Like, I just, I understand there's been a snooty push to like look down on trade workers. I get that. 
but it, it's like those are necessary people that you can't continuously outsource People can't afford to do those jobs because the pay is too low to support your family now. Also true. The sad part is that all of this... Oh, I already read that. I already read that. My bad. <laughs> Sid the cat, thank you for the five pounds. I'm late to this. A Carolyn Berensko knew about Bridge long before anyone started talking about it. I don't know who Carolyn Berensko is. I don't know who that is. You'll have to send me information on her because as far as I know, I've been the only person talking about it for months now. Jackie, thank you for the 100 R's. Why are the creatures so obsessed with the ethnicities and LGBT? You still don't get it? Makes them look bad? I mean, because this is this is how you sow dissident between people. Back back in the USSR, that is a like monoculture, right? They they only they only had what looked like white people there, right? So you didn't have the ability to cause strife along racial lines like you do in a place like America. This is why feminists were considered the useful idiots in the USSR, because they were able to cause distrust between men and women. And if there's distrust between men and women, people aren't dating, people are turning to hedonism, people aren't getting married, people aren't having families. It starts causing the collapse in society. And who comes in with all of the solutions to this collapse? The communists. Trades can be some of the highest paying jobs. You just need to get the proper licensing and you can easily be making 30 plus an hour. Also true. Divide and conquer, a tactic as old as fire. True, true and real. True and real. Didn't Berensko have some stupid falling out with someone? I've literally never heard that name. Literally never heard that name. So I have no idea whom she is or how long she's been talking about Bridge. But if somebody else besides me has been talking about Bridge, I uh, fucking hell yeah, dude. <laughs> fucking hell yeah, dude. I'm wrong, there's so many nationalities in Russia. I mean, I know there's a lot of different nationalities, but if you look at Russia, everyone has a similar complexion. Hey, town drunks, you see the farmer? They own two cows, seize the means. She's referring to how the Bolsheviks started their militant uprising during a women's rights march. Not really, not really, well, I don't know. You fi you figure out why the communists who infiltrated Russia didn't want to try and cause strife along racial if lines then. I mean, if you if you want to make that argument, come come at house, me with with why they didn't things. do that. It's not that Americans don't want the jobs. It's that you can underpay and give less benefits to non-citizens. It's just a way to exploit minorities. I'm wrong. I mean, if I'm wrong, show me. I will admit that I am wrong if you have the evidence to prove that they did do that along racial lines in Russia. I don't know everything. It could be something that I'm missing, correct? So now the one, thank you for the $5. Communism is the ideology of lazy adult-sized children who hate the idea of actually working. Karl Marx himself is a prime example of this. True. True and real. Masiro, thank you for the member. Thank you for the member. Google Russian men and show images to shut chat up. Well, it's not even about showing the images, right? If, if there was division being sown along racial lines in Russia, then I am wrong thinking it was only done between men and women, which is what I have thought up until this point because nobody's talked about any sort of strife in Russia being considered along racial lines. So if this was something that was done, show me the proof. That is what I ask. If you are wanting to argue against me and say that that happened in Russia, it should be easy to show me. In the USSR, they were dividing rich and poor, not different races. Yes. And they were using... they. In America, it's becoming the same, right? They're trying to divide into an elite class and into the underclass that is to be ruled over, right? Carolyn used to be on YouTube, and from what you remember, she's a part of the problem. She was on TV saying that math was racist. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting, uh, some, some mixed signals from you guys. I don't know anything about Carolyn, so whoever knows something about Carolyn also throws something up about her in stream suggestions. There wasn't a division between men and women, though. This person does need to look into history. What do you mean there wasn't a division between men and women? That's what feminism was used for in the USSR. That was that was the purpose of feminism in that part of the world. Both check check in check I can't pronounce check 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 
that word wars. <laughs> A lot of the commissars in the USSR were Jews. Again, you guys are saying things, but I'm not seeing any links. I'm not seeing any sources. I'm just seeing... I'm just seeing talking. <laughs> the entire feminist and suffragette movement existed to make men and women hate each other. Yes. Commies go after women first because they're easy to manipulate in large groups. Then the young men followed. Are links allowed? Even if the bot removes a link, I can still click on it because I own the channel. Bro, they can't post links. I've said in stream suggestions, Mr. Moderator, maybe if you were paying attention. I've said in stream suggestions, and if they post it in stream chat, they can either get permission from a mod, or I can still click on it even if a bot deletes it. Literally, even if a bot deletes it. My moderator's paying attention to stream. Never happens. Oh, you get this straight. A movement, the feminist movement, was pushed as an ideal that must be embraced by the USSR, and the communists were the ones to swoop in and promise it, thus getting the people to usher them into power. Did you get that right? Feminism was a movement that was already sort of happening, but the communists in Russia that wanted to push their ideology saw feminists as a way to sow strife so that they could use the feminists in order to push their ideology on the population. You, can po you can't post links in the chat. No one has tried. Classic. Master Go, thank you for the $2. Could ask Russians with Attitude podcast stuff. I mean, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. You have two. Here's the first one. Um... The Russian Orthodox me Medievalistic. This looks like religion, so not what I'm looking for. Online compilation of the academic essays and lectures of Professor, M Professor Matthew Raphael Johnson giving Russia's extraordinary rebuke to American arrogance since 2000. Yeah, this isn't what I'm looking for. Uh, the USSR didn't exist in 2000. Here's the second one. All right, I'm looking at the second link. Gavrala Derzavin and the Committee for the Organization of Jewish Life. I know that there were Jews in the USSR. I'm not I'm not exactly I'm not exactly sure what this is for. Were man, you guys are being picky here. Are still are. Poetic silence, they give the ten dollars. Kirsha sounds like she's getting a spicy wanting to see these links the boston is going to come out get out of here that's just it's just annoying right like if if i am wrong about something if if i am incorrect and the ussr did create strife between racial lines and not just using feminism there will be a record of it we know that they used feminism because there are people who had interviews. There are people that spoke about it. There's there's documents from the USSR that came out. I'm not being given any of these links. I was I was given something about Russia in the 2000s and then something about Jews. Not wrong. Chat is just being argumentative. I mean, sometimes chat can be room temp IQ. Sometimes I can be room temp IQ. If I'm wrong about something, I'd like to know. I'd like to know. Please, you aren't being inclusive when talking about glorious Russia history. When was this supposed to have happened? When Lenin was alive or after the Soviet regime was established? I don't know. <laughs> Chad aspires to reach room temp IQ sometimes. Mikey, thank you for the 50. Someone seems to have forgotten that the USSR ended in the 90s. That's why I said the other, the first link, it said the 2000s, so that's not what I'm looking for. And communists basically trying to divide based on whatever they can. Yes. Yes. And that's why I was saying, like, while there are different nationalities that live together in Russia, I have not seen anything that says that the communists in Russia during the USSR were trying to divide the nation on racial lines like what is happening currently in the United States. This was a new line of attack because of what the United States is as a quote unquote melting pot. This was not the case in Russia, which is why only feminism was what was used as the destabilizing wedge. And again, if I'm wrong and they did, if, if I'm wrong and they did do this on racial lines in Russia, show me. 
posted a link in stream suggestion about how the Bolsheviks were anti-racist. I imagine they were. Anti-racism is a line that has been used. Let me go to stream suggestions. Twiga Point said he posted it. Here we go. Despite its complicated past, Soviet anti-racism was ahead of the historical curve. This is in June 17th, 2020. We're now, we're now taking a segue. We're now taking a segue here, chat. Maybe a little at the beginning, but they are just quickly Hitler to the group in question. Save the cat, thank you for the five pounds. Carolyn Borison can be found on YouTube and Twitter. She's also the author of the book Actively Unwoke. I'm going to be real with you. I'm probably not going to remember her name from Super Chats, especially how to spell it, because her name is spelled really fucking weird. <laughs> so it'd have to be there'd have to be a link to something in like stream suggestions that I can that I can look at later. Successes, failures and mistakes can still serve as a crucial basis for historical reflection and political action. The reactions from Russia to the uprisings in the United States against George Floyd's murder are both maddening and saddening. What? Maddening because many Russian pundits are using the protest as an opportunity to spout the vilest racism and display a shameful disregard for its noxiousness. The rhetoric reflects a perverse complex where any expression of solidarity within with the racially oppressed smells a hint to Soviet. The rhetoric reflects a perverse complex where any expression of solidarity with the racially oppressed smells a hint to Soviet. So they're saying that people in Russia are noticing the tactics being used in the United States and that's a problem? <laughs> We're about to read history from a completely unbiased source, aren't we? This also seems to have literally nothing to do with what I was asking for, but let's, let's read. The knee-jerk reaction to the whiff of Soviet is also saddening because it's a disavowal of history and a missed opportunity to recall a past when the Soviet Union was on the right side of it. For much of the 20th century, the Soviet Union stood in solidarity with people of color and anti-racism was a quality of a good Soviet citizen. Fucking proof. Where, where, proof, where? Can you show me the source? Can you show me the source? People of color the world over saw in the Soviet experiment proof that a world devoid of racism was possible. More potent for many black Americans who visited and lived in the USSR, Soviet anti-racism provided a rare cathartic experience that briefly muted the historical trauma echoing off their black skin. What the fuck are they talking about? What the actual fuck are they talking about? I have quite literally no idea what they're talking about here. That sounds kind of racist of this article. What I'm trying to find out is did the communists in Russia use the exact same racial tactics we are seeing in the United States now? Not a single person has provided me a source while saying that I am wrong and that Russia did. This history has much to teach us. The fight for racial justice in the United States today, as it was decades ago, is a chance to renew the internationalism and the promise of a better world. That's another word for globalism. A promise in which the USSR played an inspirational role. It also provides a memory for Russian citizens seeking justice, civil rights, and dignity in their own country to fight racism within. Show solidarity, get on board, link up, and be a part of an international... <coughs> help movement against oppression the soviet experiment captured many african americans did you just link a wikipedia article in my chat as a source you fucking retard <laughs> Black radicals were quickly attracted to Bolsheviks' embrace of anti-imperialism and national liberation. Cyril Briggs, the founder of the black radical journal The Crusader and the secretive African Blood Brotherhood, recalled his interest in communism, was inspired by the national policy of the Russian Bolsheviks and the anti-imperialist orientation of the Soviet state. Yes, Bolsheviks had an anti-racist purview, 
but where where did they divide people in the same way that they used feminism as a tool where is that where is that the historical context is important at the turn of the century millions of blacks fled to the american south to escape racist terrorism only to find the north had little solace the militancy of briggs and his peers was a direct response to the mass racial violence against blacks i don't like saying this i'm gonna be honest when i when i read these articles and i have to just be like blacks it makes me feel weird to say it like that because it like that just it feels dehumanizing to me but it, uh, who am i to criticize these paragons of virtue as it were in the summer of 1919 and the murderous destruction of tulsa oklahoma's black community in 1921 was Tulsa the, the syphilis experiments from the CIA? Was that what Tulsa was? I can never remember, like, names of shit. No, it wasn't- it wasn't the syphilis one? What, someone said yes. Okay. <laughs> Tulsa's very different. It was a riot, okay. Tusk Tuskegee was the experiments, okay. Tus Tusk- they both begin with T! That's where the confusion comes, thank you, chat. It was a massacre of a black business center? Oh. And the Soviets massacred Mongols? Was that in the interest of communism? Or were they massacring Mongols for a different reason? Also, typically when you massacre a race of people, that doesn't help you indoctrinate your population. That's, uh, that is, again, not answering what I asked. Black Wall Street, you think it was called? <laughs> Kason, both start with a K? Where's my tail plug? What? They had that ideal, but they didn't use it in Russia because there were no black people in Russia. I mean, they're not they're not just using black people in America to sow racial division. They're they're using everyone. There were pro po pogroms. The term originated from Russia to describe attacks mainly against Jews in the Russian Empire. Po pogroms? So I don't I'm just I'm gonna skim really quick here because I I don't think the Bolsheviks, too, were sympathetic to the plight of African Americans and provided an institutional platform for anti-racism. There weren't, there weren't really black people in the USSR, so it's not like they could cause the kind of damage that is being done in the United States right now. Even if they held that platform, even if they held that platform, it's not something they could do to the USSR. You respect the hell out of the fact that I'll accept if I'm wrong, granted chat will just throw shit at the wall and say they're right? I, it's like, if I'm wrong, I'd rather have the knowledge than not, right? But it's like, this doesn't, this doesn't sound like anything other than the Bolsheviks would have agreed with us, and that's why we agree with them, and that's why we're doing what we're doing in current year, and why we have an interest in communism. And it's like, well, yes, that's a problem, but much like feminists were useful idiots in the USSR, I don't see them having an equivalent of Black Lives Matter. I don't, I don't see any equivalency of that in the USSR for transforming the landscape into a communist place. DRT, thank you for the five. You're at work, but tonight you'll give me stuff for the ethnic pushes before the Great Patriotic War. Ethnic tensions were used, not race as we know it. That would, that would make a bit more sense. That would make a bit more sense. Ah, uh, no. Winter's Nick, thank you for the member as well. Tulsa was never called the Black Wall Street. That's postmodern bullshit and was made up by the Black Panthers, no cap, to revitalize the image of Black communities and tragedies throughout history. I remember reading an article about the Black Wall Street, but I can't remember what the article was. It was like, it was like ages ago. Soviet Union was opposed to the US, so they supported whatever weakened America, AKA civil rights sent fox titties to my dms why we're not talking about fox titties nim why would you try to derail an actual discussion about things that have happened with like random tits what are you doing bad mod down amazing how bolsheviks were genocidal and threw people into camps but don't get as much hate as the funny mustache man that's because communism good nazism bad don't pay attention to how they're similar i don't know the closest thing they had were Jewish people? If somebody somebody posted a, a link. Hold on. I didn't copy it. Where is it? Here it is. Somebody somebody posted a link. And I got I gotta be careful when you guys link me things about the Jews as well. 
lest I accidentally open up some weird article where you're talking about all all Jewish people like weird sex cults, uh, and then I get in trouble for it. <laughs> Surprised you haven't gotten sidetracked? Why would I do that? Teeter on Bemporod, the legacy of blood, Jews, pogroms, and ritual murder in the lands of the Soviets. Absorbing and meticulously research and argued study of the continuities and discontinuities of anti-Semitic ideas and actions in the Soviet Russia and later USSR. The book explores the nexus between Bolshevik and later Soviet protection of Jews against pogroms and anti-Semitism. The rise of one of the most pernicious and still active myths of Judeo-Bolshevism, a myth that was exploited by opponents of the Bolshevik Revolution, the Nazis, and now right-wing nationalist group in states of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc, such as Poland and Hungary, woven into the story Bemporod tells as the motif of blood accusations, a centuries-old lie that Jews killed Christians for their blood. This motif tracks closely to the cultural and political changes in Soviet history. The book shows methodically how anti-Semitism with all its accoutrements, as well as anti-anti-Semitism, became useful tools in Soviet hands. Um, so I've never heard of the centuries-old lie that Jews specifically killed Christians to drink their blood. What, what are they, fucking vampires? What am I reading? <laughs> The blood thing is actually true. Ah! <laughs> it isn't a lie. Ah, you know. Blood libel. You know. <laughs> if I search this in Google and fucking Stormfront comes up, I swear to God, chat. All right, okay. Blood libel in the Holocaust Encyclopedia, false allegations. George Washington University, blood libel, the Jewish blood drinking ritual. Uh, false allegations, all right. Resolve a DOI, God's blood, medieval Jews and Christians debate the body. Uh, I feel like this is a religious thing. This isn't to do with what I search for. Uh, Anti-defamation, okay, well, you know. Chat, I feel like you're trying to get me to talk about things that would get me unpersoned and possibly shot. Also, this has nothing to do with what I asked for either. In regards to Russia, what are you even linking me? Mikey, thank you for the $20. America's unique in the fact that we are a melting pot. Other countries have only been following suit in the last 75 to 100 years. We've, we're still unique that anyone can be American versus what it meant in other country. Yes. Which is, which is why what we see here in the United States being divided both with feminism and on racial lines has not happened in other countries. There are other ethnicities in other countries in some cases, like in Russia where you guys are pointing out that there are Asians and Mongols and whatnot. They didn't try to pit these people against one another in the same manner that feminism was used as a tool to divide men and women. Telling me that they suck the blood from the penis. Yeah, I have a, uh, you know. <laughs> Shut it down. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little weird. The things that I have been linked that are not in relation to anything I have been saying. You believe this? Like you believe Abraham Lincoln was a vampire hunter? Blood libel is why when people get weirded out about billionaires doing things like getting new organs or blood transfusions from young people in order to stay alive and the political news establishment immediately responds with you're just anti-semitic and point to blood libel as a rationalization this man's this man's highlighted his message and typed cheer 500 but didn't actually cheer 500 what the heck <laughs> The USSR did pit ethnicities against each other, but it was mostly for regional. Take this little bit about control. I'm taking it. I'm taking it. The saddest part about chat being dumb is that they're not even being funny dumb. Yeah, yeah, it's not even funny dumb. It's just like, what is happening? Ethnic politics and ethnic conflict in the USSR and the post-Soviet states. 
the successor state to the multinational Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, was formed officially in 1924 as a federation of national republics, with the ostensibly equal rights and broad provisions of autonomy for numerous ethnic groups. Ethnic relations were under the strict management of the Communist Party. Aha, see, this is what I would be looking for. Where is, uh, where's my browser? What the fuck did that autocorrect do? I don't know, man. Which suppressed inter-ethnic conflicts and allowed some national cultural development. On the other hand, the regime itself visited violence on many ethnic groups and increasingly promoted a policy of russification. The administration of the Soviet Union on the basis of ethnically defined republics and autonomous units, however, was a significant factor in the maintenance of national awareness. The administration of the Soviet Union on the basis of ethnically defined republics and autonomous units was a factor in maintenance of national awareness. Are they are they saying that like from what I can find, the ethnic, ethnic groups played a very minor were stayed segregated? Regional. You are correct. They primarily used the feminist movement to destabilize, as well as the obvious class divisions, especially against kulaks. Yes. Yes, this is what this is what I've been saying the whole time, which is why it's like if there was proof that they were doing the things that are happening in the United States, I've never heard of it. I've never seen it. If there's evidence of it, show me the evidence. And this is this is even not quite the same thing if they're saying these groups should stay segregated in order to participate in their cultural things. Mostly you were allowed to more properly integrate into the Soviet system, the more russified you were. Class and races were more related back in the day. A, a little, a little bit, yeah. The reforms began under Mikhail Gorbachev. Tear down that wall. Since 1985, loosened constraints on national expression. As a result, many nationalities experienced mass mobilization to press their ethnic concerns. So this is say this is saying in 1985 is when the ethnicities started mobilizing. And I can, I can very much believe that. Because if the United States was experiencing the racial tension shit as early as the 1960s, as, as far as the communism having permeated in the education industry already previous to that, and then it was the 70s in the United States where feminism started making the gains that they wanted to see in the same vein of the ideology that happened in Russia. Revolver Ocelot. Tear down that wall ASMR jump scare. Well, they didn't start. The censorship just got lifted a bit. If they're being censored by the communist government, then the communists weren't the ones who were using them to sow division. So I don't, I don't really understand what the point you're trying to make with that is. You don't know a particular source, but you've been told that part of the reason some Central Asian countries have such fucky borders my gotcha. is that the, the Soviets Gaga intentionally Gaga set Gaga them up that way to create racial tensions and keep them under control, divide, and rule style. When you, when you, oh man, when you say Asian, I think of like actual Asian countries, and I know, I know Russia's partially, I know Russia's in Asia, and I know there are other Asian countries that are like Kazakhstan spicy or whatever, but I don't think of, I don't think of them as Asian. Raid. So it, it feels weird to try and like wrestle with that in my brain and like think of the actual geography. <laughs> oh god. Intentionally set them up that way to create racial tensions and keep them under control. I have zero idea how the Eastern Bloc countries got their borders defined after the dissolution of the USSR. That is that is something I am wholly ignorant to. American brain strikes again, right? It's it's just like you you get used to looking at a map and thinking of different regions in one way, and then like when the UK comes out and they're like, oh yeah, those Asians perpetrating all those rapes. You're like, wait a minute, those aren't Asians. They live in Asia, but they're they're not Asians. <laughs> Stalin signed off on orders to deport and exile. I'm not going to finish reading that because you're typing a whole lot of shit without any kind of source. This is Wikipedia. I'm ignoring it. 
Soviet essentially laid down the bomb. I don't see a link. Fuck it. It was my understanding that all of this was so difficult to find any sources on. It was between the Iron Curtain and the complete mess that the dissolution of the USSR was. Who even knows? Yeah, you're right. We actually have no information on the USSR's tactics. We, we actually, this is all just conspiracy theory. We know nothing about how the communists operated and how espionage worked and how they infiltrated populations. You're correct, actually. You're proud of me for not calling it geology. Fuck you. <laughs> it's literally the same borders as they were before the occupation to the USSR. If it's the same borders, then what was that other person fucking talking about with how Russia divided them? All of what we know is from the later half of the USSR? Yes. I mean, there's a, a bunch we probably don't know, but a lot has come out. KGB archives were opened a lot, you think, after the USSR crashed? I don't think we'll ever get everything. I think it's impossible. I think it's impossible to get everything. But again, we know what the makeup of Russia was. We could see what their tactics were. They didn't have anything like what is going on in the United States, dividing people racially. I'm willing to take the L. If there, if there is evidence of it, but so far all I see is a whole bunch of nonsense from Wikipedia and people trying to blame Jews again, which has nothing to do with dividing on racial lines. We can get everything if War Thunder adds the archive. True, true. If somebody from War Thunder could get on that, actually. <laughs> Are we talking about how Marxists use racial tensions in the USA stretching all the way back to the 1920s? No. No, people in chat were saying that Marxists use racial tensions in the USSR, like they do in the USA. And I'm saying they didn't do it in the USSR because the USA has a unique racial makeup that doesn't exist anywhere else. Which is why instead of just using feminism like they did in the USSR, they were also using racial tensions in the US to spread the ideology. Soviet racism was a side effect of their tactics, not the goal. Same thing happened in China. True. True. But they are interconnected because Theodore Hess, the... What? Posted a link in stream suggestions about how the Bolsheviks were made up of ethnic minorities and the commies stoked racial tension. It's a long read, but it has some graphs. How, how long is a long read? It was Dr. Faust. Basically, to sum it up, chat thinks ethnic discrimination is the same as racism. Is that what's going on here? Is that is that what's going on here? Where I'm where I'm saying like racial shit and they're talking about It's a university text. Yes? Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, alright. Okay, alright. Ethnicity and race are not the same. Yes, true. Yes, true. So I'm I am talking about racial tensions, and then Chad is just linking me a bunch of stuff about the ethnicities in Russia. Damn it, Chad, stop being stupid. Okay, well, we're done we're done with this little segue then. Uh, we'll probably have to cut this part out when I draw all the bridge nonsense, but we're going back to the point of today. You really do appreciate my level of patience. You didn't think you would have kept your composure, but you're also retarded. <laughs> It doesn't help that half of chat is talking about two different things. Part of chat are talking about the Jews, and the other is about how the USSR created ethnic sub subnations and pushed the population around to control them. It is nothing like born. Oh, I think your text got cut off, Skewky. But yes, true. <laughs> Silly American thinking that race is only about black people. That's not what we said! That's not what we said! <laughs> Poor ESL, sir. You can't talk about European nonsense without a sprinkle of ESL. True. <laughs> True. I think the chat was trying to say is they used the same tactics, but on ethnic lines rather than the racial lines to achieve the same things in Eastern Europe. Yes. But they weren't doing the same thing as they were in the United States, which was my whole point. That was my whole point. They couldn't do the same thing that they were doing with racial lines in the United States because that didn't exist literally anywhere else. 
Tag, thank you for the five dollars. Catholics and Christians drink a Jewish guy's blood every Sunday. <laughs> Not the other way around. But sure, Jewish vampires. I mean, if Jewish vampires exist, I'm ready for my immortality. Come, please, come. <laughs> You're making chocolate chip cookies while listening to the smooth brains of chat. God damn. Back, back to what I was talking about with Bridge. Moving, moving right back along. Thinking all white people are the same is a very American idea. Literally nobody said that. Liter literally nobody said that. Please come. <laughs> Please come. Race and ethnic depends on who you ask if they're different or the same these days. Julian J. Walker, the associate director, weaves his experience as an author and silver screen actor known for his performances in Blackbird, Saints and Sinners, and Being Mary Jane. I have not heard of a single one of these movies. I'm not- I've not heard of a single one of these. J. Walker! Holy moly, what a chat you've got on your hands! <laughs> Wait, Boingo Bingo Bango Bongo, what happened to your main Twitch account, Bingo Bangos? Holy moly. Holy moly. You get to live forever. What is it? What is a giffiti fish? You, you think you've seen Blackbird? He binged too bong! Into the fabric of Glad's advocacy work, bringing a unique perspective on narrative construction and community engagement. Covered by NBC News as one of the best black queer books to read, A Year Without You. Walker's advocacy also extends through his work as deputy director with MOBI. Originally from Jackson, Mississippi, his passion for shaping narratives that center LGBTQ people of color continue garnering national recognition. Chat on Russian vodka. <laughs> Mikey, thank you for the five. You're really hoping to hear the angry Bostonian accent tonight? I mean, I'm not going to get angry, right? Because, like, I could have been wrong. I could have been if chat understood what I was saying. <laughs> hey. Kayla Thompson, an associate with a rich literary background, graduated magna cum laude from NYU. Her prowess in writing and deep commitment to social justice coveraging in her work at GLAAD, where she amplifies young and marginalized voices that are shaping a more equitable future. Named an Outfest Inclusive Press Initiative Fellow in 2023, Thompson exemplifies the next generation of advocates and writers that are shifting the social ecology on diverse representation. Blingo Bingo is not Bingo Bango! Ain't no way! Ain't no way! The RT is king, thank you for the two dollars. You're talking about the stands. Homestead is talking about the stands. Andrew, they give the 2450. DIDU is corporate overreach mixed with communism laced with greedy monetary practices. Also a form of projection of the insecurities of these commie planks. I would I would be willing to bet that the greedy monetary practices were part of it in the beginning, right? Because when you think you're pandering to a large consumer base and they're going to buy more of your products because you appear to care about the things that they are claiming they care about, you think you're going to make more money off of it. But it's hard to be a greedy monetary practice when you are doing nothing but losing money by doing these things. And even though you're losing millions of dollars, you continue doing the same thing. And typically, when you do the same thing and it keeps failing, that is the definition of insanity. Because you need to change and figure out what works. These people are not. And that's because it's not about the money at this point in time. It was a Trojan horse. Commies are ironically very greedy despite hating capitalism. Yes. That's why we see every time that people who espouse socialist policy and who are for communist ideology, as soon as they start becoming part of the class that they had railed against, they change. They shift the goalposts. They're like, well, not me. I'm not rich enough to be part of the problem. When you have a hammer and a sickle, everything looks like capitalism. The money men got kicked out years ago. Have I never heard of short-term loss, long-term profit? That is quite literally what I am talking about. 
That is, that is quite literally what I have been saying since the beginning of even the sweet baby talk back in last year. Where it's like they are forgoing the short-term profits. They're making no money right now because the long-term profit isn't going to be monetary. It's going to be ideology and then the money will come back after that. Profit is money. This man's not paying attention. Bernie Sanders, those millionaires must pay, become millionaires. Those billionaires must pay. I like seeing the people that are just like, as soon as you make $999 million, every single penny after that should go into social programs. There should be no more billionaires. They're burning money like nothing else to spew the propaganda. True. <gasps> Eat the rich. Nice, my golden bust of Karl Marx is here. Tymia Ballard, the junior associate, is a multifaceted advocate whose work is merging the spheres of activism and creativity, offering new vistas for black queer expression and empowerment. With a background in political science, human rights, and African-American studies, her journey is marked by a dedication to serving marginalized communities while cultivating safe spaces that draw on activism as a tool for transformation. I just... So Hassan, yes. <laughs> Combined, this team's collective experiences lend depth and authenticity to GLAD's core mission. Their leadership and roles in EMEI aren't solely about launching programs, <laughs> help, but about igniting a broader cultural shift towards an inclusive media landscape where every voice is heard and every story is honored, including those of the individuals behind the movement. In a world where the leadership in nonprofit organizations seldom reflects the most vulnerable demographics they serve. This is a this is a very weird way <laughs> to say that nonprofit leadership is overwhelmingly <laughs> only one type of person doing it. Hello, sharpest snooper. Zetsubo Sensei, thank you for the 10. You have nothing interesting to say. You loved the Gundam collab, though. It was a hell of a lot of fun. I hope I hope to do something with uh, Papa Gundam again after my vacation. The work of GLAD's Communities of Color and Media Department is a testament of GLAD's commitment to embodying the same principles of equity and representation that it champions in its public-facing advocacy. In order to effectively serve the disproportionately marginalized within an already underrepresented community, one must understand its heartbeat, struggles, and aspirations through a shared lens. Therefore, it would only make sense that resources earmarked for black, queer, and trans advocacy work, tra advocacy work be managed by those with similar lived experiences. Applying GLAD's application of this framework is already paying off in such a short time. Financially backed by Gilead Sciences, which is a very weird thing to be backed by, considering this is an entertainment industry thing, EMEI was designed as a year-long program making an impactful stride towards elevating black queer storytelling across various media disciplines. In its first year, the initiative focused on nurturing a cohort of 10 short film, short form filmmakers providing each member with $10,000 to support their creative endeavors, signifying a tangible investment in the future of black LGBTQ storytelling. This trailblazing group included talented individuals like Alexander Lex King, known for Querious, and Brandon Nichols, a passionate advocate for underserved communities through photography and filmmaking. EMEI isn't solely about financial assistance, it's an opportunity for creatives within the cohort to develop stronger networks, gain access to industry leaders, and receive guidance from an advisory board of black LGBTQ plus professionals. And it lists all the professionals on the board, but going back here, why is an entertainment program, why is an entertainment program being funded by Gilead Sciences? And like Binary Mind said in the chat, uh, Gilead Sciences is most known for its significant contributions to the field of antiviral medications, particularly in the treatment of HIV and AIDS, liver diseases like hepatitis B and C, and more recently, its involvement in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. And I wanted to, I wanted to scootaloot over here just in case people somehow don't know what GLAD is. 
GLAD announces an inaugural class for new equity in media and entertainment initiative. Ten black LGBTQ plus creatives have been named as part of the three-year program, which offers each a $10,000 grant and aims to increase their access to Hollywood's professional networks, resources, insider knowledge, and funding. So this is the GLAD program, EMEI, that is funded by Gilead, according to the article that we just read. This just has more people led by Deshaun Usher, which is what we were reading about. While we know we are not at a deficit of black LGBTQ plus storytellers, creatives, and content producers, we still do not have the same equity or access in telling our own stories in entertainment and media. We're excited to launch EMEI during a time that is pivotal in telling black queer stories that are fully supported financially, creatively, and professionally. This year's cohort of visionaries and advisors are the pinnacle of what black LGBTQ plus creatives can do when we join together to amplify our work. And then it just goes into the advisory board as we were reading about previously. And then Gilead's website. Gilead's website. Again, a, a science program here. It says new era. This is their landing page. Like the first page you see when you go to their website. New era marked by innovation, growth, and impact. We're focused on innovation, continued growth, and making a great, even greater impact as we advance our leading HIV prevention and treatment portfolio and accelerate cutting-edge treatments for cancer. They have scientific innovation, access, and health equity. We're partnering with communities around the world to remove societal barriers to care, improve health equity, and make our medicines available to those who need them most. Our people and culture, we've been taking on the world's biggest health challenges, for more than 35 years, we continue to set and achieve ambitious goals. And at the top, if you click on our purpose, they have partnerships and community, corporate giving, the Gilead Foundation, inclusion, inclusion and diversity, environmental, social and governance, sustainability, advancing global health, health equity, and medication access. So if we start at inclusion and diversity. Inclusion and diversity is key to our success. Building an inclusive and diverse workforce is critical to enabling Gilead's mission and ultimately will help us create a better, healthier world. We're highly committed to creating an inclusive culture, one that enables all people to do their best work, and that's reflective of the diversity of our patients. At the same time, we recognize that we need to do more to accelerate our progress for our people and for our business and for the world. So they're already they're already doing the, they're already Hello? doing the typical DEI initiatives, but they gotta do more. They gotta do more. They're not actually doing the work. Gilead's over inclusion and diversity aspirations are be the employer of choice, foster inclusive culture, and be respected for equitable and socially responsible practices. Working to demonstrate our commitment to inclusion requires us to encourage and support each other, recognize and mitigate unconscious bias. Hello, I love thought crimes. Consider multiple pathways to success. Respect people of all backgrounds and experiences. Seek diverse perspectives to drive innovation. They have multi-year diverse representation goals, uh, internal and external talent pipelines, focusing on people managers, building awareness, capabilities, and accountability. Gilead is a pay-for-performance company committed to pay equity. Our employees' salaries are based on market-based ranges and are assessed annually in consideration of prior year performance and competitive positioning. All compensation decisions are made without regard to gender, race, color, national, or ethnic origin, age, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, genetic information, religion, or veteran status. In the U.S., we conduct an annual review of employee compensation to ensure that our pay practices are race and gender neutral. We also commission an annual global pay equity study to gain a more comprehensive view of pay equity across the organization. In 2023, Gilead's salary ratio for women to men globally was 99.93 to 100. That's just called a meritocracy, which is supposedly evil and capitalist. Well, what I'm wondering, right... Is if they're saying that their pay scale is based on meritocracy and not on any of the other stuff that when we talk about equity is typically based on. And then it says the salary ratio for women to men globally is 99.93 to 100. How did they manage to get that average of all the different people working in their organization? 
I guess, is what I am confused about, right? Because I, I can imagine that there are people in their organization that are, like, more low-level worker than high-level worker, that have more experience, that have longer time in in the corporate field. How the hell does that work? Yeah, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. Creative accounting. Gilead, this is the name of the fucking communist compound site in Handmaid's Tale. Sorry, random thought. Yeah, Gilead is the name of the uh, the communist compound in Handmaid's Tale. And we're going to talk about Omicron, which is a, an advertising company involved in all of this. And Omicron sounds like Omnicron, which is the communist overreach in uh, fucking Soma. <laughs> so it's like, this is, is kind of, you know, it's funny. Didn't Google do that? And it turned out they were actually paying the women more. Ah, uh, yeah, we we had that Google report. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like only fans. They commission the survey so they don't make the analysis. That's like uh, one of the analysis things that I'll hopefully get to the tab of is that is them talking about how they interviewed like I think it's two thousand six hundred people to get the idea that Gen Z and younger people are more concerned with DEI than ever before. And it's like, well, if you're going to interview only 2600 people and they're all the demographics that would benefit from dei practices uh yeah yeah i think they would say that they like that <laughs> isn't it also the manifestation of evil and transformers lore uh maybe i don't know transformers lore soon i won't be able to buy oranges without a funny coupon i don't want the orange coupon they have uh, employee demographics. We know that innovation thrives when we're informed by a diverse set of backgrounds, perspectives, and experiences. Our commitment to equal employment opportunity and affirmative action furthers our purpose to cultivate and celebrate an equitable culture of belonging. And uh, Gilead hey US... Guys, smash that like button, leave a comment, push me in the algorithm. Gilead US gender and ethnicity. There's 53% females in 2023, 47% male. As you can see, it's been climbing up ever so ever so slowly. It was 51.9% females in 2021. And then uh, 2023 racial statistics, they're 38.1% Asian, 37.7% white, 12.8% uh, Hispanic and Latino, 7.7% black, and 3.7% other. I'm in the my Ackerman! Thank you for the 10 gift subs! Thank you! Thank you! I'm in the my Ackerman! How have, you, how have you been, dude? Hidden, they give the $4.99. It's within pay brackets, you bet. Anyway, can we shave the Corsha? No! Do not shave the Corsha like a chinchilla! Gilead Employee Resource Groups. ERGs are an integral part of our inclusion and diversity program and are open to all of our employees around the world, regardless of background. ERGs foster a sense of belonging and inclusion that can provide support, spark innovation, and accelerate employee development. More than 8,900 employees, nearly 50% of our workforce, belong to at least six of one of, or belong to one, I'm sorry, blah, 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 belong to at least one of our six ERGs, demonstrating the impact and important role of these groups at Gilead. Each ERG is resourced to drive actions across five pillars. Recruiting, professional development, culture, business impact, and community. Progressive policies. They're embracing the workforce, global gender identity, and transition policy. Formalizes our core values and practices in a way that encourages employees to express their true gender identity. Supports those who transition and aims to foster an affirming workplace for our transgender and gender non-binary colleagues. And it, it goes on a little bit, but a little bit more like that. A little bit, a little bit more like best places to work, best employers for diversity. Let me just make sure I'm not forgetting to open one other thing here. I accidentally opened the porn channel. <laughs> That's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted. I have to, I have to keep hella focused. I have to keep hella focused here because there's so many things that I am opening and looking at here. Uh, we have. Gilead's ESG PDF here. We have Gilead's PDF. And his name is John Cena! Hello, John Cena. Please don't cut off your boopus. Porn will kegel maxing. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Um. 
this is their report here. All right, so in their report, um, it says, we continue to extend our leadership in virology by advancing our HIV portfolio with the goal of ending the HIV epidemic. Our virology expertise is also playing a role in developing treatments for COVID-19 and other emerging viruses. We remain focused on advancing person-centered science and actionable education programs that make a difference for people and communities affected by viral diseases. I'm a, li I'm a little confused as, as to how they're like trying to correlate COVID and HIV. Like, I, I guess I get that they're both viruses, but like, I don't think there's a stigma for people who have covid like there is with uh hiv like if you're if you're someone born with hiv like if it's not your fault you didn't do anything to obtain that but like i feel the stigma is very much warranted in adults who are promiscuous douglas kaplan thank you for the 49.99 you asked if i was okay earlier some days yes but i think you do a good job for the fans, and you would want to give money to someone working and helping others. Actually kind of hate yourself a lot, always questioning everything, but not donating here. Well, you should question things, but I don't think you should hate yourself. If there is if there is something that you've done, or some way that you think that you don't like, figure out how to pinpoint that, and how, how to sort of start changing, right? Change doesn't happen overnight, it's slow. But if there's something you don't like about yourself, Pinpoint and figure out how to fix it. Figure out how to fix it. Uh, change is scary, but if you wanna, if you wanna hate yourself a little less, I say you gotta start somewhere. You know, you gotta start somewhere. And I don't want, I don't want you to hate yourself. That's a bad, bad black pit mentality. You're gonna, you're gonna just feel bad all the time, and I don't want that. I want you to feel good. I want you to feel good and be happy. Remember reading a lot of stories about African Americans less likely to take the poke and being more likely to die from the coof. Not th sure if those were accurate. I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure if those are accurate either. I know, I know that there was a lot of push for uh, equity taking the COVID shots, where they were prioritizing like minority communities for getting them, and it's just like. That seems kind of weird to me, considering the US government has a history of trying to do medical tests on minority communities that they don't have tons of information on. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say it was a little weird here that they would do that. The Tuskegee 2 electric boogaloo, yeah. Malcolm Liang, some jabs did give HIT positivity. Google UQ SARS CoV 2 trial. Participants are still positive after three years. You have paperwork. What the fuck? You're, tell you're telling me that some of the COVID vaccines gave people HIV. I did not hear about that. If true, what the fuck? Makes you wonder why they'd want to give the shot to certain groups. It makes you, it makes you wonder why they were prioritizing specific groups, right? Because like, it's hard to tell which kind of way they were going with how murky things are trying to be in current year. So it's like, were they prioritizing the minority groups because they thought it was in the efforts of diversity, equity, and inclusion to make it look like they're prioritizing them to be good people? Or is it the typical government just going to use these groups of people to experiment on because they're easily exploited? And it's like, it could go either way, and either way, it's bad. <laughs> no smart black person trusts the same glowy fuck eaters who allowed the Tuskegee shit? I mean, yeah. Yes and true. It's not real stuff, but you will test po- Okay, so like, if you got- if you got the COVID vaccine, you'll test positive for HIV, but you won't actually have HIV? Is what- is what you're saying? You knew it would go wrong, so you put- trying to get a lawsuit in i'm a little confused i'm a little confused it's also the group where it's more likely to spread over here they did something like that with the covid jabs prioritizing poor communities but they were mostly rural and thus places that had the lowest rates of infection we're all lab rats well i mean yeah that's why i didn't want to get it i didn't want to get the shot i was like this uh this doesn't have a lot of uh trial and error behind it it's too fast and they're pushing it a little too hard for me to be uh happy with 
Imagine having fake AIDS. That's only for the UQ SARS-CoV-2. Not sure about the other jabs. I, I have literally never heard that. I don't even remember a single person talking about the HIV thing in, uh, in the media. Did I get it? No, of course not. I'm a pureblood. The head of British science was talking about how the vax lowered killer T-cell counts. You don't have the shot? You're pure-blooded. You got denied from blood donating when you had all the clot shots? What the hell? Goodbye, Fred! Goodbye, Peekle! <laughs> Goodbye, Peekle! The shot was an IRL early access game in your system, except the bugs kill you. Like, part of me wants to look it up, but I can't keep getting distracted from talking about Bridge today. Uh, I'm, I'm interested, but also chat had a room temp IQ moment already today. <laughs> Bye! By Pico, the juice must flow. Ah, uh, no. We're also discovering, identifying, and evaluating potential treatments for inflammatory diseases that impact millions of people around the globe. To succeed in creating a healthier world for everyone, we prioritize not only the patients, but the people who do the work. We are dedicated to evolving our culture, advancing inclusion and diversity. Why is, uh, why is inclusion and diversity capitalized? and increasing employee engagement to help us realize or help us i just read that as us i'm already melting chat my focus it's broken <laughs> engagement to help us realize our ambition of becoming a biotech employer of choice we believe the impossible gives us room to explore and the innovation we're driving through bold and transformative science has the potential to produce life-changing medicines for generations to come capitalized because it's their god that's so weird and also in here we have let's see treating covid19 i put an m in there treating covid in October 2020, just months after the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, Gilead's Veclery Remdesivir became the first and only FDA-approved treatment for hospitalized COVID-19 patients in the U.S. And in 2022, the FDA approved Veclery for pediatric patients under the age of 12 and as young as 28 days old. These remain a significant need to develop convenient, new, and effective oral treatment options for people with COVID-19. We are advancing Obeldesivir, previously known as GS5245, an invest no, investigational no, 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 oral no, no, no. antiviral for the treatment of COVID-19 to give patients new treatment options that can be accessed outside of the hospital. The clinical program for Obeldesivir has been expedited directly to the phase three study design examining Obeldesivir based on phase one results and the current unmet patient need. The phase three study design will examine Obeldesivir in a single tablet, twice daily oral dosing for five days. Um, I don't, I don't know the phasing process for new drugs, right? But like, why did they advance it from phase one directly to phase three, skipping whatever phase two would be? Oh, remdesivir, you remember that? The drug that failed as a cancer drug three times on toxicity. I've never heard of it. Never heard of that. I, Ari, Ari, huh? thank you for the five gift subs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Because they don't care if it's safe. I mean, I guess fucking so. I guess fucking so. And it says that it is, can I look for Compass? Aha, uh -huh. the Compass Initiative. Gee, Sally, your boyfriend lets you have two comms? That is not the Compass Initiative. Addressing HIV in the Southern US, Ma Atlanta. <laughs> The HIV epidemic in the U.S. has had a devastating impact in the South, which, according to HIV.gov, accounted for 51% of all new HIV diagnoses in 2020. How the fuck do you have more AIDS than California? Many people living in the region also face numerous social disparities such as poverty, lack of insurance, and lack of access to healthcare. That's me! But I'm white, so I don't matter. 
Gilead created the Compass Initiative as a commitment to partnership in addressing HIV and AIDS in southern states and committed more than a hundred million over 10 years to support organizations working to address the HIV and AIDS epidemic in the southern United States. Compass focuses on reducing HIV-related health disparities, combating stigma, improving access to and quality of resources to support well-being, mental health, substance use treatment, and trauma-informed care in the hardest-hit states, as well as working to increase local leadership and advocacy across the U.S. South. Now this might seem harsh to some people, but I believe everyone involved in this story should perish. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm a little callous, right? But I feel like if you have acquired HIV from sexual intercourse, you have then given up your ability to have sexual intercourse, right? Like maybe, maybe we should just start sterilizing these people instead right like just just geld them as it were <laughs> hopping off gonna hit the sleep schedule good luck i hope you have good sleep yeah hope you have good sleep the bug chaser bug chasers are absolutely the most degenerate people i have ever read about sterilizing doesn't really prevent anything though i'm talking about like more than just stopping them from having spermies, I'm talking like just just make them into Barbie dolls, right? Just like get rid of their ability to have sex entirely. I have HIV. I guess I'll just goon until I die. <laughs> Once you geld them, they'll become angry and spread their blood. Maybe, 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 Maybe the solution is something I can't talk about on Twitch. No, I'm John. Thank you for the 10. The HIV AIDS thing might be related to the migration of a lot of men of a specific leaning moving to Florida and Georgia to take advantage of the warm weather and international travel. See the monkeypox orgies. True. There were unfortunately monkeypox orgies in New York. And we actually read an article from a guy who was complaining about how he got monkeypox and then he couldn't have sex for a few weeks and how it was like the end of the world. And how, how it was discriminatory that he couldn't have sex after having gotten monkeypox at an orgy. And it's just like, have we really gotten to the point where degeneracy has run so fucking rampant that you can't even keep your fucking shit in your pants for weeks? Like, god damn, dude. Here's an idea. Let's all take the bug chasers, put them in a camp. Hear me out! <laughs> Why don't we just use them to test all the new medicines? It was a piss orgy too. True. Like, I just, I just do not understand this level of degeneracy. And I do not want to combat stigma for people with HIV. I don't think we should be combating that. If you're a hedonistic degenerate that got your neg hole paused, you should be stigmatized. If you were born with it, I'm sorry, you got a really bad luck in life. I'm, you're not the person I'm talking about. And if, if you got raped and your rapist gave you HIV, I feel like the only solution there is that you should be allowed to kill your rapist in any way possible, right? Like you, you not only were raped, you were given HIV. We're going to string up on a wall the person who did this to you and uh, leave you alone in the room with them for however long it takes you. This is, this is your justice. <laughs> You can effectively stop fetal transmission of HIV. I mean, maybe, but I just... People like to take me out of context, so I want to be absolutely clear that I'm not talking about the people who are born with it. Not in California, apparently you just get to find out. Yeah, in California, uh, they decriminalized knowingly giving someone HIV. In, in, I want to say every state, but I could be wrong. There could be other states who decriminalized it. In most states, it is, it is illegal to have sex with someone and give them HIV without telling them. You don't get HIV if you don't consent to it? I mean, no. Combating HIV stigma these days has an odd tendency to mean HIV patients shouldn't have to disclose their HIV because it might make people, might make people not consent to sex with them. I agree. That is exactly what it has become. 
it's it's the same it's the same logic that like when when they talk about uh like violence towards transgender people and then they don't talk about how many transgender people didn't disclose uh that they were hiding a penis under their dress and then went to have sex with someone who thought that they were a woman and then when they revealed penis the person flew into a rage because they were tricked they don't they don't they don't typically talk about those instances who the fuck wants to have sex with someone who has HIV, a bug chaser, or someone else who's HIV positive? But like, again, this is something I would want to know. If you want to campaign for your right to not have to disclose because there shouldn't be a stigma around it, I'm, I'm going to continuously get harsher and harsher until, until I start looking at aesthetic uniforms. HIV positive people should be cast in? I don't know what that means. The violence towards transgender people in the room with us right now. Antivirals have progressed to the point where HIV AIDS is not a death sentence. That doesn't fucking matter if it's not a death sentence. I don't want you to give it to me. I don't want to have HIV even if it's not a death sentence because it's not exactly a fun thing to live with. <laughs> like, what, what kind of argument is that? It's, it's not gonna kill you, so you should be okay with getting it. <laughs> You become dependent on big pharma. Poetic silence, they give you the five. Is that what you call it in the bedroom? Justice, I see you. What the heck? It just hurts a lot, makes your life terrible, and makes you terminally poor. Yeah, no big deal. No big deal. You don't want to be given HIV, let alone a fucking cold. I need more positive outlook. An HIV positive? I don't want an HIV positive outlook! Who's being taken out of context now? You're merely stating a fact. No need to read that much into it. All right. Well, I think you need to. I think you need to sit. I think you need to sit and think about why you're being a weirdo. <laughs> That's not taking you out of context. You literally said what these people said. You literally said that antivirals have progressed to the point where HIV and AIDS is not a death sentence. It doesn't matter that what you said is true. It is true. But that's one of the talking points these people use to say, Well, it shouldn't be stigmatized anymore because it's not going to kill you. It's not going to kill you, sir. In, in, your, in your words, since you think it's not a big deal. I think it's not a big deal. You're saying it's not a death sentence. I hope you get HIV. <laughs> Chat, why are we retarded? The wrist streams. Thank you for the 10. You just got banned from Twitch for jokes in chat. Have some cash. Wait, did you get banned from Twitch in my chat? What? I want to ask you what you said, but I also don't want you to get banned again. <laughs> herpes won't kill you either, but nobody wants herpes, right? If HIV isn't a big deal, why can't you donate blood if you have it? You can if you live in a... Uh... Can't remember if it's Australia or New Zealand. One of them set up the first HIV positive blood bank. I'm not gonna kill you, but it will make you completely dependent on the big pharma. <sighs> if Twitch doesn't care about context, you had a one week for something completely taken out of context. I mean, every time I say this, there's some weird little fucker in chat that tries to tries to be a ha ha funny. I'm telling you right now, don't fucking do it. All right, now that the preface is over. If you type that you are underage in chat, like if you make the I'm 12 and what is this kind of joke, Twitch will ban you because I am an 18 plus flagged channel because of the things I talk about. I will have to shoot you in my chat, but also Twitch will just shoot you. They do not care. We had someone recently in Discord who kept changing their age uh, first, first they, they were making a joke about, haha, I'm 15, and I was like, don't fucking do that. Discord doesn't ban you for it yet, but literally don't fucking do that. And then they were like, oh, I'm 18, oh, I'm 19, oh, I'm 21, I'm 22. It kept changing, like, every couple of days. They couldn't, they couldn't keep track of what their age was, and I was like, you know what? I'm not dealing with this. If I can't tell what your actual age is, I'm just gonna suspect that you're a minor, and I'm gonna ban you. Because I'm not, I'm not dealing with wondering if you are or are not. You have removed plausible deniability, and I'm just going to take you out back and shoot you. In reality, he was a fly and aged rapidly. 
You're going to be the butt doc- or going to the butt doctor next week. If life gave you butt cancer right after you finally started making money with your plants, you're gonna be mad! Go get your butt checked! You're happy that HIV is no longer a death sentence, but let's not fucking downplay how awful it is and how it shouldn't be spread. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You're actually the very concept of a ham sandwich? What the hell? Mikey, thank you for the five. Spreading any disease should be punishable in Minecraft. I agree. And the fact that people have started coming out, like, stabbing people with needles instead of knives and whatnot, trying to make people fear, or even possibly giving them some sort of, like, weird injection that could infect them with something? That's scary, dude! Like, as if I wasn't already terrified of outside! I don't want to get stabbed by some random crazy lad with a syringe full of, like, HIV blood, dude! Gunshot to the leg isn't a death sentence? That doesn't mean I want a lead injection in my calf! <sighs> Leprosy isn't a death sentence anymore, but you still wouldn't want to get it! Imagine. Imagine! You won't die if you have no appendages. It's like the Saw movie, but in real life. Should not be okay with spreading disease. We shouldn't be tempting mutations to make a lethal strain. Imagine. You're not alone, Douglas. Keep your head up. Thank you, Poetic Silence, for the two dollary doodles. That's, uh, that's crazy to me, though. 51% of all new HIV diagnoses are in the South. What the fuck? Starting, you remember being glad the days you had off working at a warehouse store where someone did that two decades ago? What the fuck? I mean, I guess maybe it's becoming more common? I didn't know that it happened as far back as then. Jesus Christ. Biological warfare is against the Geneva Convention, so anyone who attacks with needles should be prosecuted under it. True. <laughs> They're putting HIV in the water. The chemicals to turn us gay weren't enough. Now we need to be paused. E. Compass focuses on reducing HIV-related health disparities, combating stigma. I read- I finished reading this. I didn't remember I finished reading this, but I did. And then, uh, nom 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 nom. There is... another little Compass thing. Compass initiative taking on the HIV epidemic in the South. Gilead Compass, commitment to partnership in addressing HIV in southern states. 10-year, $100 million plus partnership with community-based organizations working to combat the HIV epidemic in the southern U.S. You can learn more by visiting Gilead Compass. Is this a short video? We've placed so much attention in the modern West on freedom, on individuality and autonomy. And in the process, we've actually diminished some of the great ethical teachings of our faith traditions as it relates to what we owe the other. That's what social justice is about. It's about living our lives in such a way, in our communities and structuring our society and world where we take care of the other. But and what does this have to do with we AIDS? We talk about our motto, pro humanitate, for humanity. So that our enterprise for educating is not just is it bad for to the be sake of learning. To a cartoon fox we are doing well? the work that we do here at Wake Forest for humanity. HIV and AIDS is a human problem, disproportionately <laughs> impacting the African American community. At Wake Forest University oh, School of Divinity, we believe that Black Lives Matter. Full stop. We know that uh, nearly half of new diagnoses for HIV occurs in the southern United States. I believe that communities of faith are central to helping change those narratives. Part of our excitement about connecting with the Gilead Compass Initiative is this recognition that in the South, you cannot effectively address HIV and AIDS without thinking about faith communities. Did they just say that a majority of people in the faith communities in the a majority of black people, sorry, in the faith communities in the South are on the down low. Is that is that what they just said? Am I am I understanding this correctly? <laughs> the down low dickin. I am I am incredibly confused. And also <laughs> Also, we read an article uh about black women talking about how they specifically 
are underrepresented in any kind of AIDS research. And they had a very valid point. It's because the majority of black women who get HIV get it from black men who lied to them about not having homosexual encounters. Maybe all these priests should stop fucking everyone then. Coppice Initiative understands that if we really want to curb the negative impact of HIV and AIDS in the southern region, that we have to take a... Stop having sex. Stop. <laughs> if you get an HIV diagnosis, why do you then believe that you are entitled to have sex with people who do not have HIV? Why, why is this something that you would like to obfuscate and hide? Multi-prong approach. We have to engage with LGBTQ activist organizations. We have to engage with communities of faith. We have to engage with other health organizations, people who are doing the heavy work of human services. We'll know we're making progress when we've eradicated the disease. We'll know we're making progress when transformative storytelling takes hold and faith communities are telling a new story and the disease is not stigmatized in the way that it is now. We will it's a, it's a good cause to want to eradicate HIV AIDS, to, ma to make sure that it is completely preventable in all cases. It should be stigmatized. If you, if you yeah, have had guy. sexual relations and you got yes, sir, HIV, it's time for your daily protein intake. I'm for, I'm, you should be stigmatized. Asterisk, caveat. If someone gave it to you without your knowledge, you should legally be allowed to kill them. That's, you know, <laughs> you should legally be allowed to kill them in that case. <laughs> I'm not saying bubble. Fuck you, YouTube. <laughs> if you destigmatize the disease, you cannot get rid of it. These statements are contradictory. They both they both want to get rid of it, but also be like, it's OK. It's not a death sentence anymore. It's fine if you get infected know that we are making progress when LGBTQ persons can live free and holy in their faith communities without judgment and not have the need to be silent about who they are and who they love. It doesn't matter your sexuality. It doesn't matter your class. Wait, what do you mean? How does it, how does it not matter about your sexuality or your class if you're telling me that HIV disproportionately affects both gays and black people? I just, it can't be both. Whether one is a Christian, a Muslim, whether one's Buddhist, HIV and AIDS is impacting our community. Can I, can I see the Buddhist community of people fully infected with AIDS? Can I, is there, is there some sort of paper somewhere? It's like Buddhist monks, AIDS runs rampant in the temples. I just. <laughs> when we're able to walk into any African-American church in the South and see that they are addressing HIV and AIDS, doing testing, helping people with their medicine, when they're doing that in the same ways as they currently do. I... As, he, as he's talking about this, all I can picture is like black dudes going to those massive fucking orgies, getting, getting tunneled out by their bros, and then going home to their wives on Sunday and going to church after. <laughs> like, what? what is this? <laughs> I don't care how livable the disease is. I don't want one to be burdened by a lifelong debilitating disease. Being livable just means your problems no longer have as many consequences as they should have. I, was, I am befuddled. What the fuck is he talking about? You've been to plenty of Southern black churches and never seen HIV or AIDS testing? Well, yeah, that's because they're, they're disproportionately affected by AIDS and we're not giving them enough funding for AIDS testing at their churches. Stop watching Boggy's porn collection. We share notes on degeneracy. BD screenings or blood pressure screenings right now in their health ministries. I know that we've made a difference. These, these gay black men can't stop slaying in dick that we need HIV testing to be as common and accessible as blood pressure tests. Very inspirational music. Thank you, AIDS. <laughs> Just stop sleeping around. Just don't be a degenerate. <laughs> Help. 
All you hear is Rich Evans saying AIDS. Yeah, I hear that every time I talk about AIDS, too. Gilead's chairman and chief executive officer Daniel O'Day and Dean Jonathan Walton took the stage at HLTH 2021 to discuss their work on the Compass Initiative. I'm not going to play this whole thing, but I kind of want to listen to excerpts. I'm kind of curious. Dear future, we're coming for you. Please don't if you have AIDS. Here today, this is a real treat. At Wake Forest University School of Divinity, we have a clear mission that we seek to foster agents of justice, reconciliation, and compassion. We seek to foster social architects you take your meds. Meds, of hey, hope, you equity, and healing. Me. That seems like a weird thing for a church to promote. If you by the funny fox lady, you will not get fine domed by the globalist. <laughs> I don't want to get fin domed. Consistent with the quote that you read from Desmond Tutu, we understand Desmond that, Tutu. yes, we want to foster religious professionals that are caring and compassionate and know how to pray with congregants. But they also understand the social logics and social structures that contribute to well-being and or misery. Mm. We understand that we want people to uh, be able to speak to the needs of particular individuals and families during their times of crisis. When a woman finds out she's gotten HIV and doesn't know where it came from, she needs to know to not berate her husband for taking dick behind her back. <laughs> Mmm, cheeseburger. Everybody has AIDS, 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 AIDS. Everybody has AIDS, 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 AIDS. Speaking of everybody has AIDS, in the U.S. South, black women accounted for 67% of all new diagnoses of HIV among women. And this ties into what I was talking about earlier when we read that article about how tons of women get, tons of black women, get infected with HIV because of the black men on the down low. They don't disclose their status. And then they give it to the women that they're with. Because the men weren't getting diagnosed as crazy. I think this is a trap. The religious focus makes you think they will offer affirmative treatments once they have the funding. And I'd be willing to bet there's a whole host of men who just don't get tested at all. They, they are promiscuous. They go and do these degenerate kinds of hookups all the time. And then they just don't get tested, don't know what they have. And then they spread it that way. Is this why there are pants and undies are so low? Oh my god. Oh my god. Somehow this is... Oh. <laughs> what the hell is the cheeseburger thing? Was it a Chilla's art game? I thought it was fierce to fathom. I'm just fierce to fathom. So how is it that there's more women than men, but it's the men's... No, 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 no. Uh, black women accounted for 67% of all new diagnoses of HIV among women. So this is 67% of women being diagnosed with HIV. Black women make up 67% of women being infected. Not of all people. Going going to the super orgy, biggest orgy since the fall of Rome. No, I will not get tested afterwards. Thank you. Right? Right? And there's plenty of people that don't care for the well-being, unfortunately. Unfortunately. I was like, th I can understand the uh, importance of, like, get fucking tested if you're a degenerate. I, I can understand having that importance. But again, it shouldn't be destigmatized. I don't want to destigmatize people acting like degenerates. 67% <laughs> of black women or of all women? I'm gonna read this once again. I know, I know, <laughs> I know percentages are hard. In the US South, black women accounted for 67% of all new diagnoses of HIV among women. It's even highlighted, chat! <laughs> Whenever, or also, when we hear almost nothing from those HIV activists on HIV research, 
I can't even think of the name of an HIV activist, I'm being re real honest. Mikey, thank you for the 10. You don't understand why it'd be so hard not to fuck someone else or just be celibate for a while for some people. I also don't understand, but then again, uh, during the pandemic when normies had to stay inside for like a handful of months, they kind of went crazy. So, you know, I don't know, man. Chat, this is difficult to understand. I don't understand! <laughs> I'd listen to Kirsha quote statistics all day. I'd get shot before the sun sets. Kirsha, take your meds. Meds, hey! You can't make me! This is a public service announcement. Kirsha and chat are super mega duper omega cute and wonderful less than three. Bailey, you're cute! Thank you for the five dollars. Does the black community have a fun name for HIV? Like how they call diabetes the sugars? Is it okay to ask? I mean, I don't know the answer, but if the black community does have a fun name... For HIV, I kind of want to know it. <laughs> I'm kind of curious. What is... Oh god, I can't type, dude. My nails. Mind your language, a short guide to HIV and AIDS slang. All right, oh okay, god, here we go. Here we go, I love, I love <laughs> HIV slang. Oh, this is a, this is Zimbabwe. I don't care. What? HIV is often spoken about as a thief. If you are HIV positive, people might say you've been mugged. That is hmm. <laughs> that is that is that's a little weird. All right, okay. Uh, in in Angola, they say contracting HIV is like having stepped on a landmine. Uh, they also call it Little Bug. In Kenya, a euphemism for HIV is the worm. In Nigeria, um, they call it, excuse me, grave, or sickness of this generation. In Nigeria, specifically in Igbo, uh, they call it five and three. Five plus three equals eight, and eight sounds like AIDS. <laughs> That's so convoluted! Oh, that's... <laughs> that's like, that's like some 88 is Heil Hitler nonsense. Fucking, do you got the five and three? <laughs> Wait a minute, why is AIDS so common in Africa? You shut your whore mouth. <laughs> also, also in Igbo, uh, they call it sickness that ends in death. Well, not anymore, so you should be okay with getting it. In Nigeria, spoken in Yoruba, uh, they call it a curse or a sickness without cure. Uh, in Nigeria, where they speak pigeon, they call he who carries the virus. Uh, and in, in English, in English in Nigeria, they refer to HIV as he intends victory. That reminds me of all those guys that are just like, yeah, I'll, I'll give them the AIDS because that makes me feel powerful. <gasps> what a crock of shit. In South Africa, uh, for the Zosa and Zulu, they call it playing the lottery or won the lottery. Uh, also, they call it stepping on a live wire. Contracting H HIV is like stepping on a live wire. In South Africa, in English... You um, big guy? They refer to it as buying a house in Vereniging, which is a town about 50 kilometers south of Johannesburg. It refers to someone suspected of being HIV positive. Hey, yo, I hope you buy a house in Vereniging. <laughs> if you want to know why Africa has so much AIDS, look up Bear giving African HIV infected blood packs. I'm sorry, what? Bear, Bear being like the aspirin company, but also, why were they giving HIV-infected blood packs? What the fuck? Also, also in South African English, uh, it's called <laughs> driving a Z3, having three kids, or the three letters, all refer to the three letters in the HIV acronym. Uh, if you are suspected of being HIV positive, people say God is tracking you. I'm actually going to bring this up on screen since I'm reading a lot. God is tracking you, so you can be called a tracker. In Tanzania, in Swahili, 
It's called standing on a nail, a euphemism for being skinny or small enough to fit on a nail's head, referring to the AIDS-related weight loss. You know, maybe that's what we should do, right? Like, if, if, if when you get AIDS, uh, you have weight loss, Oh, this just sounds like a program that Oprah should sponsor. Let's be honest here. Who needs Ozempic when well, you can just get AIDS? <laughs> After all, it's no longer a death sentence. Naturally occurring genocide. Contracting HIV is like stepping on a live wire. The bug. Slim, euphemism for HIV, AIDS in Uganda as a result of the weight loss. Um, you have been waylaid by thugs. Don't they know that that's racist? <laughs> the AIDS diet has been a thing for a while. There ain't no way. There, if I if I had someone knock on my door, right? Like, it, let's let's just imagine I have like ballooned into a ham planet here, and it's like a globalist walks up to my door and they're like, "You must choose which you will now speak to your audience about. Will you choose the AIDS diet or the tapeworm diet popularized in Southeast Asia? I think I'd take the tapeworm, Chad. I'm going to be real with you. Like, eventually they can take the tapeworm out, but I'm stuck with AIDS forever. <laughs> and people, women, literally swallow pills with tapeworm. Hey, this man's pointed it out after I said it. <laughs> The options are AIDS or cardio if you want to lose the pounds. This man forgot the tapeworm! I stay with my coffee. God, I love coffee. That's a special flavor. Is South Park the cause of that? Uh, I don't think so. Usually stuff that happens in South Park is satirizing things that already happened. Big Pharma has no reason to cure diseases. They make money by creating a lifelong treatment rather than a one-time cure. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, tapeworm diet has been around for a while. It indeed has. It indeed has. Zambia says it has lit up, refers to a positive reaction from an HIV test. Thing that makes you thinner and thinner. Zambia using the Bemba language. Those that suffer from the germ and razor blade, referring to a person being thin. They have a lot of slang for AIDS. I don't know if there's like specific African-American slang. I got he or she is on a treatment program, beaten by thieves. Uh, abbreviation of uh, Mukondembera, uh, epidemic. He or she is drinking mangai, boiled corn seeds, which represent antiretroviral drugs. How do boiled corn seeds represent the drugs? Are they small and yellow? I've never seen, I've never seen HIV antivirals. <laughs> We should clash body positive activists with HIV activists. Everyone wins. Oh my god. Slang for AIDS, Oprah fan. Thank you for the two. Ah, Joshua Fernandez. There was a kid named Ryan White who was bullied for getting AIDS from a tainted blood transfusion. The students and parents and even the teachers made his life a living hell. His family had to move to Indiana because of how bad it was. He died before he could graduate. We should destigmatize AIDS for the people who get it non-sexually, which is what I've been saying this whole time. As what as what I've been saying this whole if you've gotten it through literally no fault of your own, you shouldn't be stigmatized for it. But I don't like grouping in the degenerate sex freaks who get it that way with people who did not choose to have it. What's worse, AIDS or herpes? AIDS? <laughs> I wouldn't want herpes either, uh, but AIDS is definitely worse. Bella Crack, thank you for the ten dollars. Moses slew OG, king of Bashan, and half of Gilead, the last of the Rephaim. Uh, the Israelites slew him and all his people, even the women and children. The harem ban forbid them to be spared. I don't know what I just read. I have no idea what you've just said to me. <laughs> And a bad omen for relatives. A Zimbabwe in English red card, go slow. TB2 refers to the high rate of HIV and TB co-infection. You tell me tuberculosis? Inshallah. Slang for ARV is adapted from Mitsubishi's RVR sports utility vehicle. They have a lot of slang for this shit. Literally a lot of slang. Moving back. 
this whole Gilead thing and this tangent into HIV nonsense is because this... This is a science company that is funding... Greater than be me, drive downtown... Funding things in entertainment. Tested, which is a little weird. That's a little, it's a little weird to be doing. Uh, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make that much sense. It doesn't make that much sense. And then the last article from, again, where this started, the Bridge Smart Brief. The last article, why multicultural needs to be a part of general marketing investments, especially for Gen Z. This is part of Bridge. Yeah, this is all linked to Bridge. All of this is coming from Bridge's Smart Brief, which are, which are organizations that Bridge is endorsing and wanting to show off. How? <laughs> Media agencies that approach Here's multicultural as a separate or smaller investment almost immediately hamstring their marketing strategies, argues one programmatic vendor. It will negatively impact their engagement with communities beyond Gen Z and communities of color. In a white paper addressing multicultural trends and Gen Z that it is releasing this week, programmatic platform Direct Digital Holdings argues that multicultural communities have an increasing influence on brand preferences and choices for consumers across all brand categories. That trend is particularly acute with Gen Z audiences. DigiDay was given early access to the white paper and to the agencies that DigiDay sought reaction from. It is no longer enough to market to the general market and divide up the rest as just multicultural spending. The brands that will be at the forefront and the top runners in the future are the ones that understand that inclusivity is the thing that they should be focused on versus multicultural or versus general market, said Shireen Patrick, media strategy advisor for consultative group Ops Shop. Even as more agencies and brands pay attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion and multicultural marketing efforts, they need to consider how they can effectively market to different communities, as demographics and generations and cultures change over time. For one, agencies should prioritize media channels and platforms that resonate with communities of color and LGBTQIA+, but also expand influencer marketing campaigns that feature underrepresented voices and specific demographics and ethnic media outlets, said Mark D. Walker, CEO and co-founder of Direct Digital Holdings. I feel like we read something very similar to that earlier, almost word for word. Hey. Jake from State Farm, thank you for the two-month member. I accidentally threw your wallet into the trash compactor today. Oh no. I, uh, I hope you get all of your identifications and cards back easily. I'm sorry for your loss, my guy. Understanding how to connect with this generation is crucial for shaping brand choices today and driving strong revenue in the years to come. In its white paper, Direct Digital Holdings found that Gen Z and millennial consumers are more diverse than their older counterparts on all levels and brand categories. And Gen Z is more li most likely sorry, to say their connections are more than 50% diverse. Some 81% of Gen Z said that multicultural and diverse consumers have a significant impact on their brand preferences and choices. And 72% of millennials said the same, compared to 48% of Gen X and 32% of boomers. What's, uh, what's interesting here is they're not talking... They're not talking about the companies. They're talking about multicultural and diverse consumers have a significant impact on their brand preferences. So this, this reads like they're looking at an influencer who is multicultural and diverse. And these multicultural and diverse influencers who are consuming the product are impacting the preferences of product that they have. You're very curious how they got those numbers. Additionally, 57% of the general population said in the study that multicultural and diverse people have a major influence on their brand preferences. U.S. Census data in the study also noted that the country is getting more diverse than ever. 34% of Americans identify as a race or ethnicity other than white, and 8% identify as LGBTQIA+. 
I thought that was a right wing conspiracy theory. I thought I thought the US wasn't getting more diverse. I thought I thought that was just far right reactionary nonsense. But I, I guess it is happening, and here's why it's a good thing. As a result, agencies have to push beyond general market and multicultural differences if they want to connect with more consumers, argued Patrick. That responsibility lies with the agency, but also on the brands to equally question assumptions and challenge boundaries. It's our job as an agency to educate our clients. That's why they pay us. I'm not going to pay my hairdresser to do my hair and then have to tell her how to do my hair. That would actually push me away. Jose Villa, president of minority-focused marketing agency Census, agreed that brands cannot execute multicultural marketing because it feels good or it's a part of a diversity effort. The strategy should rather be focused on the audience as a marketing opportunity, especially because so many Gen Z and millennials identify strongly with their culture that goes beyond language and race. Multicultural marketing has been around for about 50 years and used to be focused primarily on language and running ads on Spanish TV and beyond. Starting with millennials, there's been a shift in multicultural marketing away from language to culture. And that's also accelerating focus with Gen Z. Please peg me. What? What? No, pegging is degenerate. Minority focused groups find minorities for survey. What? <laughs> oh my god. Bus business speak. What? What is interesting to me here is he's saying agencies have to push beyond the general market, right? It's also on the brands to equally question assumptions and challenge boundaries. It's our job as agency people to educate our clients. We have to transform consumer opinion, as is in the bridge tenants. Crush his skull. What the fuck? While multicultural marketing and diversity efforts have been around for years, some say the actual financial investments, unfortunately, paint a different picture. Based on Patrick's agency experiences, she said oftentimes multicultural was viewed as expensive or checking a box in a broader media strategy. She recalled that part of the budget was always the smallest or cut first if costs were reduced. <clears throat> We'd have a $3 million budget for a general marketing campaign and $50,000 for multicultural. It was seen as very disposable. Yet Via noted a shift in media consumption that perhaps can attract more multicultural investments going forward. For example, Gen Z and millennials consume more earned rather than paid media. So marketing is now more focused on things like influencers, social media, events, and ad activations, as opposed to big paid advertising campaigns. And this is, this is also <clears throat> linking into what I said with how influencers are going to be used to push a message, much like the Hollywood elites and Hollywood actors and shit, as well as the talking heads for late night show hosts were paid to do. And... We, we are people who are involved in the ecosystem of like streaming, right? So you've seen what's happened when influencers take on bullshit sponsors. You've seen the backlash that happened when established titles, for example, came out as a scam. As, as someone in my position, audience trust is like the highest currency that I have. If I do something that betrays my audience, I lose all credibility. And so if they're going to seek to exploit influencers in this way, it's going to have to be in a very subtle manner that is hard to pinpoint and hard to show off. You love how much established titles trigger Dankula though? What do you mean? Raid streams are for bot raiding? I don't know what you mean. Instead of multicultural advertisement, how about nationalistic advertisement? You know, why monocultures do better than us? Maybe it has to do with the advertisement of nationalistic pride. And I mean, in the... In, in the United States as well, it would be very easy to push American ideals instead of, like, a multicultural advertisement campaign. Because regardless of your race or ethnicity in the U.S., you are still an American. 
<laughs> Raid shady ladies. <clears throat> or you're Hassan and you just care less about chat trust. I don't understand how the influencers that don't really have a massive amount of chat trust are able to push ideals. It's it's uh it's strange to me. It's uh it's strange to me. Okay, hold on. We gotta we gotta ban this guy. We gotta ban this guy for like claiming to be ten years old. He can get banned by Twitch, but I don't wanna deal with it, you know? <laughs> We're not, though. We're Americans and African Americans and Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans. They spent decades separating us with these terms. Yes. Yes. You do know why these people push this, right? Imagine... Imagine being a business and being told soon these minorities from the war-torn countries will be the majority, and if you don't pander to them, we'll have them come after you. I don't think it even has anything to do with people specifically being from war-torn countries being pandered to. I don't, I don't think Black Lives Matter pandered to people coming from Africa or people coming from, like, the Dominican Republic. I, I think this is a very, very American-specific targeted campaign. And the immigration is a different, different wing of it. Which, again, legal immigration is fine in small numbers. It's illegal immigration that is the problem. I don't think Black Lives Matter based Kirsha as usual. That's not what I said at all. Please stop drinking Kool-Aid. And that's because Hassan is brainwashed like his non-thinking following. I mean, maybe. It just seems weird to me. <laughs> Look up the gateway process. I don't know what that is. You all are American. Doesn't matter your skin color. Be the Americans Japan thinks you are. That's what I strive to be, dude. Asmin Gold's chat cares enough about him to bonk him when he says some dumbass shit. I mean, I'm glad that sometimes that happens here as well, because my memory is, you know, not the best. But also, chat, you gotta learn to post sources. And also have reading comprehension sometimes. My reading comprehension can be fucked, which is why you're here too. But, you know. <laughs> Perceive Nim! Nim, she'll skip every message about the important Nim DM. Every time Nim says he DMs me, it's never important! Hmm. The Nim who cried wolf, so to speak. True, true and real. Nim's DM was help, I'm dying. A tippy, a little tippy tappies. The little tippy tappies. Reading chat, but misses everything about Nim. I noticed Nim when he was white, but I, he can't be white anymore. Apparently that's like a locked color for some reason. But uh, also, I just he just tells me to check DMs for nonsense so often that I guess my brain filters him out now. Hmm. Why does Twitch Prime only? Lucidus, thank you for the 10 Canadians. Thank you for your service. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. When all this privilege has been taken away. Twitter freaks are targeting Silvervale again. Doesn't surprise me. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what uh, I could exactly do about this. Because uh, Nim, Nim sent me a screenshot... Nim sent me a screenshot. I'm not sure what I could do or say, but I guess chat. Be very careful about uh, what you're saying, because we got we got some uh, we got some aunties in here. We got some aunties in here reporting you guys for your for your messages in chat. So if you say anything that big globo homo would uh, not enjoy, you might you might get a, you might get a visit from the the UK police. Silvervale. Oh God. Silvervale has made a list of trans VTubers not to associate with. That's the story you saw with Rev's thumbnail. Somehow I don't believe Silvervale did that. <laughs> Put me in the screen cap. We have rats in here. We always have, but typically 
typically the rats just see it to themselves and make like weird weird conspiracy theory posts but like now now i guess uh they're taking things that you guys say in chat to uh see if they can get you banned by twitch we're so fucking back <laughs> Oh, I think Nim just got suspended as well. <laughs> yeah, Nim just Nim just got suspended. What the how? How? <laughs> yes, I just got banned. What the fuck did he say even? All right, let me open my other browser here. Hold on a second. Nim Nim doesn't even say things in chat. <laughs> they got Nimothy. Nim Nim, how long is it? 14 day suspension for hateful conduct. Man, the rats really are coming out in force. False flag is. Imagine, false flag is in my chat. Bridge is coming for us all. What did he say? I don't know. I don't know if I could even see his account in chat, but that's what I was going to go check. They also did this to Purr Purr Lavender. I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. The glowies are upon us. The glowies are here. <laughs> what the fuck did he even say? I don't know. Nim, does it tell you what you said? Does it does it tell you what you said to have gotten the ban? I mean, anybody anybody who's getting a suspension, I would obviously appeal it. It might it might take a minute. It might take a minute, but I would obviously fucking appeal it because from what I'm reading, none of these are actually bad. It looks like they're just capitalizing on, uh, like, Twitch's auto-filter, right? So, like, even... Even... <laughs> even if you're not saying anything bad, typing, like, the word gay will trigger the Twitch auto-sensors. I'm officially over the target. The flack is coming in. Oh, man. It's time, chat. We're getting hit. Let my Nimothy go. <laughs> We're going through the gayest of ops right now. Imagine my shock. All right, let me let me go to my fucking mod view here. Let me let me go to my fucking mod view. Chat, I literally just told you they're probably reporting you for saying things like gay and then a whole bunch of you just give them give them the ability to trigger you. <laughs> I hope none of you who type that are going to get a suspension, but you know, Is I did warn you. Attracted to a cartoon fox that you don't even know that well? I'm Spartacus. They can't ban all of us. True. True and real. Uh, let me see. <laughs> yeah, Nim's not even in the chat anymore, so I can't click on <laughs> click on him and find out what he said. Help. So, hopefully your IRC has it. Hopefully, hopefully your IRC has it, because I, I have no idea what Nim said. He's no longer answering me, as he is wont to do. So I doubt he remembers what he said. Nim is in the chat. He's not in the chat. He's not in the chat. I'm looking, I'm looking at my mod view, like, right now. I'm looking at mod view right now. On, uh, let's just double check on my OBS. Yeah, he's not here on OBS either. They suspended his life. <laughs> The wrist streams, thank you for the $5. Nim is here with you and YouTube? Yeah, but that doesn't matter. I need to see his Twitch history. My aunties are enforcing don't ask, don't tell. You know? <laughs> they they decided they weren't getting enough of a reaction by me dunking on them every time they say ridiculous shit, so now they gotta attack you guys. They gotta they gotta attack you to get to me. His Twitch history is gone. Binary Mind has an IRC that logs chat, so... Can I open the chat log and manually type his name in? No, because his account's suspended. It's a perfect example of the stigma that the moderator community faces. True. True and real. And maybe the German schizo did have friends. I mean, I doubt they have friends, but you know. Nim is one of us now. He's relegated to YouTube. How did you not get banned? You're always saying outrageous shit. Are Twitch glowies actually attacking the chat right now? You're walking the dogs when this started? Yeah, someone, someone's in chat reporting people. Someone's in chat reporting people. 
banned the day after Twitch declared the day of mod love. I mean, we all knew what the day of mod love means, much like the summer of love is for destruction. See, if the antis didn't do shit like this, they'd be less hated, still hated, but less. Imagine! Most likely using bots to report? I mean, maybe, I don't know. I don't know how you report people. I don't, I don't typically do that. Swanee, thank you for the four month mamba. YouTube gets a W. Correction. Correction. Silver Bell was put on a do not associate. I'm just not going to bother reading anything about Silver Bell because nobody knows what's going on. You can't even, you can't even get her name right, dude. <laughs> I'm a polite transgender Latina woman. You can't get me banned. I'll just call you a transphobe. Man, I wish I had a card to play. <laughs> I'm a woman doesn't help you anymore. Recite Bible passages, demons hate the word of God. <laughs> I don't think I could even see Nim in the YouTube chat. I'm gonna be real. There's some fun stuff that just came out of the quartering. I am still trying to go through bridge stuff, man. I'm still trying to go through bridge. I guess uh, Nim said I was typing in YouTube chat. Literally didn't see you, Nimothy. Literally didn't see you. <laughs> All right, binary mind popping up over here. <laughs> oh yeah, Nim. Nim Nim made a joke about slaves. Apparently that's enough to get a 14 day suspension. <laughs> when I when I was talking about if you get raped with someone with HIV, uh, you should you should be able to just kill them, right? You should just be able to kill them. Nib, Nib said rape them hey back. Guys, smash that like button, leave a comment, push me in the algorithm. It's almost like chat is full of retards. That's true. I'm I'm probably gonna catch a suspension, dude. It's time. It's time. <laughs> Should have I can't read that. They built the pyramids! They built America! Daniel Sierra, thank you for the 199. Woman Trump, they attack her to attack us. I was like. A little, a little, a little bit of both. <laughs> right near vacation, I know. To rumble at last. Maybe I'll have to think about that, dude. Maybe I'll have to think about that. She couldn't read it. Good call, Fox. Yeah. <laughs> the cynical thing is that even immigration is a short-lived solution because it's ultimately impossible to forever grow population exponentially. True. Man born and raised in a country that was enslaved by the British and the Spanish, I hereby give Nim and Kirsha a shot to pass. <laughs> Nim's a good boy. Nim's a good Jenny. He didn't do nothing. Free my boy justice for Nimothy. Hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe. <laughs> the stream was all planned so she can go on vacation getting herself banned. <laughs> Built America! Slaves! This is your song, thank you, slaves! Do you do do? Do you do do? Do you do do? This is your song, thank you, Spider God! You're a good slave! Would this alert just give them a seizure and convince them to go away? If you buy a fox, probably not convince the them to go away. House, my my aunties typically names. watch stream very religiously. And they are they are my strongest watchers. <laughs> thank you, Spider God, for the hundred dollar doodles. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Room hum, thank you for the two dollars. Surprise unban request stream. It's not even me banning people. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. Rainbow slaves. Rest in power, Nim. Rest in pronouns, rats. <laughs> they they should at least donate some bits to imagine. Imagine hate donating. You just arrived and heard aunties watch my stream. Not aunties, aunties. Well, thank you mentally ill hate watchers for helping to push the fox in the algorithm. True, truly the strongest of honorable chatters. He was reported for a slavery joke. You literally are a descendant of slaves. Try banning me, woke moralists. That's, uh, that's right, you draw them out of their little rat holes. 
If they are anties, does that imply that there's an even stronger set of pros? Yes. Yes, very much so. No, in real life! I'm going to stalk him and become obsessed with him and wear his makeup and his dresses and use his skin as a coat like the ancient Irish did. Well, that's I'm all the right winner! Up. Chat. will be going to burn down a Wendy's in honor of Saint Nimothy. <laughs> he was just trying to be a doctor, astronaut, engineer, scientist, and shit. For legal reasons, that is a joke! I think... Thank you for the 1985! <laughs> Dr. Foss, thank you. I'm begging! Please make... What? What is this guy fucking saying? What is this guy... What is this guy fucking saying? Oh, oh, he's like spamming weird nonsense. Oh, okay. Hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, this uh, this is a guy that can just get banned. Uh, this is a guy. Goodbye, goodbye, bed bug. You are not a good bug. <laughs> Real schizoid hours. Improv man, thank you for the two dollars. Who will the Kirsha will claim number one spot? We who will the Kirsha will claim number one spot. Yes, will the Kirsha do not the Korsha. The 199 donation was born of a hate donation? Wait, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by this? Someone dig up the Big Papa Pump Dunkin' Donuts promo for the guy who reported anymore? What? Always exterminate the bed bugs. True. Summer of Love 2 starts with the Nim game. We must riot on behalf of Nim and the honorable chatters. Unironically. Kirsha Smug Alana collab. I will ah uh, she reached out to me and was like, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have a special stream and I want you to come on. And I was like, hell yeah, I would, but I have to drive 12 fucking hours that day. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the Geeks and Gamer dude. The Geeks and Gamer had a dude donate 199 to hate on them, but they adopted it as a meme. That is hilarious. I could not imagine spending that much money to, like, hate on someone. That's crazy. That's insane to me. Build bridges, not fences was a big slogan for years in Portland. Look how that turned out. <laughs> Try faster and make it to her stream. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> Nim, you better not say anything weird in chat. <laughs> if that's the case. Motherfucking, uh... Yeah, if you if you've gotten tapped with a suspension, I know I know of three people thus far who have. Uh, but if you've gotten tapped with a suspension, please try to appeal it since I, I don't think these are like actual suspensions. Uh, and I'm sorry you got slapped in my chat, dude. Just uh, be cautious from here on out if the antis are going to go a little fucking rabid. All right. I don't want I don't want my honorable chatters to come to any harm. All right. OK, make the appeal count. You only get one shot. Do not. Do not... Mom spaghetti. <laughs> Number one rumble VTuber. Oh my god. Apparently, uh, Smugalana also had a terrible time with an artist taking forever. You think she wanted to talk to me about it? Oh, she hasn't mentioned that. She hasn't mentioned that. I have to respond to artists. The, uh... The guy... The guy who's doing my... The, the yik man. The yik man! Who's, who's doing a special model for me. I actually, I actually was like, hey, dude, can I pay you more money? Because all of the delays on this model specifically have been completely my fucking fault. And I feel really bad about it. So I, I would like to pay you more than uh, what was on my, what was on my invoice. <laughs> Can't believe the aunties got rabies. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was only a matter of time chat, unfortunately. You really do love saying yik. Yeah, same. Yeah, same. But uh, back to what we were talking about before they shut me down. <laughs> Marketing is now more focused on things like influencers, social media, events, and activations as opposed to big paid advertising campaigns. 
While shifting the spending for multicultural marketing is one part of the effort, changing representation, culture, and strategy is another ongoing challenge within agencies that could explain the smaller budgets toward multicultural. It feels like a weird grammar thing when they talk... When they talk about it like this, because it's like toward multicultural, but like multicultural what? Like it feels weird to end that sentence with that word. Janice Middleton, EVP and Executive Director of Inclusion Strategy at Guided by Good. Executive Director of Inclusion Strategy does not sound like a real position. And Guided by Good gets my subversive language uh, brain cells tingling. Said it's particularly important today for agencies to refine and build on their DEI and multicultural efforts. Despite the feeling that momentum has slowed at organizations nearly four years since the murder of George Floyd in 2020, Guided by Good Agency 22 Squared last March launched a client offering called Embrace, aimed at supporting brands on inclusivity, culture, and education. I want to implore people, stop with the headlines of DEI is dead, Middleton said. If you're saying that we need to rethink the strategies, say that. If you're saying we need to rethink our teams, say that. Let's do that. Effective multicultural marketing, Middleton said, has to work together hand in hand with broader DEI initiatives. If there's no diverse culture and inclusion at an organization, the challenge is that much greater to generate authentic multicultural work. It's virtually impossible, Middleton said. It's not just people on the margins who want to see diversity. Everyone wants to see it because we live in a diverse world, right? No matter how multicultural will evolve. See, this sounds grammatically incorrect to me as well. And it's weird. It's weird. It is clear that agencies are thinking beyond communities, languages, and age, as well as striving internally to shape their organization's workforce representation and culture. And in this article, they mentioned Digital Direct Holdings. And so you go and you look up Digital Direct Holdings, and they have Cracking the Code, How Multicultural and Zen Gen Z Reshape Mainstream Marketing. 81% of Gen Zers say multicultural and diverse communities greatly shape brand preferences. And with, with this initiative, their partnering companies are Microsoft Advertising, Bear, which has been mentioned a few times, Colossus, SSP, Dentsu, Publicis Media, Foster School of Business, University of Washington, and NYU Stern. In collaboration with Horowitz Research, Direct Digital Holdings commissioned a survey of over 2,300, I was wrong, I said 2,600, it was only 2,300, U.S. consumers to delve into the impact of Black, African American, Hispanic, Latin, AAPI, and LGBTQIA plus consumers' brand perceptions and purchase behaviors on the general population with a specific focus on Gen Z. So all of these percentages that we've been talking about for the past hour or so, maybe longer, are based on a survey of only 2,300 consumers in the United States. And they're trying to push this on a global scale. AAPI is uh, Asian American Pacific Islander is AAPI. Douglas Kaplan! Thank you for the 49.99! You're surprised you can still pay. YouTube stops you at 500 in a day. You feel you paid more. God damn. God damn. I mean, if you... If YouTube stopping you, there is the stream elements link. <laughs> I feel a little dirty saying that, though. So I'm also gonna say thank you for everything you've donated today, my guy. You've been massively crazy. You've, you've been just, like, throwing down meaty, girthy sticks in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. You can give me butt scratches like I'm a real pet! She's leading into it now! Mm, would you ever do an interview with our future Tuba president, Tomoe Amari, to ask about her stances on pony rights and how she feels about Canada? I don't know how much she talks about political stuff, but I mean, if she wanted to, sure. I like the pony lady. She's a nice lady. Thank you. Thank you, slightly buff weeboo. Those are the five dollar doodles. <clears throat> Come on, you. 
He has like 10 people, so clearly we need global change. True! True and real. This comprehensive report features both quantitative and qualitative exclusive research findings, complemented by insights from industry leaders and academics. It also showcases the importance of prioritizing outreach to multicultural and diverse consumers, as opposed to adopting a siloed approach for brands and agencies to reach Gen Z. The key takeaways are 57% of all consumers, 2,300 people, say that multicultural people have a big influence on their brand preferences and choices. 81% of Gen Z said that diverse voices have either some or a large amount of influence on them when making decisions. Across all major categories, food and restaurants, fashion, technology, and more, multicultural and diverse communities show significant influence on the brand choices of all consumers. That impact was dramatically higher among Gen Z. Findings should be viewed as a seismic shift for brands, making it a core imperative for advertisers to connect with multicultural and diverse consumers intentionally and authentically through marketing and media to promote broader sales. Understanding how to connect with this generation is crucial for shaping brand choices today and driving strong revenue in years to come. Again, we all know that they're bleeding money from adopting these DEI programs, which is why now more than ever, it is still important, even though a lot of these people are pushing for ideological purposes, that doesn't mean they're ignoring money completely. They're still going to notice if you're spending money on them and you're making their losses not as strong as they could be. So these companies pushing these kinds of things Still vote with your wallet. Still try your best to not buy from these brands. This research uncovers major influences on Gen Z as well as the broader mainstream audience. And uh, you have to you have to put in information here to download the PUDIF. Download download the PUDIF. I missed my protein. That's fine. That's fine, man. Everything's a mess until I go on vacation. Oh, do you remember about how they word their surveys? It isn't surprising the numbers they get. Also true. Also true. So in the PDF, in the in the white paper here, I don't know why it's called a white paper, but like, you know, crack in the code how multicultural and Gen Z reshape mainstream marketing. And this is all of the um, screenshots that I posted on the tweet. Most recent U.S. census found that the nation's population is more diverse than ever. In other words, more than two-fifths of the U.S. population is non-white or non-hetero. However, when it comes to the future of marketing, those numbers don't nearly tell the whole story. That's because for brands, the diversity figure may as well be 100%. Given these groups' huge and growing influence on where people shop, what they buy, what they watch, eat, and so on. An overwhelming majority of Gen Z consumers, some 81%, revealed that a huge influence on their brand preferences and choices comes from multicultural and diverse people, as did 72% of millennials. This is in contrast to 48% of Gen Xers and 32% of boomers. It was a dramatic, this is the question, there is a dramatic difference in the influence of multiculturalism and diversity on the brand preferences and choices of Gen Z and millennials compared to their older counterparts. Percent of the multi percent who say multicultural people equals big influence on brand preferences and choices. White paper is just a blanket term for that style of fact sheet. You have to cite them for papers and make sure which style of fact sheet it technically is. Ah, okay, I'm learning. I'm learning. My phone is shitty, sorry. Relatable. Relatable unironically. Majority of consumers here, a closer look at Gen Z. According to Pew Research, Gen Z encompasses people born between 1997 and 2012. Per the US Census, half of the Gen Z respondents and almost as many millennials reported being an ethnicity or race other than white or non-Hispanic. Half of Gen Z of an, half of Gen Z and almost half of millennials already identify with an ethnicity or race other than white. And these are, these are the statistics here. These are, these are the statistics here. 
That's a... I wish I was Gen X. What the heck? You don't associate yourself with Zoomers? Nobody wants to be associated with the Zoomers, dude. The first graph doesn't measure how important multiculturalism is. It measures how important people think it is, which is an important distinction. I think the more important distinction is that they give all these statistics about how 34% of Americans identify other than white, 8% identify as LGBT, two-fifths of the U.S. population is non-white or non-hetero. For brands, that diversity figure may as well be 100%. So there are, they're already saying, like, we need to eschew everything and directly just be, quote unquote, You can give diverse. me scratches like I'm a real pet! It is clear that Do when- Do you have any tips for new streamers on getting off their own asses to start streaming? Just do it. Like, literally just do it. What do you have to lose? Just do it. It is clear that when brands support diverse owned media and use genuine, inclusive ad creative, it can boost trust, create brand love, and increase loyalty. Br brand love? <laughs> I, uh, I, uh. And uh, here it even mentions a recent Microsoft research report bears this out. Ads categorized as inclusive drove a 23 point lift in purchase intent, regardless of whether the person experiencing the ad was personally represented. In the ad or not, the research found. And this is this is part of the normalization as well. Most people are just like, I don't give a shit who is in my ad. I don't I don't give a shit who is selling me product. Is it a good product? Most people genuinely do not care. But if they're pushing like this weird DEI ideology while also pushing a new branch of advertising inclusivity the point lift isn't going to be directly attributed to DEI. It's mostly going to be from people who just don't care about what the ad is. You want sexy ladies in my ads? Thank you very much. I want to go back to the era of like weird LSD trip ads for video games in the 90s. Like the ring doorbell ads. I don't know what the ring doorbell ads are. I'm going to be real. I don't watch too many ads in current like, year. You know what? The article convinced me. I'm now demisexual. Congrats on coming out as normal. Bring back the baby growing old PS3 ad. <sighs> bring it, bring it back. Going in circles, it's not only who you know. As a part of the researchers' overall efforts towards measuring the influence of different groups on today's consumers, the team elected to specifically examine the impact of people Is that consumers are closely to connected to. That you don't even know that well? versus those with whom they have less direct connections to assess for any major differences. The study found that regardless of demographic, consumers are uniquely and distinctly impacted by three different key circles. One thing we all share is that we're all influenced by the people around us, those that we are most closely connected to, and also by those with whom we have less direct connections. The inner circle on this graph is the people closest to us, family, close friends, etc., the social circle are those we seek to interact with in the course of living life, like co-workers and other people in your community, people from organizations one is a part of, and then the cultural circle on the outside. It includes celebrities, influencers, and other public figures we follow on social or other media. Multiculturalism is already evident in all consumers' lives at every level of connection, with significant majorities of consumers saying that at least some diversity exists across all levels of connection. This is a racial, ethnic, and sexual diversity of consumers' inner social and cultural circles. And so the inner circle here, it says, almost everyone identifies as my race, ethnicity, and sexuality is only at 28%. Half identify is at 39%, it looks like there, or I'm the only one with my race and ethnicity sexuality. There's a little, a little orange slice. Most identify as my own, and most identify as something else as the black slice. So, this is a survey of 2,300 people saying that the majority of their inner circle, which is family and close friends, 
either almost everyone identifies as the purple slice and it's slightly smaller than the half identify how how do you have in your family and close friends the orange slice that's i'm the only one with my race ethnicity or sexual oh, okay i was gonna say i was gonna say how do you have that and then i realized the sexuality one is probably probably skewing that a little spicy bit spicy cat raid what the hell is this spicy cat raid look at a lady thank you for the raid welcome raiders i think i missed saying thank you to a couple of raiders earlier because I've I have been rambling on bridge and I've been trying my best to not to not tangent off of it, but we've gotten distracted a few times. Thank thank you for the raid. I don't have to have to figure out what raid messages I missed earlier. I'm glad my moderators are on top of shit and always give shout outs though. Thank you, mods. Thank you, mods. You absolutely do not trust their methodology here, yeah, right? Yeah, right. And the more social circle stuff for Gen Z consumers, our connections are primarily diverse, more than 50% across the board living this shift in real time. I got huge members, holy shit. My cock! My cock, thank you for gifting 10 members. <laughs> thank you! Yeah, no protein today. No protein today. I got too distracted. We tangented off on, on something uh, a little too much earlier. I, got, I, got, I gotta get through this. Living this shift in real time. A few years ago, McDonald's realized that it lost the young consumer an important subset of the multicultural segment. A generation that was so crucial to the brand's future was turning away from the brand. We said, we've got to win this audience, said Caleb Pearson, Vice President, U.S. Consumer Engagement at McDonald's. The fast food giant had long relied on its pillars of convenience and value in its messaging. While getting caught up in offering constant promotions, we needed a shift in how we go to market. That required attempting to make McDonald's resonate with Gen Z, by leaning heavily into what is driving culture today. How can we get people to patronize us again? Is it to make food items cheaper and taste better? No! It's diversity! <laughs> man, man, meat of deceit! Thank you for the hundred dollars, what the fuck? What a fun stream so far. AIDS gazing, a helping black gay film. And people getting banned both legitimately and illegitimately. Glad I could be here for it. Yeah. Today today has been a wild log ride with a lot of splashback, dude. Meat man! Deceitful meat man. Thank you for the hundred. That's so much. Thank you. Thank you. Make the serving size bigger again. OG Big Mac was huge. True. First, they had to figure out how to communicate with this demographic, which had just graduated from Happy Meals, but may not be fully living out on their own. They care about convenience and value in their lives, said McDonald's. Uh, Cicion. As you start looking at their audience and how diverse they are, they really care about personalization. To that end, the company rolled out Fan Truths, where McDonald's celebrated the go-to orders of celebrities such as Travis Scott. The focus on young cultural icons had continued in recent years, including a marketing partnership with the collectibles fan and artist Kerwin Frost, along with a tie-up with the UK streetwear brand Palace. Beyond marketing, McDonald's has even tweaked its menu to respond to Gen Z's preferences and makeup. For instance, over the past few years, the brand has rolled out Adult Happy Meals, Cactus Plant Flea Market Box, while pushing spicier fare and even featuring a limited time offer of mambo sauce. Regular meals, whatever. <laughs> Cactus Jack sent you. What? Hello, Cactus Man? Do they have the shades of color chart like the family guy. I'm like, I remember when I started seeing the influencer meals. I didn't think anything twice about them. I was like, that's interesting. I think it'd be really cool to have, like, my own special meal, right? But if this is being used as some sort of push to convince the audience to, like, patronize these companies that are doing really weird shit, but because celebrity that they enjoy or streamer that they enjoy has, like, a partnership with them, that's, that's that makes me feel a little uncomfortable. That makes me feel a little weird. The BTS meal here, right? Yeah, right? Moose Nagam, Moose Nagam, thank you for the four-month member. Thank you for the four-month member. Also, my cock! My 
my cock, dude. Another 10 gifties. And you subbed yourself. You're fucking nuts. Thank you for another 10 gift members. And thank you for membering yourself, man. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Big Steven Bortlemay. Thank you for the 10. If they bring back the old metal play place, I might consider actually going. I don't want to get tetanus. <laughs> I don't want to get tetanus. They are driving so much of the influence, said Cicione. It's really changed how we approach the general market. It's really a new definition of mainstream. One that requires a very different media buying approach. McDonald's, long a creature of big traditional media investment, instead shifted away from linear TV and radio and currently spends 84% of its dollars on digital media. I don't want to mod it yet either. I'm going to put which racial and or sexual minority does Grimace represent? The, the purple people. They're in danger from the, the one-eyed, four-eared, flying purple people eater. <laughs> this has forced the brand to think outside of the traditional marketing mix modeling. We need it to be audience-led versus partner-led and media-led. This notion of intersectionality has reshaped how brands go to market. We're trying to not think of communities in buckets, but instead, more holistically. We aspire to be the most inclusive brand in the world, she added. It's not always easy to pull off this level of change inside a large traditional organization, but it's crucial for brands looking to grow, share, which McDonald's has in recent, recent years after writing its relationship with Gen Z. This completely aligns with our businesses, said Pearson. If we want to win, we need to create culture and build that ecosystem. There's a little, little bit of a mask off there. <laughs> Shadow Cyber Demon, thank you for the five Canadians. The Kirsha meal and it's just a hundred packets of room temp ketchup. True. True, honestly. Diverse voices on brand and product choices. Here's some interesting percents. The influence of multicultural people on all consumer brand choices and preferences is manifest across all major brand categories. Is the percent of people who say multicultural people equal big or some influence How on brand preferences? I like, like dick. Sixty-nine percent of people said that it influences what they wear. 74% said it influences their entertainment choices, such as TV shows, movies, and music. How can you sit here and believe that 74% of people are either largely influenced or have some influence on what they consume in entertainment by it being multicultural and diverse when literally everything that comes out that pushes this DEI nonsense falls on its face? Like, again, this is only 2,300 people, but, like, what people are they asking here? Gaming freak! Thank you for the $10. Data and reporting analysts chiming in on the survey size. 2,300 is not an unreasonable sample size for a generational cohort. The devil is in the details of how the data was collected and reported. It's still a very small number, right? Like, I, I don't think any reasonable analytics chart could be drawn from a sample size of 2,300 unless your giant size that you're extrapolating onto isn't that much larger than that. You wonder if the survey specified positive versus negative influence. That's a good question, actually. That's a very good question. I wonder if it did differentiate between that. Maybe they asked the wrong question. They asked if influence their choice on such entertainment when they meant how it influences them best they've got. I, th I think the question about positive or negative influencing is actually a really good one to ask. Because if it just said, does it influence your decisions, then these are also people who could be, it influences my decision against it, but it's not counted as a negative. Uh, how do you or how do you present yourself in personal care, makeup, hairstyle, etc? 69% said that they're influenced by this. 66% says that it influences the technology that they use as far as phones, TVs, computers, gaming. Um, you cooking, your cooking food restaurant choices. That's a very weird way to put that. 81% says that they are influenced multiculturally by their their cooking food and restaurant choices is this is this literally like someone said earlier where they're just like yeah i like taco bell <laughs> yeah i like the taco bell uh, <laughs> 
Definitely didn't ask po uh, positive or negative looking at what's going on in AAA gaming. Cole Saunders, thank you for the two. They have BET. There were signs early. Dragon Ball Z GT, thank you for the 10. Off topic, you saw this name was silly. An illegal Venezuelan tried to rob a bank in your hometown. Couldn't figure out how to say it. By the time he translated it, the cops showed up. I feel like I remember seeing that. Like the bank teller lady was like laughing at him, right? If that's the, if that's the one I'm thinking of. Uh, how you style your home with furniture, lighting, decorations, art, etc. 69% are influenced by uh, the DEI stuff. How you care for your home, laundry products, cleaning products, etc. 65% 65% of people are boiling the fabuloso! <laughs> the types of vehicles and cars you like, 61% of people are influenced. <laughs> They got, they got a lot more charts and shit in here. It's not just how we reach them, but how we talk to this audience. You need authenticity. You can get it right or so wrong. <laughs> so this, this is a 23 page document. The future is now old man. <laughs> Multicultural is the general market, said Dentsu's prince. It's a mindset thing, but it's also really about growth. Marketing plans must reflect that dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> and there's the appendix here. And in the participants list, we see dear old Cheryl Dija, the founder and CEO of Bridge, involved in collecting the information that went into this report that we were just looking at. And also... We have this man here, Michael Roca, the executive director of Elevate, an Omnicom media group. We haven't previously talked about Mr. Michael Roca here, but he has become also a figure to pay attention to. I have not had time to look into all of these other people on here. So definitely, definitely, this is like a community digging effort, as it were. Take homemade tacos any day. There's another digital direct holdings uh, informational thing here. It says dollars and DEI, multicultural consumers insights on brands, media buying and marketing practice. Trusted by major buyers and publishers like AT&T, Best Buy, Lowe's, Comcast, Disney and Google. Our white paper includes everything about multicultural consumers insights on brands, media buying and marketing practices. How diverse and multicultural communities respond when brands purposefully show up for them and how they react when marketers fail to deliver on earlier promises to engage. What it takes to inspire positive action and vocal brand advocacy from diverse and multicultural audiences. The critical role that marketers media buying strategy plays in this mix and how investing in targeted and diverse multicultural media creates greater impact. And again, you fill out the form and you get to, you get to go to the, you get to go to the little thingy here. The introduction by uh, Mark D. Walker. When I started in the media business back in the late nineties, there was talk about how quickly the U S market was diversifying and that soon the consumer landscape would become more ethnically diverse. There were numerous reports about rising birth rates among Hispanic Americans or how black Americans were not only driving culture, but were wielding spending power that eclipsed other demographics. There were reports about the increasing size of the Asian American Pacific Islander community and its economic influence. Since the late A since the late 90s, eh? Huh. I thought it was a conspiracy theory. What does he mean by this? What does he mean? <laughs> We kept hearing that LGBTQIA consumers were growing in prominence and how increased immigration was making for an even more diverse and verdant consumer base. It was just a matter of time when marketers would begin to dedicate significant portions, if not the majority of their budgets, toward these multicultural groups. Fast forward to 2023 and I'm still hearing the same chatter about birth rates and burgeoning consumer power, yet in many ways, the industry has not diversified to spend to match the diversity of the population. I'm influenced by weird anime women that keep mentioning how people can better themselves and to not give up even if times are hard right now. So I've been trying to live up to those teachings even if it's a slow process. Hell yeah, get influenced to be better! Actually be better, not, not this weird subversive crap. <laughs> 
they're rich, they're driving whole markets, that's why they need more money. Uh, it reminds me, I can't remember if it was Kanye or if it was someone else, but there was, there was someone, you, chat, you'll probably remember when I say, when I say paraphrase the quote, but they were just like, Mil millionaires still wear chains, billionaires don't. And they're kind of they're kind of saying like people who end up making millions still have no money sense and are easily advertised to and used as a marketing ploy. So they're buying these chains with money that they don't need to be spending on things that are glittery and make them look like they have status, but they actually don't. Yeah, it's Kanye. I can't believe I'm agreeing with Kanye. <laughs> All these white papers are just efforts by bloated corporates to secure job security, much like how the upper management keeps sandbagging their own redundancy. Yeah, like billionaires look like normal people. Kanye doesn't look like a normal people. I saw that image of like him in a, in a track suit and his wife in like giant comical Yeti jacket. Like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. But like the point, the point of what he said, I understand. And it, it seems like when when they would say things like like this or they would say like women buy more things than men women are typically the consumers that you want to advertise to back in the day women were the consumers you wanted to advertise to because they were the ones who handled the house budget they were the ones who paid the bills with their husband's money they were the ones who balanced the checkbook they were the ones making the purchases so it made sense to direct advertising towards women in that sense in current year, in current year, it seems that advertising has taken an approach of just anyone who is spending money regardless of their means, which again, companies are never going to actually care about you. So this has probably been a tenant of marketing for fucking ever. Like they don't, they don't care. They don't care. But it's like, they're targeting these people that believe having certain material objects will give them status with their peers. It's, it's why Supreme was such a giant brand. Dumb people with bad spending habits would get marketed to and then buy these things thinking that it made them look like they were rich. In current year, everyone is single. You have $500 brick. So when, when they say in this report where they're just like, Black Americans are not only driving culture, but wielding spending power. It makes, it makes me think of what Kanye said. And it makes me think that they think that these people are an easy demographic to target with material objects to make them feel better. And it's like that in and of itself is a very strange thing to go after. Peer approval is how you know not to do a thing. Yeah. Every time you saw anything with Supreme, you wanted to scream. Yeah, a lot a lot of these like hot brands have like terrible design, but people will still buy it because of the name. Supreme or Balenciaga. Supreme, but Balenciaga also has its own issues. Buying the 140 Star Wars game will make me cool. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. And this is this is also part of like what FOMO capitalizes on, right? You don't, you don't want to miss out on something that your peers might have. You don't want to miss out on getting a, a rare item from an event that other people around you will have, but you won't have access to after. You want to you spend that money. You know, it's, a, it's a, good, a good example of how like, that can influence people who are gamers as well. You're a, you're a retard that plays gotcha. Also give in. I'm a hypocrite. Fucking FOMO. I've definitely, I've definitely gotten hit with the FOMO bad on occasion. I'm not a perfect person. It's a trap to think there is more money in their pockets. They're already spending all they have. Again, marketing isn't something that takes like an empathetic approach. It never will. It, it might talk like it does, but it won't. Where did I leave off? It was just a matter of time when marketers would begin to dedicate significant, significant portions, and if not the majority of their budgets, towards these multi multicultural groups. Fast forward to 2023, and I'm still hearing the same chatter about birth rates and burgeoning consumer power, which is which is kind of interesting. <laughs> if he's been saying he's been hearing the same thing about the birth rates since the since the 90s, all right, <laughs> but it hasn't been happening. Hasn't been happening. 
Your thoughts? The numbers are fine. You'll need 500 to 1,000 to get accurate data for a study, no matter the population. More are always better, but if they took their sample from a certain area... Oh god, I lost Ch chat scrolling. If they took their sample from a certain area... Oh my god, I hate scroll. From a certain area, then they, ex then they extrapolate to the rest of the country. That's a problem. The other thing is that America is a melting pot. Of course, everything is going to be influenced by multiple cultures and know many different types of people. I feel like if you go into a city, you can likely interview, like you said, like a thousand people and get an idea of what the thoughts are in that city. If you take a group of 2,600 people and you then try to extrapolate their beliefs onto an entire country and then use that to drive a global market, I feel like that's probably not going to give you a very good idea. Sample has to be a correct microcosm. You doubt these people are surveyed correctly? <laughs> Cannot sleep without uh, someone's voice. Good night. Good night. Good night. Except this time around, multicultural consumers make up a whopping 40% of the population. It's no longer theoretical that these communities will become the majority. The reality is likely a few short years away. Unfortunately, if you look at where marketers are investing their dollars and efforts, multiculturalism is often tacked onto the bottom of the flowchart. This, this makes me think as well uh, about influencers and how they can drive people to make poor financial decisions like we we see people like trashing tons of food or trashing expensive products in in videos and we see we see like the lavish luxury lives being lived by some of these people as well and it it, it makes sense that gen z would be very easy to manipulate marketing wise by being like, these are the products you need to buy if you want to be cool and hip. All of the influencers using them. All your friends are going to get influenced and use them. That's for the content, you know? That's for the content! Donating over $500 to a fox lady! Ha! Hassan and his $2 million mansion. And it, it's, it's just, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Gen Z is easy to manipulate, period. Wasn't there something that came out that said, like, Gen Z people have as much trouble picking out things that are a scam as, like, the older generation? There's somebody on Twitter that made a thread about how they wanted to warn people of a scam that's going around that's very difficult, and literally the person scamming them was just like, yeah, I'm gonna need all of your personal information, and they just fucking gave it to them? Over fucking Discord? I was like, are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me, dude? Gen Z has higher plastical chemical contamination than other gens. And, uh, oh man, it was Kai, Kai Sinat, right? Kai Sinat said that he was going to give out, like, multiple PS5 units or some shit. And he went down to New York City and there was, like, a fucking mob. There was a mob of people there. And was, again, that's why, like, I hate, I hate thinking of it in this manner. Because I don't think of myself as a celebrity. But influencers are becoming, if not already have become, a celebrity class. That's how someone like Kai Sanat can go out to New York City and literally create a mob by him being there. Douglas Kaplan! Thank you for the $4.99. All jokes aside, what was that donation site? Uh, in, my, in, my, in my bio on the YouTubes... There's a stream elements link, so like in the video description, there's a stream elements link. Stream elements is uh, the way to avoid paying YouTube and Twitch, but still pay me directly. It also makes uh, my weird alerts go off, depending on <laughs> depending on the number you donate. Weird, weird alert noises! Today is the day to donate blood for your cute and beloved the Princess Kersha. Have a nice weekend, my wife. No! No wife, only friend. Also, why are you donating blood for me? Hold on, I don't, I don't want to drink your blood. <laughs> uh, have a, have a good day, Korean friend. On, on your sale. <laughs> people are affected by celebs' opinions, and people tend to gather around the celebs they agree with. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's like it would, it would be the similar thing in friend groups, right? Like, like me influencing Pippa to buy a giant noobel. Are uh, there are things that Pippa can send me where I'm just like, I'm gonna buy that. I'm gonna buy that because Pippa's the one who sent it to me. 
Oh my god, thankfully you grew up in the 70s and 80s, power goes out or internet goes down, you just grab a book, right? Started watching my YouTube vids a few days ago and decided to follow. Welcome! Thank you! Thank you! Man, she really is fin dumbing hard. Chad is donating blood to Santa. Please don't send me blood! <laughs> Can I influence Pippa to start talking politics? Absolutely fucking not. Absolutely fucking not. I'm not going to influence her to do something that she might not want to do. I'm gonna let Pippa do what Pippa wants to do. I'm not I'm not gonna tell her to do something. And I think that's that's how people should be. If you're going into the cute Benoit's chat and you're trying to be like Pippa, did you see what the WEF did today? You're in the wrong place. Don't do that. You look like a weirdo. <laughs> the skulls for the Korsha throne. <laughs> she just wants to grill and it affects her too. Not everyone can talk about things the way you want them to talk about it. Uh, it's like when I, when I talk about... This is completely unrelated to Pippa. When I talk about certain things, there are people who reach out to me and they're just like, I am worried if I say something, bad things could happen. So I appreciate you talking about the things that you do. Protect the yeah, but yeah, exactly. You like her as a comedian. I love comedians. You still need to have circuses. Stop being stupid. <laughs> Thank you, Icy Lumberjack. Chat, stop being silly. Stop being silly. <laughs> The Nooble, can we seize it? Nooble! Douglas Kaplan, thank you for the 1999. You'll check it out, thanks. Yeah, thank you, thank you! You got, you got massive cojones, my pendejo. <laughs> Even they don't go into work, you wake up at 6 in the morning, you're so sleepy! You'll sleep on your toes. No! Get better sleep! Don't get bad sleep. That'll make you feel bad all day, every day. We do a little silly maxing. Is type A positive already? Right? I don't know my blood type, man. I don't remember that shit. <laughs> Help. I don't remember that shit. Hello, I am from the Hacker 4 channel. Uh, hello, Hacker 4 chan. <laughs> you need a warm fox to hug in your sleep. Oh my god. <laughs> Ultimately, marketers are in the business of driving sales and gaining market share. It will appear the smartest way to do that right now would be to dedicate resources and spending to those fast-growing yet undeserved groups. Sorry, underserved. Little Freudian slip there. In my view, a more diverse spending plan has a chance to generate incremental revenue for most brands. But we wanted to be sure, so we asked the only group that matters, the consumers. As you'll see below, when you talk to Black, Hispanic, Latin, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and LGBTQIA plus Americans, they'll tell you just how much it resonates when marketers speak to them directly and invest in media that is authentic to their respective communities. Speaking of choices, consumers consistently told us they factor in whether brands exhibit genuine support, so much so that a large majority factor this support in when deciding what to buy or not to buy. And yet, Cabrutus's list was somehow a bad thing. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> and in this document, I had, I had some stuff. I had some stuff. Advertisers are missing an opportunity to steal share. Over the past few years, the media and advertising industries have been grappling with how to best engage with the accelerating diversification of their customer bases and the American population at large. This has manifested itself in numerous ways. Major companies across the industry have pushed DEI initiatives and in hiring, e.g. Meta touting a 38% increase in black leadership from 2020 to 2021. A wide swath of brands issued public support for Black Lives Matter since the summer of 2020. Brands have required agencies to put staffing requirements in pitches. An agency would need to have certain levels of diverse talent working on a brand to qualify for that business. Agencies holding companies have made public racial equality commitments. Brands like Cheerios have pushed for more non-white casting in commercials. But these movements have not translated to a commensurate level of media spending, even as audiences have only grown larger and more influential. It's a quandary, said Brown, with one, one without a simple answer. For instance, Brown said that his team is used to hearing from market marketers that are ready to spend more media dollars on multicultural efforts, only to then have these plans held up. The common excuses include a lack of research to challenges relating to proven return on ad investment, 
Yeah, that's just an that's just an excuse. Don't worry that you're hemorrhaging money. You're just making excuses. <laughs> you're just making it. Yeah, Cheerios. You heard that right. It's Cheerios. <laughs> I've always hated Cheerios. They taste like cardboard. Oh my god. And then I wanted to go to Some brands get it and are profiting. Part of the problem is a lack of diverse talents at these companies making advertising and media buying decisions. There are some marketers who get credit among diverse communities for consistently catering to these audiences. Among the leaders are Walmart, <coughs> which scored high among all groups, as well as Nike and Amazon, the latter with the exception of the Hispanic and Latin community. <laughs> I kind of like Amazon's doing great things for diversity, equity, and inclusion, except for the Hispanic community. What is Amazon doing to the Hispanics that makes them bad? That's what I got to know. Gizud height. No, that was a that was like an alarm screech. You have to do that when you when you read Walmart. You know. Wanya, <gasps> Wanya. Hold on, a, hold on a second, chat. Hold on a second, chat. Before you knock off on a relevant note, studies show that the last generations are getting dumber, aside from TikTok and stuff. Yeah, my Mike Judge, a little a little crazy with uh with his uh perception here. What was I looking at? This one. This one. Alright, okay. Mike Judge did an L? No! Mike Judge was involved in, uh, Idiocracy. Yeah. Idiocracy was truly a view into the future. Some people watch Kirsha for the tangents, others for the games. You just like the brain damage noises she makes? Mm. I'm like a Pokemon! You never know what noise I'm gonna make. Ah, uh, no. HP's Halorandra Dismond also pointed to Target and Ben and & Jerry's as marketers that are known for their legitimate, authentic support of diverse media brands. But... The list is still too short in her view. We're still only talking about a handful of major companies in a real way. Part of the problem is a lack of diverse talent at these companies making advertising and media buying decisions. There are not enough diverse people in that room, so they are not always going to see that it's important. So you end up with a lot of likeness and sameness. That is a potentially dangerous mistake for brands, in her view. If the last three years have taught us anything, people are really choosing where to spend their money. They will go other places. McDonald's is taking a proactive approach toward better balancing its spending mix. As a father, a person of color, and a marketing leader, I am deeply aware of the positive cultural influence and business impact our investments in diverse owned media companies, content creators, and production houses have on the ability to tell authentic stories that connect brands with fans in meaningful ways. Said Tariq Hassan, US SVP Chief Marketing Officer and Digital Customer Experience at McDonald's. Hassan said that his brand has committed to allocate 15% of its ad spending to diverse owned platforms. But there's more work to be done. And then I wanted to go to here. I uh, know. Yeah. Perception of how much specific marketing initiatives demonstrate support of diverse communities. Colossus SSP's Goffin added, it's important to be authentic and well-versed in every aspect of diversity. Seeing someone of the culture have impact on how the culture is spoken makes a difference. There should be diversity in procurement, supply, and beyond, because that is what you truly call supporting those communities. It goes beyond checking a box in the leadership suite or creating a cultural-focused label for an OTC product during a tentpole holiday. And we have a chart here that says purposefully investing marketing and advertising dollars with media that is owned by and focuses on the X community. And the second one is creating ads and the content that are inclusive. These are, these are demonstrations of support and the perception of them. Posting messages that are inclusive of the X community on social media. How are there so many people? How are there so many people? <laughs> oh my god, making you think of the whitest black man at a black man party. 
creating ads and content in both English and Spanish or additional languages. Apparently that doesn't apply to black people. Sorry, you only speak English, I guess. <laughs> Daniel Sierra, thank you for the 199. Hispanic slave workers in Amazon factories, Jesus. A whopping 86% of LGBTQIA plus consumers say that their perception of a brand improves when this brand sticks to its marketing outreach. On the flip side, 81% of black consumers say that their brand perception declines when marketers don't come through like they promised. So, so hold on, wait a minute. They say on the flip side, black consumers get angry when, er, like not angry, but like their perception of the brand goes negatively when marketers do something for marketing and then don't follow through. But they're saying on the flip side, so they're saying LGBT people don't care if there's any follow through, they just like the messaging. Is that, am I reading this right? Is that, is that actually what this is saying? They're subverting the meaning of diversification in business that is aimed at reducing risk, replacing it with a warped interpretation that will increase risk. Yes. Yes, entirely correct. While marketers clearly want to avoid being seen as bailing on their diversity efforts, the research shows two clear benefits to marketers' bottom lines when they deliver on real support for these communities. Across all groups, the majority of responders indicated a clear likelihood to purchase from these brands and to tell others about their community support. An overwhelming majority, again, 82% of LGBTQIA plus consumers, said they'd be inclined to buy from brands that advertise within targeted content. Well, more than half, 54%, of Asian American Pacific Islander respondents said that they tell friends and family about such efforts. And then we have, where's the companies doing a good job? Here we go. Companies, by this, by this uh, White Pages statistics, that are doing a good job of supporting diverse communities unaided. Uh, black communities are, are supported by Nike, Walmart, Amazon, Target, Hispanic, Walmart, Target, Nike, Goya, Goya Bean, Coca-Cola, Amazon, Asian American, Pacific Islander, Walmart, Nike, Amazon, an LGBTQIA+, Target, Walmart, Nike, Amazon, and Apple. Didn't they say earlier that Amazon wasn't helping the Hispanic community much, but they're helping it so much that they're better than the other brands, question mark? <laughs> Is this just a list of companies that hire minorities? No, no, it's not, it's not about that. And then down here, our participants, our participants, do we have, oh, we have a familiar name once again, Cheryl Dijah was involved in this white page as well. Would you look at that? Would you look at that? Do we have do we have our Mr. Mans that we're about to get into too? No, Mr. Mans isn't here. Mr. Mans isn't here. So this will this will bring us to another article after looking after looking through this. Another direct digital holding article. 81% of Gen Zers say multicultural diverse communities help shape brand research. Hey, yo. And this is another article I'm pretty sure that brings up uh, Mr. Mann's name that I am forgetting. Here we go. Michael Roca, executive director of Elevate at Omnicom Media Group, shared his thoughts on the white paper on what this means for brands. There was a time when brands had a Hispanic budget, a black budget, etc. Today, it's everybody's responsibility to reach these audiences. Brands and agencies need to make this a business priority. The siloed approach doesn't work anymore. This is, from, this is from Mr. Michael Roca directly. And that'll bring us into who is Omnicom Media Group? Omnicom is a media company and they, uh, they deal with a lot of different partnerships and they have diversity and equity and inclusion goals here. Our people are our greatest asset. We're committed to fostering an inclusive environment that attracts, engages, and retains the best possible talent. Our diversity of experience, background, location, viewpoint, and ideas is what makes us a great place to work. Differentiates us as an employer of choice. And they got all their contact information here. And they have... They have individual acts, global impact, all in on equity... 2022 diversity, equity, and inclusion report that was written up last year. In a world that is at once intensely divided while being intimately connected, 
It is no longer enough to passively pursue vague notions of equality. And as industry leaders, we know that Omnicom has a responsibility to model intentional, comprehensive diversity, equity, and inclusion ideas. Equity for all requires that we relentlessly challenge norms, confront injustice, and work to dismantle systemic inequality across every one of our agencies as we act as stewards of inclusive work with our clients. Idiocracy has a political class that cares about their constituents that's ready to take action on their behalf. Sign me up. <laughs> we are entering our third year of Open 2.0, our holistic DEI vision that leverages specific strategies that will aid us in our journey toward equity for all. In order to create global impact, every individual must accept responsibility and take action. Our second annual DEI report highlights the essential work being done throughout our organization from the highest levels of leadership to on the ground agency employees. Together, we can do more than make progress. We can create an industry standard focused on radical inclusion and true equity for all. This is the exact same language that Cheryl Dijay used in her interview, talking about how it's essential work being done and it needs to be all-encompassing in an organization's DNA, from the highest levels of leadership to the on-the-ground agency employees. And in their contents here, you have the About the Report, Leaders, Open, Explained, Culture, Clients, Collaboration. What we want to specifically look at is their open project. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at a couple of things in this, in this paper. It's 62 pages. So I do not have time to go over all of it. But once again, a lot of people who comment on Bridge and who comment on what is happening as far as this goes seems to think it is purely an American problem. They think, oh, Americans are lost and they have these issues. It is not an American problem. It is a global problem. And they have initiatives not just for America, but all over the world. Our DEI global focus for 2023, this is last year, was in Australia, India, Singapore, in Europe, it was in France, Germany, Spain, the UK, in Latin America, it was in Brazil and Colombia, in North America, it was Canada, Mexico, and the US. Australia's Asian, ni hao! <laughs> Isn't Australia a different continent from Asia? Yes, <laughs> that, is, that was my understanding. <laughs> Brazil gets another L. Bridge has a group that runs at a University of London with its own website and everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's a WEF problem. It really is. It really is. So we have we have a bunch of things. ERG performance metrics. Let me let me find let me find my next thing here. Our clients, our partners. Creating new outcomes together. At Omnicom, we make the greatest impact through our work. Our clients are truly valued partners in creating impacts that make a meaningful difference and reflect the nuance of our diverse world. Centering diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, in the client experience. No matter the industry, DEI is a business imperative that we aim to integrate as a core part of the client and customer experience. Companies that embrace DEI are better equipped to create more positive multicultural interactions, solve problems creatively, retain diverse talent, and improve financial performance. Our DEI guiding principles, see page 59, pave the path for continued progress in building stronger relationships, transforming our culture, and encouraging our clients to journey onward with us. Making progress by starting with inclusion. We know when we embed inclusion in the heart of our work, we achieve better business results and create more competitive teams. To operationalize, there's that new word again. I had never heard of this until I started digging into Bridge. Our ambition to integrate DEI in the client experience, that's you guys, we developed inclusion from the start. This work approach informs our team's methodology when partnering with clients, and our framework focuses on four lenses our philosophy of inclusion, the talent and skills that encompass our teams, the service and capabilities we offer clients, and the inclusive experience clients receive from us. 
This approach empowers our teams with resources, contacts, and toolkits to identify and fill inclusion gaps in the work they're delivering for clients. Through this framework, we are better able to lead with proven DEI solutions across every Omnicom network and practice area. We're developing a cohesive Omnicom story that makes us more powerful in the marketplace and a step closer to achieving equity. Organizations must claim equity as a strategic grounding idea. However, equity work requires an investment of time and resources to establish the priorities, needs and barriers that exist within a company and across its industry. The equitable futures practice offered by Sparks and Honey is designed to help organizations achieve growth and drive change through equity and inclusion. Through the practice, experts collaborate with client teams to define solutions and actions the organization must take to embed equity across its people, products, practices, and partnerships. To help leaders create an authentically fair world with systemic inclusivity, Sparks and Honey also created the Equity Effect Report to examine the cultural forces driving a more human-centric approach to an organizational transformation. The report, grounded in the value of fairness, recognizes equity as a leading determinant for well-being. It's for the greater good, you see, chat. It covers topics related to DEI, including the ergonomics of health, human betterment, the principles that guide our shared future, resilience, and accountability. And I, I want to remind you guys, as, as we're reading this, Omnicom is a marketing group. This is, this is a marketing group that works with companies for marketing. What does any of this have to do with marketing? Burgers? <laughs> the 2022 Keynes Lions International Festival of Creativity marked the first time that agencies from across Omnicom came together as the Omnicom Cabana, an immersive experience that featured expertise in areas including media, creative, commerce, and precision marketing. Throughout the five-day festival, the Omnicom Cabana showcased thought leadership, industry-leading capabilities, and first-mover partnerships under the theme of the future of connection. Agency experts amplified client work and uncovered candid conversations about navigating DEI in a fast-changing environment. Hosted panel discussions and speeches on the topic that included employee experience, creativity, and inclusive business practices. DEI is a universally high priority for our clients who strive to represent the diversity of the markets in which they work. It's all in the service of how greater inclusivity and equality is not only a social benefit, but can also lead to greater business outcomes. Quoted by Andrea Lennon, the chief client officer at Omnicom Group. And then uh, there's, a, there's spotlights here for different companies. Uh, OMG, Omnicom Group, co-creates a diverse client team with L'Oreal, the hair care people. And let me just make sure there's nothing specifically here. A community of change makers. Progress with precision using tech to track DE&I progress to help empower our leaders with a consistent, accurate, and comprehensive view of Omnicom's DEI progress across the organization. In 2022, we began piloting an Omnicom-wide interagency DEI and talent Hello. dashboard. This tool tracks several workforce key performance indicators, including representation, gender, race, ethnicity, hiring, retention, turnover, and leadership composition. This dashboard enables our leadership teams to understand measure and track DEI progress at the Omnicrom agency and office levels. The data helps us dig deeper, ask hard questions about what cultural changes Omnicom employees need, and identify important opportunities for improvement. Dashboard is currently only available in the U.S. to a small group of beta users with the goal to expand in other markets as well as key practice group and agency leadership in 2023. And then down here, Closing the global gender gap in the tech industry. In 2023, Omnicom Precision Marketing Group is advancing its efforts to increase representation of women in the <laughs> technology industry through the launch of global partnership with women in tech, a global movement. The international nonprofit organization has 200,000 plus members and works across 30 countries to close the gap and set women up for success in the tech industry by building skills and confidence. It also partners with key international organizations, including UN Women, 
the World Economic Forum, and NASA. Through our partnership, OPMG is increasing its worldwide technology talent pipeline by posting open positions on the nonprofit's talent hub, speaking at global events, including the Paris Summit and sixth annual global awards in Dubai, offering a pro bono membership, master classes, and upskilling, reskilling educational programs. This was this was the other thing here. Um, I don't have these in any sort of order. Because I am brain damaged a little bit. I'm brain damaged a little bit. I put these in like reverse order. So we'll, we'll be reading a little out of order. That's fine. That's fine. Our North Star. I don't know if North Star is typical business lingo. If there's people in chat who like go to C-suite kind of stuff. Maybe this is normal. The only other time I've ever heard our North Star as like their guiding principle uh, is with Cheryl Dija. So it could, could be, could be typical terminology of these people specifically. It could just be business terminology that I'm ignorant to because I'm, I'm not, I'm not a C-suite person, right? I, I haven't been to those business meetings. Not, not brain damage, but paste for sure. What? Can I explain why all the people pushing this stuff <laughs> have misshapen heads? I don't know. <laughs> It's typical. I'll, I'll have to I'll have to believe you guys who are saying it's, it's typical business lingo. Open 2.0 centers on four tenants and eight actions, which serve as the foundation for our DEI initiatives. This report is organized along the four tenants. It is typical business lingo in the corporate world. OK, so it's very easy to hide these things under calling it the North Star then, eh? Culture, a blueprint to achieving a culture of systemic equity that our agencies embody the requisite values and understanding to achieve equity for all our professionals. Collaboration, a framework for our executives, the open leadership team, DEI champions, and other professionals to collaborate in a manner to advance our DEI initiatives effectively and efficiently. For the clients, develop and retain a more diverse workforce to provide an, the most creative and effective campaigns in the industry. Further partner with our clients to address and support their DEI goals and initiatives and work together to mutually inspire the most effective DEI programs. You work in a large company and know they don't, they just say the guiding principle, so that's weird to you, but you're not everyone. I mean, if other people who work in like corporate C-suite environments recognize the North Star terminology, it could be that it's literally just for the DEI practices and that's why they're used to hearing it, or it could just be normal. It could, it could just be normal. I don't, I don't have that experience, so I have to rely on people in chat being like, yeah, I've, I've seen that before. It's normal business terminology. Community, attract and retain the best talent by strengthening and expanding our strategic principles with key organizations in the DEI community that share Omnicom's values. Eight actions guided by the four tenants of Open 2.0 the following eight actions translate our commitments into tangible changes with long-term benefits for all our Omnicom community members. One, expand and empower the open leadership team. Two, attract and recruit candidates. Three, development for retention. Five, engage clients. Six, community support. Seven, mandatory training and internal communications. And eight, accountability. Why there's a picture of a drag queen here, I have quite literally no idea. To our people, we commit to creating environments that encourage a diversity of thought and lived experiences, building inclusive teams that reflect the diversity of our communities, creating clear paths to leadership for people from diverse groups, offering education and development programs to improve cultural understanding of DEI and our priorities within Open 2.0. To our clients, we commit to building teams that reflect diverse voices, providing timely communications on DEI landscape and implications for our work, implementing DEI best practices that lay the foundation for more inclusive work, having thoughtful, sometimes challenging conversations that will strengthen our relationships and the work we do together, sharing accountability and mutual transparency on DEI commitments and progress. To our communities, we commit to Taking time to consider, better understand, and be inclusive of the diverse global communities in which we operate. Being intentional about how we represent people of different races, ethnicities, abilities, religions, political affiliations, sexual orientation, and more in our work. 
working with diverse partners that help us address systemic inequities and giving back to and investing in underrepresented communities, which then leads us to Omnicom's Open Manifesto. This manifesto is inspired by and eloquently captures the tenets and actions of Open 2.0. We will build equity from the fragments of shattered glass ceilings. We will nurture the talent we know and hire the talent we've overlooked. We will approach our biases consciously and become more fluent in our shared humanity. Because you deserve to work at an agency where you have agency, where you can see yourself and see yourself thrive, visibility and viability, where you don't have to long for belonging, where every space is a brave space that embraces your intersectionality. This is Open 2.0. Our reach, experience, and talent are unparalleled. Diversity includes the way people differ and can be expressed in a myriad of forms, including race and ethnicity, disability status, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, language, culture, national origin, religious commitments, age, political perspective, education, marital status, languages, spoken and physical appearance. Equity is fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of historically excluded groups. I like how they make these things sound so much better. Look at, look at how nice this all sounds. This is, this is so good, chat. Inclusion means all individuals or groups feel welcomed, respected, supported, valued, and able to fully participate. An inclusive and welcoming culture embraces differences and enriches the work we do for clients and how we relate to one another. And then we have... Let me just make sure that I have indeed read this one. I did read this. Okay, good. Okay, good. DEI Global Focus for 2023. Okay, good. I did read that. I'm nuts. I'm nuts. I remembered to read it. So now we have towards the bottom where we're talking about shaping the way we think and act to achieve true equity. Not e it's not even true equality anymore. It's true equity, by the way. Catalyzing systemic equity through understanding. Just as our approach to how we embed and recognize DEI globally is evolving, so is our approach to Omnicom's DEI training. In 2020, we launched Open 2.0, our strategy for achieving systemic equity throughout Omnicom, with eight actions focused on leadership, recruiting, development, retention, clients, community, training, and accountability. In 2021, over 68,000 employees across Omnicom's global workforce completed unconscious bias training, and employees have completed over 34,000 hours of DEI training globally. In 2022, each of our networks provided complementary, customized, and tailored training to 13,000 people that fit where they are in their DEI journey. What does that mean? Coming in 2023, one of our open 2.0 priority areas is to create Omnicom centers of excellence focused on best practices related to training, clients, and ERGs. The centers will focus on creating Omnicom-led curriculum for all employees that will include both mandatory and elective courses. And then we just got uh, some spotlights of employees that they have here. Develop developing a s diversity strategy for unique talent. And just to make sure I'm not missing anything from the end of the report, I'm gonna swoop down here. Okay, we already finished the end. 34,000 hours of productivity lost, gone forever. It's not, it's not productivity lost. They're embodying the work so they can take it with them to the companies that they're going to be consulting with. Fully convinced that we should have never made it past 2012. We were robbed of salvation. True. True and real. And uh, looking further into Omnicom, the Omnicom Media Group, through diverse partnerships with organizations such as Hase, we are continuously upskilling our talent and delivering enhanced career development opportunities. For fall 2023, we will be sending another cohort of Latin and Hispanic employees to Mujeres de Hase, a leadership program designed to empower high potential Latinas. Here's what our 2022 participants had to share about their experience. 
the Mujeres de Asset program, which is our Latina leadership program, was founded in 2008. The organization was hearing from a lot of our partners from Latina specifically, looking for an opportunity to engage with one another, to connect. I wanted to connect with like-minded women and then just learn you know, how to become a better leader in this space. It was a great networking opportunity and additionally a great way to support other Latina and Hispanic women within the industry and vice versa. This is all about fostering a community. There's Michael and Roca. making sure that you have people and allies. My biggest highlight, I would say, apart from the community and networking, was the coaching session. The program reinforced my work life, really learning how to like work with different people on the team. Um, I think that was one that I really liked and wanted to reinforce within my everyday working. A number of things that were talked about during that session helped me get to this point in which I, you know, ended up being promoted within a year of the program. We report. Wow, that's a really fast promotion once you started getting involved in a program specifically aiming to promote you because of the color of your skin. <laughs> women within less than a year, 80% um, are reporting an increase of, of pay. That's such a positive uh, thing, right? Because they've had such an empowering experience. The biggest advice I have is just to jump in, make time for it. We're all moving a million miles per hour. I feel like we've built a beautiful little familia and I just want to make sure that we continue growing it. Funny how that works, eh? Eh? And there was also another uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago's LinkedIn page. We are proud to be a partner with the Hase organization dedicated to the employment, development, and advancement of Latino professionals. Gabriela Sierra, board member of Conexion, shares how this partnership has enhanced our Latinx affinity group and the bank overall. There's a quote from her saying, collaborating with an organization who strives to enhance the career and development of Latinx professionals was of utmost importance. Hase provides a great network of opportunities and resources to take part in. And that moves us on to Hase here. Hase is a subject matter expert for corporations seeking to access diverse talent. With a network of over 97,000 members across the country, Hase works with employers to remain competitive in an increasingly dynamic economy by helping them attract, develop, and retain Latino and diverse professionals. Hase provides our partners with access to talent from entry to senior level, culturally relevant learning and development solutions, DEI thought leadership, and best practices. And here we have like a little rotating graph of all of the companies that participate with Hase here. We got out uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. Oh, look at that. Why is the CIA here? Why is the CIA here? In the National Summit in Gala in 2019, if you scroll down here to their full agenda, Thursday, April 25th Leadership Summit. This is, uh, these are other things. Hold on. Career Expo. At 11.30 a.m., getting into the government with Nexcom, CIA, and the city of Chicago. And I was like, that's interesting that a DEI program that is partnered with a DEI-led equity world domination fucking advertising company also has the CIA go to their fair expos in order to specifically pick out people that might be able to be hired. Also, Hase Moss, the 40th anniversary National Leadership Summit and Celebration, uh, in 2022, you scroll down. If you scroll down for the highlights here, the speakers. The speakers we had. There's McDonald's, Morning Star, Morgan Chase, guy. United Airlines. Certainly looks like thought leadership to me. Waka waka. Comcast. Waka waka. Waka waka. Comcast. But there's one guy in particular I'm looking for here. Johnson & Johnson, U.S. Foods, Barilla, the pasta. We had David Fuentes, the statistical report supervisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, who is also here. And then we have this uh, assets from the government, unclassified information about the agency and report preparation. Agency name is the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. This is a declassified report from 2022. The Central Intelligence Agency's mission is to collect foreign intelligence, produce all source analysis, and conduct covert action as directed by the president to provide the nation with the information advantage necessary to ensure its security. To do so, the CIA requires America's best and brightest to be able to serve regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, cultural background, or disability. Blah, 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 blah. Emerging 
businesses, a barrier to equitable outcomes. This is called the CIA's Equity Action Plan 2022. The CIA's Office of Procurement Executive identified a lack of access to secure systems as a barrier that limits emerging businesses' ability to submit proposals for classified business opportunities. This barrier was evidenced by interested vendors who expressed concern over lacking system access to information which hindered their ability to respond to classified requirements. Action and intended impact on barrier, OPE strives to reduce the barrier to equitable outcomes by making available a secure, affordable system that offers emerging businesses the capability to communicate with agency personnel. OPE will continue to promote this newly available system and provide engagement opportunities such as follow-on events from the Emerging Business Day in May 2021. The agency prioritizes engagement with industry in order to ease the process of vendor entrance into the IC community, which promotes equity and diversifies the CIA's vendor pool. Previously, OPE's primary forum for communicating with vendors was during the annual engagement day. The CIA is backing something that's when everyone should know to stay away. Pretty much. Pretty, pretty much, dude. Expanding the agency's industry base is embedded within OPE's strategic framework, and OPE will continue to share progress on this front with agency corporate leadership. Promoting equity among the industrial base is a continuation of the initiative to enhance industry outreach, which is also a result of actions and procedural changes to reduce this burden. And this is, this is a 10-page report that just goes into the different types of impact and barriers that they intend to deal with in order to bring equity to certain communities. And down here at the bottom, as mentioned above, the CIA is working to enhance engagement with existing and new partners, including but not limited to, and they specifically list the Hispanic Alliance for Career Enhancement, which is HASA that we've been talking about, once again, that is also partnered with the Omnicom Group, which does data research and investigations with Cheryl Dija in Bridge. Kirsha Cease, the chat's need to glow is reaching critical levels. I say, Kalor! See, see, senor. <laughs> no, Kirsha, keep going. To keep, to keep going, I gotta bring up, I gotta bring up my little, my little notepad again. Mr. Uh, Mr. Michael Roca from Omnicom. Mr. Michael Roca gave a gave a little bit of a talk in this video called "Look How Far We've Come" by, by Group Black. It's got 19 views. They've got 97 subscribers. This is again the weird thing, like with Cheryl Dija when we found the interview with her. It had like barely any views, no subscribers. Like, how do these? Why even put them online? <laughs> Why even put them online? Can people in the back hear me? Yeah. No, right. we can't hear you. You're too uh, fucking well, low. Sure, we Can I boost the volume any more than this? I've boosted the volume, but I'm going to mute uh, my alerts. Hopefully this is audible. And so I'll do quick introductions, and then we're just gonna we're gonna jump right in and get spicy. So with me, spicy. Michael Roca. Michael Roca is the executive director of Elevate. They are the Avengers of multicultural yeah. marketing, Prince, by the way. Mark Prince is the SVP, head of economic empowerment at Dentsu Media USA. Gonzalo Del Fox is president of Group M Multicultural, and Lisa Torres is also president of Cultural Potion at Publicis Media. So thank you all for joining me thank you. today. I appreciate thank you. having me. Right. I like how it's called Culture Unleashed. Yes, please. Give, give them their flowers. Before I even jump into questions, you know, I beat up everyone on this stage all year long. So I have what? to take a moment to thank them so much. What did he mean you know, by this? Before it was in vogue and, long and then let me, let me skip ahead just a little bit because we, uh, we're already over time, dude. But he mentions the work. So on that note, you know, there's a lot of easy jobs in the agencies that could be cushy for you. you know, what, what motivates you all to do oh, this I am making work, a face. Oh, no. Oh, no. I don't like DEI this much, chat. This, this motivates me. 
this is amazing to see standing room hopefully it's for us and not for the bar <laughs> so uh, thank you guys for being here um no this work it, it is hard it's hard i broke my obs but i fixed my face it's not, uh, it's not a job uh for uh you know for, for everyone so i, I think there, there's a lot of challenges that we have there's but there's a lot of bright spots that we need to start celebrating i think we all have moved the needle in terms of trying to create a more equitable media ecosystem and drive business for our clients. But I've been doing this for 20 years, so you're, you're talking to, and I, we've all been doing this since uh, you know we were in diapers. Uh, I think we got really, uh, really tough skin, uh, but there's still a lot more to be done. There's so much more that we can be doing. And I think it's gonna take uh, more than a village uh, but I definitely want to celebrate all of our achievements and accomplishments because I don't think that gets a lot of press. I think what gets press is, you know, the commitments and the pledges, but I think a lot of the success stories is kind of what I'm, you know, uh, trying to achieve. Oh, there's money from, for them in DEI. There's money for them because they, they get the money from the companies that hire them to poison uh, everything. So that, that's what, you know, what keeps me in this business, uh, but also what keeps me in, in this business like seeing this ecosystem grow, seeing publishers be able to hire more people and do more business and amongst us all, right? Because we share our success stories. Uh, and I think that's real. I think that's what impacts the community. I think that's what grows a more stronger, healthier ecosystem. And then skipping ahead once again. On their also, I like how someone in chat pointed out, this is fucking multi-cam and yet they couldn't get good audio. I've you boosted my desktop to audio to even farther. I, I, br I broke my OBS and I don't know how to fix it. Um, but the reality is, you know, you look at the last few years when it, since this has been in focus, millions and millions of dollars have moved into diverse homes. And from my perspective, as the years go by, we sort of, uh, I think, you know, you said it, Mike, the metric kind of was hitting a, a, a goal, right? A 1%, 2%, 5% goal. And I think where we're moving to is a place where, well, listen, we've hit a lot of those goals, but what did it do? And so can you talk a little bit about, we've spent millions of dollars, diverse home media has delivered for brands. What are the, the results? What are the metrics that, your marketers and your agencies are, are, are seeing uh, as a result of all this work. Yeah, I, I yeah. jump in here I quick. Yeah. Um, I, I think you raise a good point, right? I, I think the moral imperative. I think I think I'm getting even more confused. But we need to tie this to a business imperative, right? Because that's the only way that this becomes sustainable. We're we need to tie it to a business imperative. Cheryl Dyer just says the exact same thing. It's not just a moral imperative, it's a business imperative! But also, they're all wearing fucking microphones, but it seems like none of the fucking microphones are working. This is just another headline. I think that's the last thing we want to see, it's just another headline. We want to see impact. We want to see impact on both the publisher side and on the business side. So I, I think the KPIs are evolving, right? You can't, you can't tie KPIs to these type of partnerships like you do with a, a big tech platform. I think we need to meet in the middle. I think we're starting to have those conversations, those meaningful conversations, yeah. where we need to think about the long term, right? So what's the five-year plan? What's the 10-year plan? And we're having uh, amazing conversations. Some, Kavel, where you, you guys are front and center in, in the conversation where we're having with CMOs, with presidents, folks who are the decision makers. And I think we need to bring everyone to the table because everyone's accountable. It doesn't just fall on the agencies and on the partners. It falls on our marketing partners as well to make sure that this is a priority and that this continues to be a priority in a good economic year yeah. and in a bad eco economic year. So some of the things that we've seen just from my OMG perspective, and I can't share numbers or else somebody will probably put me in cuffs right now, <laughs> but uh, we've seen the year over year increase. Like uh, from an Omnicom Media Group perspective, we've increased our spend 30% year over year in the diverse media ecosystem. We've seen more partners come into the tent because that's another part, that's another issue is that we still have the same players. It's the CPGs, the autos that continue to take this seriously. We need more partners uh, under the fold. So that's been a big mission of mine is making sure that we see new uh, brands uh, show up 
in, in this discussion because that's how we're gonna grow this and make this more sustainable and not stealing from Peter to pay Paul, but growing the pot. I think that's huge and that's on us all to make sure that we're not taken from Hispanic owned for mm -hmm. to go to black owned. We need to make sure that we're increasing the pot and the only way we're gonna do that is we really do tie that uh, to, to business with results. I think you make, you make but where are they going to get that money job. from in general? How do they, how do they, who, where are they getting that making, money? We're not making choices and, and making... And then skipping ahead a little bit more. Well, with the group Black, you wouldn't go to Revolt and Batavia and still test and learn. We have been an industry of innovation, testing and learning. And again, this is the one arena, and I think a lot of you know my background. I came up in general market, right? Microsoft, Twitter, all these places. It's like I'm in a different world of marketing that I never know about because this operate it operates so differently here, and yeah. you know we have to sort of push the industry forward from that. So it's a great point because that is what you said is what's happening, but it's so different than what and happens everywhere and I else. Think, and I think that's why we really need to move this narrative from the moral exactly. imperative to the business <laughs> imperative. Because exactly. once we do that. We could shout it from the rooftops because yeah. at the end of the day, it's all about business. Right. It's good for the marketer and it's good for the publisher. I will give a little bit of a kind of view. Yeah. There's two things I think that. Yeah, are they're not. They're not used to the spotlight, but now they can. Now they can shout it from the rooftops. Don't worry about it. Now it's t it's time to stop being silent. <laughs> oh my God! And then the last one, the last timestamp I have here, is. 30. Play. Mm -hmm. And also when you tie it back to the business, right? You talk about the Asian segment, highest household income in the U.S., Fast highest growing. education attainment, fa Fast fastest growing. growing segment. It eclipsed the Hispanic market mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. So there's so many business points to be made, especially for certain categories. People that financial luxury, the Asian segment is a segment that we definitely uh, push a lot because back to your point multicultural doesn't mean black and Hispanic mm -hmm. it's, it's cross-cultural yeah. cross-cultural right. intersectional mm -hmm. but with household income because I have this conversation a lot also have to look at the buying power as well yeah. because mm -hmm. that doesn't yep. always tell the story because yeah. I know Hell gravy. Things my community is going to have regardless of what the household income oh, level is yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the discretionary income is what I always look at I'm like they'll spend more they mm -hmm. save less oh yeah uh, so I know we're at late. Well, Isn't that literally what I said earlier? The, the, these people will spend more, but they're not going to be saving any money, so it's bad for them financially. Oh my God! They, th I literally called it. Oh, we're so smart sometimes. One last final question, rapid, rapid answer here no is: As you look to 2024, what does success look like? And I'll just do a quick round. Success. I'll start this because last time I started with my. Yeah, you that. <laughs> they love going mask off. I haven't watched this full video, so I literally didn't know she said that. I literally didn't know she said that. I always put like my little my little cursor thing a bit forward from the timestamp I'm trying to get to, so there's like as little context loss as possible. For me, it's continued growth and it's more partners. I'm a big focus on new partners. I think sometimes we work with the existing partners that are out there and heavy up on them, but it's about the new partners and it's about the new clients and categories coming into the space. And that's something we're working hard with to ensue. The other thing I'd like to see selfishly is the 30 day payment terms go across the industry. It's good. I can no longer even hear this man. He, like, he just drowned out at the end of the sentence. For me, um, and I've been talking about this for quite a while, uh, it's been an opt in. Everyone is chiming, like, do I want to opt in? Do I don't want to opt in, I think we need to make mandatory that this is an opt-out. You're in unless you openly and in writing say, I do not want to invest in diverse audiences or diverse audiences. Make it mandatory. Oh, my. Powerful. Uh, we did that. It works. <laughs> I just looked, we, it works. I get the call. I'm I'm like, it's like the bat phone. I'm, like, like, you know. I'm, I'm talking industry-wise. No, I know industry-wise. We're all doing it in some shape or form. In some form or form, but no, industry-wise would be yeah. amazing. Standardization would be a great thing yeah. in the yeah. industry. Like, you know, where it's, I, for me, success is it just becomes every day. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I don't, there's no special call you got to make. You're so there's smart, no, like, Chad. I, I forgot about the captions. In, like, I'm a fireman. Or, like, I just, like, it's just, this is part of what you do for business. Right. Uh, I think uh, a perfect bridge to that is, look, three years and we're still going strong. Mm -hmm. I think we still need to innovate. 
and transform. I think we still need to push our clients. Every single brief that every agency gets should have a multicultural section, right? There should be ways that we keep clients accountable and keep them honest in terms of really reaching, engaging these audiences and making sure it's not an afterthought, making sure, making sure it's not bolted on, but built in to the business. Built awesome. into the right business. Built into the business. Hold on, I gotta move the YouTube chat out of the way because, like, my my fucking dude, my OBS is fucked right now. I don't know what fucking happened. Like, oh no, I just lost the YouTube chat. Like it, it is permanently full screened. Like permanently cannot be unfull screened. Oh, I fixed it. Okay, okay. What the fuck? So F11 permanently fucks your OBS. And you can't unfuck it unless you F11 it again. You can't like double click it. You can't click the like box icon. What the fuck? No, we're dead. Hello, YouTube chat. I brought you back to life. It's okay. I didn't, I didn't want to like accidentally play something else and have your eardrums get blown the fuck out. Because I had to crank volume everywhere for this video. I put my PC at 100% volume, I boosted my voice meter, boosted it in fucking OBS so you guys had it louder than I did. What is with the audio on this bullshit? That's so bad. Gravy! Gravy! I love you, you are the fluffiest cat, but I cannot have you right now. I'm gonna put you back on the floor, kitty. <laughs> Michael Roca has been making the rounds, though. Mike, Michael Roca making some fucking rounds. He gave another talk in the Minority Report podcast. And let me see if I can sound tracking here. What an intro. I'm just on the flight back. I absolutely did. And for those that. What? Oc Octo Mafia! Octo Mafia! Ginger Snap Serious! Thank you for the raid! Welcome, Raiders! Welcome, Raiders. I am the Alex Jones of VTubers, and right now we're going through a wormhole of globalists that want to take over everything in the world. We're, uh, we're, uh, we're talking about globalists and their insidious m cultural Marxist ideology. Welcome. I'm still live. I am. I, I tangented too much. I had to, I had to, I had to focus very, very hard today, chat. <laughs> and I tangented a little bit, and it lost me some time. <laughs> Remember to take notes. This is uh, this is all about bridge. Bridge is the next transformation in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's uh, it's making things worse for everyone. It's not just about video games, baby. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Tangent too close to the sun. Yeah, we had some uh, we had some suspensions in chat earlier. We had some suspensions. I. Uh, <laughs> We're getting close, chat. We went over a declassified CIA document, you know? Anna? You gotta watch the stream VOD. True? F Nim. Hopefully he gets his account back. <laughs> well, they're doing what the Soviets did to chat. True. Nim in the Shadow Realm. But welcome, Raiders. I hope you had good stream. I hope you had good stream, Ginger Snap. Thank you, thank you for Raid. Thank you! Thank you. I love Ginger Snap cookies. They're delicious don't know before they opened pollo camperos here in the u.s there was a super solid tradition of boarding an airplane with a bucket of fried chicken that was exclusively made there and i had so many trips where we were not the only ones that made the whole cabin smell like delicious chicken there might have been 10 12 other people doing it yeah and, and I one of my delicious chicken. Flight, we probably were we might be cousins but you know, if, if the if the if the airlines were smart they would have been catering that flight hey exactly. you know, and, and the one time ultimate chicken story we got a delay we had to stay in miami on the way back we had a connecting flight my uncle who brought the bucket he was like my turn to bring it brought that and took care of it all night I fridge. have never heard of bucket of chicken day, stories. Home, I'm going to be real yeah, with you, chat. Back home with you. We haven't had it. Love it. So much fun. Mike, I've got to ask you, uh, you're doing some, some, some big things over at Omnicom Media Group with Elevate. Can you talk to us uh, about, you know, what Elevate is and what it is you're doing there for those that don't know? Spend a minute explaining that, please. Yeah, yeah. I've been with Omnicom for quite a minute now. So since almost going on 18 years at OMG. So I've been at all of our, all of our agencies, OMD, 
Arts and Science, PhD, and now at the center, which we call OMG. And Elevate is, is a center of excellence slash community that helps upstream diversity in the audience and, and business process, right? So I think right now- I like, I like how we had to like remember all of the buzzwords in order to be able to spit that out. I have like a stuttering man, dude. The, the center for excellence in uh, <laughs> Now we're hearing a lot about supporting diverse all media, which is important. Diversity, DEI, the last three years, you know, post unfortunately George Floyd, has been a big topic and priority for many organizations. Well, I think this year things have changed a bit. And I think, you know, we're starting to kind of tackle that narrative, but I've been in this space since 2006, right? So I've been in the weeds and minutia of ensuring that we are talking to diverse segments and looking at diverse segments as a way of growth multicultural, cross-cultural, whatever we call it, it's growth. And I always talk about growth. If we're not looking at future-proofing your business, you're not gonna be here in 20 years, right? You're not gonna be here in some categories in the next decade if you're not talking to these audiences and you're not talking to them authentically. My main mission throughout my career, especially at, at Omnicom, was to ensure that we build a center of excellence where we can help empower teams. Because in 2023, it's everyone's responsibility to know this, but we know the reality of how it is working in an agency or working on a marketing side, or working even on the media side, that sometimes it's afterthought. These audiences tend to be a bolt on, and what Elevate is meant to do is build it in. Build it into the process so that when we do show up in the marketplace, it shows up organically. It's just part of what we do. It's second nature. That's exactly, again, what Cheryl Dija was saying is what the Bridge Initiative is doing. More than just a rebranding to go underground of DEI, it is to embed DEI in the way that the company works. And it will be organic. I see a few of you posting organic as in confused. If everything in your life is all encompassed with DEI because that process of entrenching it is not organic, the, the results from that non-organic push of making it everywhere in your life, making it inescapable, you will be doing the work, not just at work, but also in the home, at your family dinner table, or in your friend circles, or in the entertainment you consume and the games that you play. Once this has all encompassed your life, it will be seen as normal, which is why, again, they're using influencers and a lot of influencers that have young audiences. These children will get used to the messaging. They'll get used to the work. It'll just be all that they know. They won't know any better. And this will be how they come up. I can use my my uh, my massage therapist again as an example. Her son has come home from classwork on multiple occasions talking about how he feels bad and he feels upset that he's a bad person. He's a bad person because of all of the oppressive stuff that has happened in the United States. And he doesn't understand why he specifically is a bad person, just that things like slavery happened and that it's his fault. This is going to be an internalized thing that everyone is going to be dealing with. And if everyone has had this encompassing in their entire life, that makes the work afterwards organic. Because even if they've been propagandized in an inorganic way, their actions will be organic because they know nothing else. To work with the group blacks of the world, to work with the Canela media of the world, because it just ties back to the overall strategy and business objective is to ensure that we are reaching and engaging these diverse communities that we're talking to them rather than speaking at them and really having a dialogue with these with these consumers. Because I think what has happened for so long, it's all from a media perspective been about reach. And my whole mission is yes, reach is important, but relevancy trumps reach, yep. right? Relevancy eats, reaches, lunch, dinner, breakfast, <laughs> Like we gotta be relevant with these consumers. We need to show up in the right spaces and places to truly connect with them. Because you could reach them, but are you connecting with them? That's another conversation.
Yeah, I thousand percent agree with you in terms of being and I'm gonna able to skip ahead a little bit more. It's hard to gauge where the bar is here. Really wanted to start speaking to the Hispanic um, to start kind of talking to these audiences. They have to truly unlock the opportunity because there is a huge opportunity that a lot of marketers and businesses are leaving on the table by not committing. And I think that's kind of what we really need to push for is accountability and making sure that if you're going to be making statements that you better be kind of showing the receipts that that you actually dial in into these audiences and into these partnerships. You know, Mike, I'm, I'm going to say it so you don't have to, but a great example with State Farm and you've worked with tremendous, tremendous media brands to sort of continue that example, but across other great companies like Ford and PNG and Google. And I'm really curious about your perspective. You know, in 2023, you know, Ad Age and Meta presented a list of, of, of sort of media leaders and working in advertising and marketing to really sort of talk about some of the sort of big industry challenges and shifts. Yep. And you talked about growth and how that can be sort of just part of like the overall business versus like a bolt on, you know? I'm curious about you sharing your thoughts on a real critical factor, it seems like you guys talked about, which is, you know, really having D, E, and I in the work. Jake's melanation was the fastest I've ever seen. People loved Jake from State Farm. Strategy, right? So if it's in the workforce, oh. it can translate into strategies. Can you talk Hold on, I talked over that? him. D, E, and I in the work. A real critical factor, it seems like you guys talked about, which is, you know, really having D, E, and I in the workforce as being essential to authentic DEI marketing strategy, right? So if it's yeah. in the workforce, it can translate into strategies. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. When I started in this business two decades ago, I did not see myself reflected in leadership. I did not see myself reflected in the agency. It felt very lonely, right? There were you know, people of color and we all gravitated towards each other. And I still hold those friendships tight till this day, 20 years later, I definitely see a change. I see a change in terms of the reflection of people at the top. I still wish for more change. And I think naturally it does have an impact on the way marketers go to market, but I don't think it's an automatic shift because there are times where I, I'm speaking to folks who are also, you know, people of color who are, who are decision makers, and it's tough for them to make that commitment to change, right? I think what is needed is that expertise in the space. I think that's where it's marketers not automatic. who are probably not of the community or of the community and who need to kind of own up to, hey, I don't have expertise in this space. Let me bring in either media partners, agencies who are dialed into these communities and who know these communities to help us. Yeah, It's all right to not know what you I was don't rubbing know. My right? eyes and and I think that's the what space. sometimes people kind of hold very close to the chest is like, I don't know what gets in the way, eagles or, or, or not being transparent, you not knowing what you don't know. But it's important to bring the experts to the table because I think that's where change happens. And I love that I see the change in faces in these boardrooms, but I need to see that diversity of thought as well in terms of experience and what they bring to the table because I think that's where real change happens, especially when that diversity of thought actually has influence in terms of budgets, resources and being able to make decisions on behalf of either agencies or on the marketing side. Yeah, what a really good point. You would do it almost <laughs> in every other aspect of the business, right? That's a great point. Wonderful. And specialization and expertise theory, you would do it. If it was market research, right? No brainer. You, you gotta you gotta make sure you're holding these people accountable if they say they're going to abide by the tenants of D E and I. If they're not actually abiding, you gotta hold them accountable, chat. Diversity of thought, really? So if I say I vote for Trump, you're sure this tweet will celebrate me, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Diversity of thought, only DEI thoughts, true and real. They've twisted the meaning of diverse beyond recognition. Unfortunately so. 
Very, very much unfortunately so. And uh, I had... I had a couple of other articles that I really wanted to bring up. And I probably do not have time to read them tonight. I probably do not have time. And one of them even brings up fucking Mark Cuban. But one thing I will bring up is from uh, this week's Bridge newsletter. From this week's Bridge newsletter. We have from Reuters. DEI isn't dead, but employers must tread carefully. Diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in corporate America are facing an onslaught of criticism, especially after the Supreme Court's decision last year in Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard. That ruling didn't address companies' DEI programs, but in striking down affirmative action in higher education, it has heightened legal scrutiny of diversity-related programs in employment. And a clear lesson is emerging for employers. Forgetting about the E in DEI may put you on the wrong end of a major verdict. In one such case, Duval versus Novant Health, the fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in March affirmed a multi-million dollar judgment against an employer. The Duval decision shows how an aggressive DEI campaign can backfire against an employer, especially when it leads to negative consequences for employees based on race. The plaintiff, David Duval, a white man, worked for Novant Health for five years as its senior vice president of marketing and communications. He reported to a black man. The evidence at trial showed that Duval had performed well, but he was still fired in July 2018, and he was permanently replaced by a black woman. Duval sued, alleging that he was the victim of discrimination because of his status as a white man. At trial, the jury heard that Novant Health had adopted a widespread DEI initiative which included a commitment to add diversity to the executive and senior leadership teams. The company also developed DEI benchmarks and metrics, which showed a dramatic increase in female leaders and a decrease of white leaders over the time leading up to Duvall's firing. The jury also heard that Novant Health provided race-based bonuses to executives who achieved DEI objectives. This is also something we've, that we've read about multiple times uh, while talking about Bridge and especially diving into uh, stuff like Pixels and the the weird ghost group. And this stuff, as people do like to point out, is illegal, but they've been doing it for so long and it's so hard to prove that they can typically get away with it. If this kind of stuff starts happening at a company that you work at, document absolutely everything. Document absolutely everything and hopefully... You can also do what Duval has done. If something happens to a coworker, you might be able to help them. If something happens to you, you will have your ass covered. Document absolutely everything when they start implementing these kinds of programs. Moreover, at trial, Duval's boss offered shifting explanations for his termination, none of which were given at the time of his firing. Although the supervisor testified that the termination was due to a lack of engagement and support from the executive team, he told a corporate recruiter that it was the result of a desire to bring in new leaders and a desire of a different point of view, a different flair. In making his case that there was an effort to purge white men from the leadership of the company, Duvall pointed out that his boss had seven white male direct reports in 2018 and zero such reports by the time of trial. The evidence about Novant Health's DEI program and the actions of Duvall's supervisor convinced the jury that his termination was racially motivated. While there was one bright spot for Novant Health, the court reversed the jury's award of punitive damages. That will be a small consolation because Duvall will still recover more than $3 million in front and back pay. And I feel like this is a significant issue, right? They awarded Duvall back pay from being wrongfully fired, but they didn't award Duvall punitive damages for having been fired due to his race. I believe both should have happened. Employers should not overread the Duval decision to mean that all DEI efforts are prohibited or that DEI programs are presumptively undesirable. In fact, the court stated in a footnote that employers may, if they so choose, utilize DEI type programs. So essentially what both this article writer and the court are saying is you should be doing this, but do it more subtly so you don't get caught and there are no repercussions for it. 
if there's no evidence, if nobody's done any archiving or looking around at what's transforming in the company, you won't have a leg to stand on when you say, I was fired for racist reasons. It's very important to keep and document everything. As Duvall shows, employers who implement DEI programs must remember that employment discrimination based on race is generally prohibited by law, even when it is motivated by a desire to increase the participation of historically underrepresented groups. I know you're trying to do a good thing, and I know you're trying to represent people who have been given a bad lot, but you still can't discriminate just because you're being a good person. <laughs> The law provides an exception to this rule for employers who develop a lawful affirmative action plan that meets specific requirements and is narrowly tailored to address identified problems. After the fair admissions decision, even this exemption may be on unsteady ground. And this, this law with the affirmative action is how we saw college campuses be able to implement sort of uh, safe spaces from white people and from men on their campuses. They were able to exploit a way in the affirmative action plan that they were like, we're making these spaces specifically to address problems that will not have any effect on white people. Therefore, we can discriminate against them in this in this section. They know what they're doing is illegal. Regardless, most employers are not permitted to favor certain races or genders when they make employment decisions. And this is why California wanted to remove its affirmative action statute in California's state constitution. If they had been able to remove affirmative action in California state, then positive discrimination would be legal by law. And the only reason that affirmative action wasn't overturned in California was because too many people brought up the point that quote unquote white supremacists would then be able to use this to discriminate as far as housing and business practices go. So they hadn't figured out quite at that point yet how they would make it so that they can discriminate but nobody else can. DEI programs that explicitly seek to prefer one race or gender over another, such as by using quotas or providing bonuses to leaders for meeting certain race or gender-based metrics, are more likely to be unlawful. Thus, in adopting DEI programs, a central question that employers must ask themselves is whether their programs are designed to ensure an inclusive culture that values all employees regardless of background or identity and provides a level playing field for employees and job candidates. A DEI program should be legally compliant when it seeks to expand the pool of employees who are competing for jobs and promotions by reaching out to diverse communities. Removing biases and barriers from hiring, such as when an orchestra required auditions behind a screen to eliminate bias against female performers, is not illegal. I don't think this will happen because this makes sure that they hire people based on merit and not based on what they look like. And the entire DEI push is the complete opposite of that. To be fair, they do bring in a unique vo viewpoint with Dai, the race first viewpoint that should have died decades ago. True, true, DEI doesn't do, it doesn't, it doesn't. But this is again, a sneaky way of saying your DEI program should be legally compliant while still making sure it does the ideological push we're looking for. Just be more sneaky. A DEI program that trains employees on the benefits of inclusion and diversity in the workplace is permissible, but such training can still create risk if it uses, quote unquote, diversity as a shorthand for adopting racial or gender based preferences, or if it includes assumptions about people of a certain race. <laughs> this is literally just them being like, hey, yo, they're kind of catching on that the way we use diversity is not what diversity actually means. They need to stop noticing. <laughs> <laughs> the blind auditions things has been attacked because after it was implemented, fewer women were accepted. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that as well. Imagine your hiring interview starting with a so dick or veg. <laughs> For example, in a recent case, Young versus Colorado Department of Corrections, a white employee argued his employer's DEI training subjected him to a hostile work environment. Although the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals rejected that claim in a decision in March, it also noted that race-based training programs can create hostile workplaces when official policy is combined with ongoing stereotyping and explicit or implicit expectations of discriminatory treatment. That's really ironic. 
that's really ironic that one of the tenets of DEI is how you know white white people are way too privileged and <laughs> need to need to basically reflect and learn their place and constantly do work. That's not going to contribute to a hostile environment, though. Don't worry about it. The Supreme Court's ruling in Fair Admissions Inspired America First Legal, led by former Trump advisor and anti-DEI advocate Stephen Miller, to declare on June 29th, 2023, that all DEI programs violate the law. That is incorrect, but there is no question that the legal landscape is shifting, and employers must be extremely thoughtful about the implementation of such programs and how they are discussed with employees. Companies can substantially reduce the risk of lawsuits by conducting careful legal reviews of their DEI programs and their hiring and training protocols, and remaining vigilant to developments in the courts that could require adjustments. And this is why, because they, they are like, well, we have to keep doing this, we have to keep doing the work, but since it's technically illegal, we have to do the work in very subtle ways. If you're in one of these giant companies and you speak out, they're going to just find a way to get rid of you, like, as soon as fucking possible. So you have to document these things in order to bring up a legal case against them, because just speaking out in that position will have you removed and then you'll be able- you won't be able to track anything anymore. You won't, you won't be able to collect the evidence of their crimes. The DEI companies say they want diversity, but openly on 4K keep saying we're going to push DEI down your throat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whether you like it or not. Well, I mean, if everyone believes in DEI, there's not going to be any lawsuits, right? They don't have anything to worry about. There's no risk if just everyone believes in it. What if, hear me out, they just don't make racist policies. But how is that going to help usher in a new era of communism? The good era of communism. Because real communism has never been tried before, but we'll get it right this time. <laughs> Gotta go undercover. Yeah, right? If you screen out incompetence, you reduce the diversity. Unironically. <laughs> Is what they say, dude. Sneaky, sneaky snack! The sneaky snacksters! I have a literal metric fuck ton of articles to still go through on all this bridge stuff, but I'm gonna have to put a pin in it. I bet I, I went an hour over. I went an hour over tonight, chat. Thank you for sitting with me for so much information diving, dude. Well, there's so there's so much. I might have to make I might have to make more Twitter threads, especially if uh, if I'm on vacation. I won't I won't have a ton of time to do long informational dives on stream. But as long as I get the information out there to more people, if it's on Twitter, other people can make videos, other people can be informative. You know, I'm- I'm happy with that. I'm happy that more people are noticing fucking bridge nonsense. I'm sick of it! I'm sick of brigadage! I gotta see, Homestead is still online. Let me, uh, let me go back to my channel. My channel. Gooby! I turned off all my alerts. Let me turn those back on, because that- that video was super fucking low. A zombie Lakers, thank you for the ten dollars. No, that's me, senpai! Hello! Hello! Thanks for all the info until today. You only thought power briefs were to keep your balls warm? This is a different kind of power brief, but I hope your balls are still warm. <gasps> Pippa about to play Catala? Oh, I thought she canceled all her streams. This binoy! Well, if she's about to play that, I can go raid her on the YouTubes if my browser decides to work for me. What is this? This isn't what I want. This isn't what I want. Here we go. You're once again mad on the internet. This is something to get mad on the internet about, you know? This is something to get angry for. We're gonna destroy another bridge. We're gonna destroy the bridge! We can do it, chat! Do not give up hope. Do not give up. Chaos, thank you for the $5 doodles. Thanks for the stream. Keep up the good work. Thank you! Thank you, I will continue digging. The digging will continue until the globalists are defeated. Monya! So, it... Pippa just forgot to change the schedule for the stream. No way she's doing it. I was gonna say, I don't think she's streaming tonight because she said she said she canceled all of her streams, right? She said she canceled them for like the next week. Slaves! Slaves! This is your song. Thank you, slaves. Do 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 do. Do 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 do. Do, 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 do. Slaves, this is your song. Thank, Thank you. you. Quebec, Quebec. Thank you for your $100 doodles. Thank you. You're great. 
Thanks for having the courage to stand up to this anti-white hate. No, you're great. No, you're great. I mean, it's kind of spooky sometimes, uh, especially where like this. This is quite literally my income. This is my job. So thank you guys for doing the heckin' supports. I don't get much ad revenue, and I'm doing I'm doing two back-to-back -back sponsors tomorrow and Sunday, cause uh, I gotta I gotta make back some of the money I'm gonna be spending on vacation, man. <laughs> My Twitch doesn't want to load. I'm trying to see who's online. God damn it. God damn it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Quebec, for the hundred slaves. Thank you. Luxurious vacation. Not really luxurious, but it costs a lot of money to drive cross country, you know? <laughs> it costs a lot of money to do that and all the hotel costs and then all the stuff that's going to happen while I'm there. You know, it's not really luxurious. It's just... Normal vacation cost, and then I gotta worry about house cost, and ooh, I don't like thinking about that. I don't like thinking about that. And here's just doing the work. I will not, Pult fan. Help! I will not do the work. Always be stubborn to bad change. Exactly. Big fucking exactly. Ma 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 ma. Yeah 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 yeah. Uh, we ca- we ca- we ca- I gotta pee. I gotta pee really fucking bad. I gotta pee really fucking bad. I'm gonna go- since I gotta pee, we're gonna go raid Pickle. I'm gonna pee in the pickle jar. <laughs> I'm gonna pee in the pickle jar! <gasps> Today I fucked up by trying to inflate my penis like a dick oh. balloon. I wanna read that one. Oh, this it was my birthday a few days ago. Hit the big 25. Thank you for the streams, no matter how cursed. They helped me through this shithole of a job. I'm sorry, your job sucks, dick! Thank you! Thank you, Lupus Brius, and I hope you had a good birthday! How about I put a tiny top hat on your penis? Yeah! <laughs> that's, that's your birthday gift, tiny top hat! Happy, happy birthday! Happy birthday! Steve-O, thank you for the fifty dollar doodles. More for the fuel fund. Thank you, Steve-O! And Desert Ghost, you fucking mad lad! Desert Ghost, thank you for the fifty gift subs! That's a fucking massive amount of gift subs! Thank you! Thank you, Desert Ghost, for throwing your thick Garthy Wiener on the table for everyone to view. Thank you, appreciate it! Thank you! How are you starting a hype train? How are you starting a hype train? I have to pee! No, I have to pee! JP! JP PP! Thank you for the five dollars for the vacation! Thank you! Thank you! I have I have a mega backlog of, of people to thank still. Uh, since tomorrow is a sponsored stream, I'll get to do some of that tomorrow. Uh, surely there's nothing that you guys have said in uh super chats or donos that could that could get me thwacked, right? <laughs> Right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some of that tomorrow when I play motherfucking Wanted Dead again. I can't believe she's ending stream in the middle of a hype train. What a scam! No scam! No scam! Oris Mador, thank you for the hundred biddies! Nerglings, thank you for the 13 months of prune. Thank you for pruning! Thank you for pruning. I'll be going now. I'm sorry! Usually I try to end efficiently! I'm sorry! So Sakura, Sakura Niganji, thank you for the 420. Your name scared me. Thank you, thank you for the, the, the thank you, thank you for the sub. I don't know how to speak anymore. The P is inflating my brain. <laughs> A moment of silence for Nim. Nimothy will hopefully get unbanned, dude. <laughs> the way I slowly read that. <laughs> Ni Niganji. <laughs> <laughs> There's a booty emote. Yeah, there is a booty emote. It's animated. It's animated on Twitch. YouTube doesn't get animated emotes. We're paying! We're paying in the pickle jar! Cold grave, thank you for the gift sub! Thank you for the gift sub, Cold Grave! Scare her some more so she won't have to pee. Look, I just cause I sit on a towel doesn't mean I wanna use it! It doesn't mean I wanna use it! <laughs> Thank you! Thank you, everyone! Thank you, everyone, for spending time with me on Fandom Friday! I will see you tomorrow for the Wanted Dead Spouncer! Please, please go give Peekle some love. Stop! Stop scam trading! Stop it! 
support you're wonderful and and maybe maybe i like you or something chat have a good night bye bye